council members can turn on their hi Shebra. Make sure and see who we've got. Um, one, two, three, there's Martine. Uh, <clears throat> okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. We do have a quorum. Good afternoon. Welcome to the 1 p.m. session of the February 23rd, 2021 meeting of the City Council. I have a few announcements and then we will move on to our meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on Community Television Channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely. I want to thank the public for staying home to view today's city council meetings. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> if you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or streaming device once you call in and listen through the phone. Please note there is a delay in streaming. So if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it is time for public comment, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak during public comment, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. You may hang up once you have commented on your item of interest. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council Member Watkins? Here. Kalantari Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cummings? Here. Golder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers? Here. Thank you. Um, today, before we start on our regular agenda, I do want to uh, recognize that um, this Friday, February 26th at 3.23 p.m. <clears throat> will mark the eighth anniversary of the horrific day that we lost Sergeant Butch Baker and Detective Elizabeth Butler. Sergeant Baker and Detective Butler sacrificed their lives in order to protect and serve the city of Santa Cruz. They tragically lost their lives during what they love to do, making our community a safer place. We join our police department and the entire Santa Cruz community in remembering their ultimate sacrifice. Our thoughts and prayers are with the families of both Sergeant Baker and Detective Butler. I'd like the council and our community to please join in a moment of silence honoring both Sergeant Baker and Detective Butler these two heroes will never be forgotten and we will continue to honor their service and ultimate sacrifice. Thank you. So before we begin our meeting, um, I just have a few announcements and then we'll go ahead and get started on the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, instructions are provided on your screen. We will provide these instructions throughout the meeting whenever we move into an agenda item that will be opened up for public comment. Please note, public comment is heard only on items council is taking action on and not regular updates and reports. The items that will be open for public comment during today's meeting are numbers nine through 25 on our agenda. I'd like to ask the council members if they have any statements of disappointment disqualification today. Seeing none, I'd like to ask the city clerk administrator to announce any additions or deletions to our to our uh, uh, agenda today. Uh, nothing. We have nothing. 
Next up is oral communications on our agenda. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will occur at around 5.30 p.m. tonight, this evening. I'd like to call on the city attorney next to provide uh, the report on the closed session. Yes, thank you. Mayor Myers, members of the city council, this after, or this morning the council met in closed session uh, beginning at 9.30 a.m. to discuss the following items. The item one was real property negotiations, the subject property, Carmelita Colleges, and uh, also Lottie Sly Park. Uh, <clears throat> city council met with its negotiator and gave direction. There was no reportable action on that item. Council also met uh, in a conference with legal counsel for three items of existing litigation. Those are the Santa Cruz Home, Homeless Union versus the City of Santa Cruz, Don't Morph the Wharf et al. versus the City of Santa Cruz, and finally, Regents of the University of California versus the City of Santa Cruz. Council received reports from and gave direction to the City Attorney's Office. There's no reportable action on those items. There were also items of anticipated litigation, one uh, involving significant exposure to litigation uh, with one potential item to discuss, the other involving considering initiation of litigation. There was no reportable action on those items. Uh, item four was a uh, conference with labor negotiators involving SEIU temporary employees. That discussion was deferred. And item five was a uh, public employee performance evaluation uh, involving the city manager position. Uh, there was no reportable action on that item. Thank you, Mr. Condotti. Uh, next, I'd like to um, request that our city manager, Martine Bernal, uh, provide a report and updates on the city's business, COVID-19 response and events. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, city Council, good afternoon. I'd like to ask our uh, fire chief, uh, Jason Hyduk, if he could uh, please give us an update on the uh, COVID-19 uh, we're at with respect to the, the virus and the vaccination process. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council, Jason Hyduk, Mayor Fire Chief. Um, at the request of uh, City Manager uh, Bernal, I'm gonna give a brief update on uh, where we are uh, here locally and in the state. And the good news is, is that our case numbers are mirroring what's happening in the rest of the state. And in the last two weeks, our overall case count here within the county has fallen by 70%. And there's a number of counties that are going to a less restrictive tier, San Mateo and Marin being those today. And if our numbers continue in that direction, um, I would expect that County Health will uh, update our local tier and, um, you know, begin to, you know, move us into a less restrictive uh, category. Um, if I could have Bonnie Bush pull up uh, the link for the county, because this is very much a county public health um, emergency and it's in their realm. And if you go to the County Health um, website, they have a COVID-19 webpage. And if you look at the overall curve, you can see that our case numbers have fallen uh, dramatically after a pretty significant surge that occurred over the holidays, over uh, Christmas, starting in Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. And we are now mirroring um, the level that we were back in July, uh, which is really good. Um, the caveat to this is that there are some concerns about additional surges later on in March. Um, because of different variants that have potentially come into our community. But the good news is if we can uh, stick with those things that we know that work, as far as social distancing, washing hands and masking up, we can really minimize that spread. And uh, if Bonnie, if you could click on the vaccine link and we can show where people um, can go for vaccines because those are be being distributed. Um, I know it's been a fairly challenging process as far as getting access to vaccines. Um, we are seventh out of the uh, 58 counties in uh, the state of California as far as we, where we rank for dis distribution of vaccines uh, to members uh, in our community. So we are doing better than a vast majority of other counties. Uh, we're not doing as well as we would like. However, if you go to the COVID-19 um, website on the county, 
you can see where we are within the tiers. Uh, we're currently in 1B, about to go to 1C. They've just hit the threshold of vaccinating 50% uh, of those who are 65 and older within our community. And so they'll start opening up the uh, vaccine distributions. And the county is really relying on the multi-county entities, and those are the healthcare organizations such as PAMP, Sutter, Dignity, as well as local healthcare providers to uh, distribute that vaccine. What I would urge everyone, uh, regardless of where you are in the community, is to access this website, and the parameters are changing, which is one of the challenges that we face. You know, we're at a year in this process, um, but the parameters keep changing for who uh, can get a vaccine and when. So this is a really important source of information for everyone to access uh, where they are in that and then take advantage of those opportunities if you fit within those parameters, uh, whether it's age, whether it's uh, geographic within the community, whether you're an at-risk group. And when that vaccine becomes available, uh, take, take advantage of that opportunity and that will get us closer to being done with COVID. Um, and like I said earlier, we've hit the one year mark where, where we've been um, dealing with this. And I know we're all tired, but there is light at the end of the tunnel. Um, and so I just uh, really uh, urge everyone uh, to stay up to date and not just rely on information that you heard a month ago, a week ago, um, because it does change on a regular basis. And this will be your best source of information. Um, are there any questions from the uh, council or the mayor? Does council have any questions for Chief Hydrick? Seeing that, um, really great, great, great news. And I hope we can make it through the March possibility and continue on the downward trend. So thank you to everybody in our community and keep the masks on. Justin, you have a question for Jason? Yeah, I just had one quick question. Um, do you have any sense of if we're gonna move into the next tier when that might occur? I know there's earlier last year, there were certain thresholds for maintaining case count, like the number of case counts for you know two weeks or so. Is there any update on the criteria for moving between tiers? I don't know that there's been uh, strict changes in the criteria, but I do know that we have to meet those criteria for a time period before we can move into that um, less restrictive tier. It doesn't work the other way. If uh, we have a change in our case counts, they can move us into a, a more restrictive tier much more quickly. Uh, my sense, uh, given the numbers that we have here locally and what's happening in the state, um, if we can maintain what we've been doing here as a community, and as that vaccination gets distributed more widely, I do believe that we will move into a less restrictive tier uh, in the immediate future, but it won't happen until next week. Thank you. Any other questions from council members? Seeing none. Thank you, Chief Hydrick, for that update. And Martine, I'll turn it back to you. Um, the only thing I would add uh, with respect to the vaccinations, we did, uh, just so the council knows, we did get the uh, uh, notification from the county that they're starting their planning process for uh, vaccinating essential workers, that next category. And we have city employees that are fall within those categories. So we're working with them to uh, plan for that. So that's a sign that that's coming soon. So that's, that's good news. Uh, so they're, they're making plans to roll out that next phase so we can get some of our um, uh, employees in the city who are in those categories vaccinated as soon as possible. Um, and with that, that, that's all I have for you uh, today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'll now um, ask on the ask uh, call on the city clerk to provide any updates to the council meeting calendar. There are no updates. Great. Thank you. We'll now move on to item eight, which is um, council council, which is um, the reporting out on. Let's grab my agenda here the opportunity for council members to update council on any external committee meetings that occurred during the last council, since the last council meeting. So this will be the time for council members to report out actions on external boards, committees, and joint powers authority meetings. For future meetings, please come prepared to provide an update on any meetings or actions that occurred since the last council meeting so that council and the public can be informed. 
Uh, there is a list of everybody's assignments in your agenda packet, and um, I will go ahead and call on Council Member Golder and then Council Member Cumming, and then Council uh, Vice Mayor Bruner. So um, Council Member Watkins and Calatari Johnson and I um, attended the City Schools Committee and I'm speaking on behalf of all three of us, but um, so we've learned that the schools have spent um, over a million dollars in ventilation to, and get ready for um, the students returning to school as soon as possible. Um, I think probably by the end of last week, all of the, at least the elementary schools, um, teachers and staff have been vaccinated and um, I'm pretty sure the um, secondary also. And so um, we learned that they're planning a robust summer school at Galt, um, Bayview, B40 and Harbor. And they're gonna continue with the every other week testing through the County Office of Education for the staff. And parents will also have the option um, if they don't wanna to return to in-person hybrid instruction to continue a distance learning academy. And they're expecting that to be about 10% of the student population at this point. Um, we heard from Tony Elliott that we have um, over $16,000 in scholarship funds uh, um, we, what was it in, that we spent in 2020? Was that what it was? And then we have 46,000 in the fund currently and it's expected to grow over the next year. Maybe they can fill me in if I missed anything there. And that those funds are coming from the cannabis tax. And so we were discussing ways to utilize those for um, pro-social activities for youth through Parks and Rec collaboration. And um, currently Parks and Rec is also hosting a small distance learning academy um, at the Loudon Nelson Center. And so the dates for the summer school through Santa Cruz City School um, right now are starting July, or excuse me, June 7th, going through July, June 25th, so the three week session with a short break and then June 28th to July 16th. And it would just be um, 8.30 to 12 for students. So if I forgot anything, my partners can add on, but that's our update. Great, thank you, Council Member. Next up, I believe I had Council Member Cummings. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, to start the AMBAG meeting that we had um, during the month of February was relatively short, I think, of the actions we took. We pretty much just passed the uh, consent agenda, but there was a presentation um, by the executive director, and one of the things that came out of that presentation was that the city of Santa Cruz had applied for funding from the California Transportation Commission's Active Transportation Program uh, for the Santa Cruz Rail Trail Segment 7 project. And um, the city applied and was recommended to receive $9.1 million of funding. And so um, this was um, back on February 11th, but at that time, the California Transportation Commission was gonna be considering the staff recommendation at its March meeting, and the expectation is that um, we'll likely receive that funding. So fingers crossed when the uh, California Transportation Commission meets next month, um, the, you know, hopefully we'll get the funding for the next segment of the rail trail. Um, in addition to that, the revenue subcommittee met, and I'll also ask that some of my colleagues can uh, also weigh in on this, but a big part of that discussion was really looking at the budget pro uh, projections uh, over the next year or two in different circumstances. Um, you know, if we have uh, resources from the federal government and if we don't have resources coming in, and one of the things that I think became very apparent is that regardless of whether or not we receive resources, um, financial resources from the federal government, we still have uh, a structural deficit that we're gonna have to deal with, a lot of which is being driven by pension costs and having to meet those pension obligations. And so even though we're gonna be getting funding uh, from the federal government to help offset um, some of the lack of revenue from the pandemic, we still have these ongoing expenditures that are gonna make it really difficult for us to get back to kind of where we were um, and not be in this deficit. Um, I'm not on the Criminal Justice Council, but I was able to attend that meeting as a member of the public. And one of the things that came out of that meeting was that um, there was a recognition 
uh, that throughout the region there's been a desire to address some of the well to address police reform and um, uh, and and so a subcommittee was created um, that's consisting of and not limited to uh, members of this uh, Santa, the city councils from around the region law enforcement agencies from around the region and the objective is to see if there's um, policy regional policy decisions that can be agreed upon that all the jurisdictions would adopt and so those the next meeting of the criminal justice council is in may um and so i think that between now and then there's going to be some meetings with the subcommittee to discuss policies um, that can be implemented regionally and then finally uh the public safety committee is meeting tomorrow at 5 30 p.m and so if members of the public are interested uh, you can go on the city's website to get a copy of the agenda and that meeting will be at 5 30 tomorrow evening thank you council member cummings and let's get my queue up here too many things open on my computer vice mayor bruner thank you mayor myers uh, I attended the Visit Santa Cruz board meeting. I sit on uh, that board with Council Member Watkins, and um, during that meeting, there were uh, some action items, uh, including Mayor, uh, uh, myself, Vice Mayor Brunner, and Council Member Watkins appointed to that board. Uh, in those seats um, and financial statements November December 2020 was discussed um, uh, and then there was quite a, a, a lengthy report on um, the state industry in the hotel uh, uh, occupancy and it's about half the U.S. hotel rooms are empty, and here in the county has seen a significant decrease, as you all know. Um, and so, you know, with the decrease in um, occupancy, some of the creative ideas that have uh, come about, including working from hotel rooms, were discussed. Um, there was um, uh, uh, also discussion on COVID ready businesses and dedicated businesses um, uh, with, with safety in mind as the number one priority for employees and their patrons in that industry. And um, uh, outreach also through social media channels. Um, that that about summed it up is there anything um else uh, council member watkins could comment on and then the other uh committee was the two by two city of santa cruz and santa cruz county um collaboration uh, and this uh last meeting was February 10th, and we had discussions and updates on Project Room Key, and there are currently over 600 individuals sheltered um, with various funds, uh, COVID funds, and through those uh, programs, we discussed vaccination plans and went through the um, uh, discussion of the, uh, and I think uh, our fire chief brought this up to the various distributions through um, uh, the county public health as well as the various medical um, distributions, but prioritizing those experiencing homelessness and how that process, looking at shared distri distribution at those that are 65 years or older and, and other certain criteria uh, within that group. Um, there were uh, uh, discussions about the county six month and three year plan, uh, which will be coming up on their county board of supervisors, I believe March 9th meeting. Um, 
it's a, a study session plan with basically four buckets of activity. Um, I don't know all the details yet, and I think that will be coming, um, but really with um, the Human Services Department and Housing for Health Department working um, together on uh, lobbying our state and federal legislative and um, working together uh, on, on preventing and ending homelessness. And that next meeting will also be in March and I sit on that with Mayor Myers. Thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner. Um, next up I have Council Member Brown. <clears throat> Thank you. So I have a report from two of the commissions on which I serve. The first, the um, Area Agency on Aging uh, is the uh, group that is representative of all of the jurisdictions in the county. And we meet uh, to talk about issues related to senior services, needs, um, et cetera. And our director does a lot of legislative advocacy. He's like one of the, um, the key people who keeps an eye on what's happening in Sacramento and really works there um, and, and to you know keep us uh, informed and to advocate. And uh, so we at our last meeting decided to, um, because the state is actually, um, so I just wanted to say this, uh, yay, the state is developing a master plan on aging finally <laughs> and um, really trying to coordinate uh, services and kind of address do needs assessment in a more deliberate way and coordinate services. So it's a long-term planning process, but uh, we are going to have, uh, our, we've dedicated our next meeting to uh, discussing that. And it, there's some, some really great stuff in the, the proposed uh, kind of framework for, for this master plan. And so people who are interested in uh, learning more about this and are uh, weighing in, with our in our kind of you know outreach and brainstorming session that was going to be March 17th at our regular meeting time, uh, 10 a.m. to noon. So Wednesday, you can get more information at the AAA Seniors Council website, and we'll do a lot of outreach to make sure it gets out in the community. But it's a really great opportunity to learn more about what's happening, and it's very exciting because there's this is the first time that I am aware of in my years that the, the state has focused this much attention and um, commitment to providing resources for uh, senior needs. And so that's one. Um, so March 17th, 10 to noon, uh, join us if you can. And then the RTC, the Regional Transportation Commission at its last meeting uh, after uh, many years of um, study and discussion, and uh, many public hearings, uh, one of which concluded uh, at our, um, our last meeting, we voted to uh, accept a report uh, that would uh, provide for um, uh, alternatives analysis and a preferred alternative use of the rail corridor that includes um, uh, some kind of uh, public transit uh, rail service. So again, just a, one more milestone, and um, we'll, you know, keep moving forward. And I'm glad to hear from uh, Councilmember Cummings that funding for our next segment is forthcoming. Great, uh, Councilmember Kontari Johnson, did you have any updates? <laughs> Councilmember Golder gave my update. Um, thank you. Okay, great. And Council Member Watkins. Same, I think mine were covered by my colleagues. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, I have a couple of updates. Um, I did attend the uh, Central Coast Community Power um, Policy Board meeting last week. Um, one big highlight I think our community would be interested in is that they did, uh, the board did approve um, the uh, uh, availability of an additional $750,000 um, for a program for uh, electric car pur purchases. And so that uh, did move forward. Um, 
there was also sort of a legislative package um, approved by the board. Um, as a lot of folks are aware or maybe not aware, um, some of these community choice power uh, authorities uh, are sort of getting some challenges in legislation in terms of um, their ability to compete with some of the larger um, power, power companies. So uh, there's some, a legislative package that uh, continues to provide um, the ability for community aggregate, uh, aggregate um, power authorities to, uh, to thrive in California. And um, so that was, was good to see. Um, those are the main highlights from that meeting that I attended last week. The next meeting, I believe, will be March 10th. Uh, there's a continuation of the policy board on a couple of items that were deferred um, during the, um, during the uh, meeting last week. Uh, I have a report out from also from Metro um, on that board as well. A couple of good, um, a good uh, re reports from Metro. One is that the um, the Metro has received uh, delivery of the first ProTerra bus, and this is our first 100% um, zero emission battery electric bus. It has arrived, and it's in Santa Cruz. Um, so I think this is something that our community um, is very excited to see. Um, and um, our other three buses will be arriving um, during the month of March uh, with uh, the next step really with this is that we re have to receive the buses um, and, um, and then we will put them uh, working towards putting them to service this fall. Uh, as I think I updated about a month and a half ago, um, the district, Metro Transit District has uh, built the electric bays that are needed to charge these buses. Um, and we have a number of these, as I mentioned, coming in. So we'll have four coming in this month. Um, and then the district is uh, set up a capital improvement program to actually purchase more of these moving ahead. Also, the Metro uh, is unveiling, unveiling this uh, month uh, the Splash Pass uh, program, which is a um, which is a mobile ticket app uh, system-wide. Um, and so that will be moving us towards um, uh, an app-based ticket system and validation system. And um, those are now being rolled out on buses and, and will be um, getting uh, tested on various routes uh, coming up soon. So that's also really good news in terms of, again, uh, continued COVID um, protections for our riders and um, really trying to modernize the system as much as possible. Um, I think most of my other reports were made by um, my colleagues. Um, uh, yeah, I think that that is the main thing. I think also the other part of uh, one report out on the two by two um, is that um, we did uh, the city, um, uh, myself, um, and Supervisor Coonerty and Supervisor McPherson did uh, produce a letter to the governor regarding the um, necessary um, uh, need to uh, move, um, begin to uh, help people that are currently there at the one and nine intersection find solutions and shelter um, due, the, due to the city's need to um, activate a, a construction project there in April. Um, so we did work together on submitting a, a letter to the governor regarding that particular situation, but also taking the opportunity to request additional assistance with shelter, um, as well as other needs uh, for um, case management and um, social service uh, provisions. And um, so Supervisors McPherson and Coonerty were able to sign on to that letter as well. So that was a, sort of out, an output of the two by two as well. Um, and I think those are my main reports today. Okay, we'll move on to our next agenda item. Thank you to council members for, many people don't know that we also spend a lot of time on these policy committees and, and various other joint power authority committees. So it's, it's a good time for us to kind of update the community on what, what's happening. Uh, the next item is going to be our consent agenda. And these are going to be items number nine through 20. 
on the agenda today. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, now is the time to call in if you want to comment on items 9 through 20. Instructions are on your screen. Please remember to mute your streaming device, press star 9 to raise your hand, and listen to the queue saying you have been unmuted. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment or pull any items today? Uh, council member Cumming. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to comment on items number 11, 12, 13, 14, and I'd like to pull number 17. 11, 12, 13, 14 for comments, and then you want to pull 17. Correct. Okay. Other council members that would like to comment or just make sure I've got my, okay. Any other council members that want to comment or pull items from the consent agenda? I will make a comment uh, myself on item 20. Okay. Okay. So, uh, council, there has been an item pulled, which is item number 17. And then I would like to um, go ahead and uh, ask council members for their comments or questions on items not pulled. So those would be council member Cummings item 11. I have a comment on that myself, 12, 13, and 14. And I will comment on item 20. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just, <clears throat> as far as item number 11, so that the members of the public are aware, this is uh, the approval of the Climate and Energy Action Plan. Um, and I just wanna, or for the consulting service, uh, professional service contract and climate action program, 18 month work plan and budget adjustment. And I just wanna acknowledge all the hard work that uh, Tiffany Wise West has done with bringing us to this point and also all the members of the public who serve on our climate action task force um, in our community. Obviously, you know, environmental protection is probably one of the, the top priorities of our community. And it's just really encouraging to see so many members of our public come together to help work on this and then, um, you know, for all the hard work that Tiffany's put into this, um, I think that it really, you know, demonstrates that we take climate action seriously and um, just really looking forward to us developing our um, 2030 climate action plan. So thanks to all those who have been working on that. Um, for item number 12, I'm just excited to see that um, we're gonna be hopefully signing on to um, what could be, you know, proposed tax on sugary beverages, which we know have um, health impacts, especially on lower income communities. And so glad to see that we're bringing this forward. Um, item number 13 is the uh, COVID-19 pandemic recovery, the Bar and Restaurant Recovery Act. I know that many people in the community have been expressing wanting to see us um, maintain and continue with the outdoor parklets and allowing people more opportunities to kind of dine outside. And um, I know that for many businesses that have been negatively impacted, this is something that's really helped them. And so to the extent that we can, um, and it's, it, seems, it seems very compatible with our community. And so to the extent that we can um, allow for businesses to continue having par parklets uh, where it appears that it will have, um, um, it won't have negative impacts on our community. I think that um, this will provide us with that flexibility. And so I'm excited to see this come forward because we've heard a lot about it as well. And then um, I just wanna thank the Public Works Department um, for item number 14, the Monterey Bay uh, Sanctuary Scenic Trail, second seven, the reinstatement of the three-way stop on Bay Street in California Ave. Um, I've heard from a number of folks uh, around how pulling that intersection out actually made it um, more problematic. And I've been receiving a lot of emails asking whether we could get that um, reinstated. And so to see, I was driving by the other day and when I saw the stop signs going back in, I was really excited to see that um, the concerns were taken seriously. So I just wanted to thank Public Works for um, working with the community on making that happen. And then I'll just also say that, that to thank Public Works because I've seen a lot of the lit um, crosswalks go in in places where they hadn't been before. And I just wanna say that it's been really um, encouraging and, and I think a lot of people are happy to see more of these crosswalks going in to improve safety on our streets. So thank you, Mark, and thank you, your team, for everything you guys are doing. 
Great, thanks. We appreciate it. And that concludes my comments on uh, those consent items. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councilmember Cummings. I'll also just chime on to the um, great to see the the um, award of the contract for creating our next climate action plan for the next 10 years. And again, just thank Tiffany Weiss West for all her work, as well as the committee that works on this. And um, very excited to see um, some of the items in the work plan and um, those being reflected in our interim recovery plan as well. So I'm really pleased to see the overlap in those two uh, plans, uh, both for near term and long term uh, over the next 10 years for the city. And then uh, I just had a quick comment on uh, item 20 as well. Just wanting to thank um, the water department bringing this forward and our water director. Um, this is a really important pilot project that really understands whether or not we can um, do water transfers um, with our neighboring water district, so Kell Creek Water District. And um, as we go into what looks like another dry year here in California, and you'll hear more later on uh, an agenda item today, um, you know, these kinds of conjunctive use types of approach to how we stretch our, our water supply as much as possible cooperatively and in coordination with our neighboring districts is really important. So um, another uh, important thing that uh, we continue to work on and it's uh, very excited to see that this agreement has been extended um, uh, for uh, additional uh, purposes. And I believe that is the end of comments on items. Um, so I will now go to public comments and this will be for items on our consent agenda. And if there are members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, with the exception of item 17, um, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set to two minutes. And I believe I have three members in the public with their hands raised. And I just wanna make sure you're here to speak on item number 17 of our consent agenda. And I see- This is uh, um, for items, items other than 17. I'm sorry, for items other than 17. Okay, this will be, okay, I see KB Foster is, is, number, is first up. Thank you. Let us recognize that while our intentions are good, the systems in place for safety have created some very serious problems for those in our community. Anyone who saw footage of the situation at our local Trader Joe's can see this. The ones who benefit from the current system could be argued endlessly and in numerous directions, but I did not come here to argue that. I am here to shine light, to shine light on the employees in this footage that say it all frustration. In this example, the managers and employees are caught in the middle of a battle between citizens and the city and state government officials. Excuse me, ma'am. I'm sorry, but this is for items on our on our consent agenda today. This is about number 13. Oh, number 13. Okay. They are on, excuse me. They are on the front line and they are being abused. I'm talking about now the employees and the managers. Our local people, employees, business owners, students, renters, landlords are being emotionally and financially slaughtered like pawns on a battlefield. It is time to stand up and say no to this division and yes to peace. How do we do this? First, see this as an opportunity for growth on both ends. I propose we grow a new branch directing our energy from division to a middle path. Survey the community to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, yes or no. Take the resulting percentages and give businesses the option to allocate different times and days for masked and unmasked consumerism. Return options and choice to the people. Prohibition was a disaster. I propose we take the percent who want masks and allocate that percentage of businesses operating time to them, calling it safe happy hours and vice versa, calling it safe happy hours. If we do nothing, we can
can reasonably predict breed easies will pop up. And in addition to creating more criminals, money would also be taken away from our city via tax evasion. That means less money for your job and salary, more forbearance, more pink slips, and so on. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 1810. And again, this is for items on our consent agenda with the exception of item 17. You can go ahead. Oh, yeah, hi, this is Garrett Phillip. Hey, regarding item number 12, I'm not sure I understand the need to approve a resolution that says the city council would have to consider submitting a proposed tax on the distribution of soda and other sugary beverages to its voters if and when AB 1838 might be struck down, since the council could, of course, consider it at that time anyway, despite whether this resolution passes or not. This seems a bit hinky to me to encumber a future, possibly different mayor or council to maybe have to bring this up later. I'm missing why this resolution is needed at all. The original council approving this tax vote was very different than the one before me today. As far as sugar taxes go, it doesn't prevent people from buying such drinks, doesn't prevent people from just taking their business elsewhere to another city that doesn't have taxes, is meddling with individual liberty and picking winners and losers in the beverage industry. It is also a regressive tax. It's not that you can't make a case excess empty calories from sugar isn't good, but the case can also be made you're just lining the city coffer pockets with people's money and has been tried elsewhere with mixed results. Northwestern University is part of a group studying Philadelphia's soda tax and found the drop in sales data in Philadelphia was met by a similar rise in sales zero to four miles outside the city. The overall consumption then fell by far less than local sales data would suggest. I personally don't buy any sugary drinks and uh, very few artificial sweetened drinks. I'm still fat and this would have no effect on me. If you were really interested in reducing the citizenry's waistlines, maybe take a look at what the government COVID lockdowns are doing to them. Really, I'd love to know. Uh, there would be no end to this kind of thing as you can attack salt, preservatives, fat, nearly endless list, which in huge quantities can be bad for you when education, labeling, and self-responsibility are really the solutions. Eating too many carrots can cause excessive dietary fiber, interfere with the absorption of many essential nutrients, and cause carrot anemia. It's a toss-up whether this resolution itself or me talking about it is more unnecessary. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. And next up on um, items on our consent agenda, with the exception of item 17, your up next your phone number ends in 5758. Hello, uh, my name is Pam Newbery. I'm speaking about item 13 on the agenda as a representative of Community Prevention Partners, a countywide coalition committed to public health and youth substance use prevention. We at Community Prevention Partners express our strong concern with the South Council's proposed letter of support for Senate Bill 314, the Bar and Restaurant Recovery Act. Without further review of the implications of the bill's components to youth safety and well-being, CPP's preliminary research and evidentiary review indicates potential risks to our youth and families. We kindly request the City Council review potential impacts of SB 314's intentions and ramifications prior to submitting a letter of support. We offer support in gathering relevant data, research, and community input for this purpose. CPP recognizes the need for strategies that promote the economic vitality of local businesses. However, we are concerned that extensively increasing the availability of alcohol runs the risk of proportionately easing youth access to it. The Center for Prevention Research and Development found high levels of alcohol outlets in the community enable youth access to alcohol through commercial outlets, family, and social networks. The bill also opens the floodgates for advertising time and space to be purchased by alcohol producers, something historically prohibited in our community. A 2020 study in the Journal of Studies on Alcohol and Drugs shows a direct relationship between exposure to alcohol marketing and underage drinking. Before sending a letter of support, we ask that the City Council recognize some components of SB 314 may be detrimental to community well-being and reverse years of dedicated effort to limiting youth access to alcohol, preventing youth exposure to harmful advertising, decreasing impaired driving, and effectively managing alcohol outlet density. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments today. I'm now looking for 
a motion on the remaining items and the consent, that would be items nine through 20, 20 with the exception to item number 17, which has been pulled. Could I have a, uh, could I have a motion, please? Uh, Council Member Golder. I'll make the motion to move the consent to general with the exception of item 17. And I will, I, I looked down when I looked and came back up. Uh, Council Member Brown, please. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Okay, um, Bonnie, remind me one more time. Um, we do roll call on this. Yes. Okay, roll call vote, please. This would be um, motion by Golder, seconded by Brown uh, to approve <coughs> consent to items nine through 20 with the exception of 17. Okay. Council member Watkins. Aye. Helen Tory Johnson. Aye. Brown. Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. And we will now come back to item number 17, I believe. Council Member Cummings, you pulled that. I did, thank you, Mayor. I um, just wanted to change, um, <clears throat> slightly make an adjustment to some of the language. So um, for those members of the public, item number 17 is an amendment to the downtown commission bylaws. And within the, the red line version of the bylaws, it says that should the county or city of Santa Cruz, uh, Santa Cruz, California, be under a declared emergency natural disaster or an act of God occurs that causes a change in the qualification for a member to member resulting in vacancy, the, disqualif the disqualified member may continue to serve on the commission until a new appointment has been made. Been made. Uh, any other cause of disqualification would result in resignation from the commission. And um, just to be clear, I, th I think it might be more appropriate rather than saying, um, you know, in the case when there's a declared emergency or an act of God, that maybe we could change that to an unforeseen circumstance arises that causes a change in qualifications, et cetera. And um, I just think that there are unforeseen circumstances that come up within many of our lives, and I don't think that uh, they would necessarily qualify as an act of God. And I don't think that we really can define what an act of God is, um, but uh, stating that rather than um, in the case of declared emergency disaster, um, maybe by stating or an unforeseen circumstance arises that that may uh, do a better job of articulating the circumstances under which someone could stay on the board um, while a new individual is found. Um, so that's the change that I'm hoping to make, uh, just to clarify that I don't think we, I think it's subjective to say what an act of God is. And, you know, it could be the loss of a family member that requires that somebody needs to move and no longer lives in this jurisdiction. And I wouldn't define that as an act of God. So. Um, just wanted to put that out there to see if that language change would be um, acceptable by my colleagues. Oh, you're muted, Donna. Is there, uh, I have Council Member Golder and Council Member Bruder. Do you have questions regarding, and Kalantari Johnson regarding um, the proposed? Meeting? No, I'm prepared to make that motion if you do the public comment. There's no public comment on. Uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, did you have a question? No, okay. Okay, so we have a motion, we'll go out to public comment now, but I understand we have a motion by Council Member Golder and a second by Vice Mayor Bruner. Okay. Okay, we'll go ahead and take this item out to public comment at this time. And I see we have uh, Ms. Foster. This is for commenting on item number 17, which is amendment to the downtown commission bylaws. Ms. Foster, did you wanna to speak to this item? Yes, um, I guess I would love to know who wrote the language in there in the first place, and then um, I could better understand why we would take it out. 
Yeah, usually, Ms. Foster, we don't have, this isn't um, kind of a question and answer, it's really more of a comment. Um, okay, so it's a comment that we should know um, the author of this before we decide to edit them. Thank you. Council Member Cummings, did you want to clarify that for the member of the public? I believe it's our city attorney that prepares these. So it can be um, the city attorney. These these were approved by the city council and in order to be amended, uh, the city council has to approve the amendment. The, the uh, it was, a, uh, I believe it was the downtown commission's request mm -hmm. To yeah. make this change and just um I, I and i think council member cummings suggested revisions also make a lot of sense thank you okay we will now um i'm looking so we have a motion by excuse me council member golder second seconded by vice mayor bruner on um consent agenda item number 17. And uh, Bonnie, could you do the roll call vote, please? Yeah, can I just get the motion read again, the language change really quick? Yes. I believe it is to strike, the motion is to strike the language um, act of God and replace it, council member, with, un with the term unforeseen circumstances, correct? Unforeseen circumstances, circumstance arises. You catch that, Bonnie? I did, thank you. Okay, roll call vote, please. Mm -hmm. Council Member Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Holder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you. We'll now move on to our general business uh, agenda. And this will be, our first step is our is a, a, item number 21 which is amending the City of Santa Cruz Environmentally Acceptable Food Packaging and Products Ordinance. Um, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now's the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be presented, will be, excuse me, the order for this item will be a presentation of the item by staff followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Uh, and I will ask Leslie O'Malley, our waste reduction manager, to provide the presentation. Thanks for being here, Leslie. Sure, thanks for having me. Good afternoon, Mayor Myers and council members. I'm here to introduce her publication and ordinance amending chapter 6.48 of the Genesis Municipal Code pertaining to the environmentally acceptable food packaging and products ordinance. On January 14, 2020, Council unanimously voted to pass an amendment to Chapter 6.48 of the Municipal Code pertaining to the Environmentally Acceptable Food Packaging and Product Ordinance. A summary of those changes included uh, adding a 25 cent charge for disposable cups, clarification and refinement of several definitions, a change in accepted materials, moving away from bioplastic to PFAS or polyfluorinated chemical free fiber based items and expanding the upon request mandate for straws, utensils, condiments, and other accessories. September 8, 2020 was identified as the implementation date with a compliance and enforcement deadline of March 8, 2021. The unexpectedly long duration of the coronavirus pandemic created several problems that make that deadline schedule problematic. Businesses have reported hurdles along the supply chain that co make procurement especially difficult. A large part of the ordinance focused on the 25 cent cup charge, and that was to deter the use of non-recyclable disposable cups. While there is no health order in effect restricting the use of customer-owned reusable cups, out of an abundance of caution, many businesses have not returned to filling customer-brought-in cups. 
without a viable alternative to paying for a non-reusable test, compliance would be difficult at this time. As we balance the immediate needs of our residents and business community with our long-term goals of a healthy ecosystem, we think a delay of one year will provide time for businesses to return to more normal and predictable operations, to work through the challenges with procurement, and to get systems in place to allow for the safe return of reusable tests. Waste reduction staff will continue to provide education and outreach on the specifics adopted in January 2020, as well as to enforce the existing provisions restricting non-compostable and non-recyclable plastic foodware. Therefore, staff recommends that the City Council introduce for publication the amended City of San Jose's Municipal Code, Chapter 6.48, pertaining to environmental accepted food packaging and compliance uh, products with a compliance date of March 8, 2022. Thank you, Leslie. Are there questions from council members at this time? seeing any hands raised. Um, Leslie, yeah, being one of the uh, council members that worked with you on this, um, um, I, I definitely understand the, um, and agree with the, with the extension of time. I'm just curious about, I would imagine with the COVID um, timing hitting, how did you feel that your outreach and education was going and whether or not this extra time is actually gonna be helpful in trying to, you know, get people as ready as possible for that new date of implementation. So in other words, having that additional time and being able to have the outreach and education uh, period extended, do you think that will be, um, I guess, more effective at compliance with, with the uh, ordinance moving ahead? Most definitely. Uh, COVID you know, has hit all of us at the city and our, our, our furlough and our time in the office. Um, our team has done a good job of reaching out, but we could certainly do more. And um, the gift of time allows us to uh, collaborate more with economic development and reaching out to the business community. And um, I think that uh, it'll just be better all the way around. Yeah, okay, great. That's good to hear. I mean, I think COVID has set us back in ways with regards to our waste management goals um, with all the things that we've had to change to and all the new, uh, all the new things that are basically, you know, now coming into our waste stream, which um, it's hard to see, and also some of the uh, containment of some of those materials is, I know, difficult. So um, I appreciate you bringing this forward. Um, I know you and I talked about this a little bit earlier this year, and uh, really appreciate your thoughtfulness in trying to kind of make this work for our community and um, also for the environment. Uh, Council Member Golder, do you have a question or a comment? You want to, you're, no, okay. Uh, seeing no other comments at this time for or questions from council members, I'll bring this out to the public to see if anyone would like to comment on this item. This is item number 21, amending the city of Santa Cruz environmentally acceptable food packaging and products ordinance. Um, and I'm not seeing anyone in the public. So we will, I will bring this back to council and uh, Council Member Brown, I, you're muted. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll go ahead and, and move that we introduce the revised ordinance uh, with the, the date change as recommended by staff. Okay, and I see Council Member Watkins. Sure, I'll go ahead and second that. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion by Council Member Brown, seconded by Council Walk, seconded by Council Member Watkins to introduce for publication an ordinance amending chapter 6.48 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code pertaining to environmentally acceptable food packaging. And can we have a roll call vote? Mm -hmm. Councilmember um, Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Myers? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. We will now move on to item number 22, which is the interim recovery plan update. 
for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. And uh, we have Laura Schmidt, our assistant city manager, will provide the presentation today. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor and Council, um, I'm very honored to be back with you to discuss our interim recovery plan, which you adopted in the end of November, and um, the progress that staff has made to try to take your vision that you articulated in that interim recovery plan and operationalize it for moving forward for the city. Can you all see my screen? Thanks. So what I'll be covering today in this parallel to your agenda report that you received in your package is the refinement work that staff has done to date and the alignment work of the projects out there in the various departments to be able to support the interim recovery plan, the oversight and the report that reports that we're proposing to report back to you on a quarterly basis at council meetings and what our next steps will be. So once you um, approved on November 24th, the final interim recovery plan, and you had developed that at the end of October in a special city council workshop meeting facilitated by management partners, um, staff took the guidance that you articulated in that November 24th um, adopted plan and what we targeted was being able to have anybody in the public and all of our departments understand the interim recovery contents and then also be able to digest it and what we ended up doing we hope is trying to simplify it a little bit more as well as pull it all underneath an umbrella thing that hopefully will resonate with you and the community. So in order to honor the work that happened after the Loma Prieta earthquake, that effort and that rebuilding process was called Vision Santa Cruz. So um, staff's recommendation moving forward for the interim recovery plan is to call it Re-Envision Santa Cruz, building a future for everyone together. And in this hopefully, um, dawn of our re-envisioned community, the three focus areas that you articulated were fiscal sustainability, and that was short and long-term, downtown and business revitalization, as well as infrastructure. And within the infrastructure, it is the tradi traditional roads, but also out there on the horizon is the enjoyment of all of our natural resources and our parks and our open spaces as well. And that was a little bit different twist that you guys put on infrastructure, which is not the traditional, just facilities, buildings, roads, and surfaces. And underlying all of these focus areas are critical guiding principles of sustainability and green economy, an engaged community, equity and well being, and essential service delivery. So, based upon this new um, vision of Santa Cruz, what staff did was then went out, hunted and gathered all of their projects and work that was in process to be able to align it to the focus areas or the guiding principles. So what we focused on as far as projects are distinct, a project is something that has a distinct start and end date. They're truly projects and they're therefore not our ongoing operation. So it has to be something that starts and then we know when we're done with it versus ongoing um, maintenance that we may do in any given part of our operation. Those are not necessarily projects. Those aren't contained in the list of items related to a given focus area. We also put that they had to be more than five months in a last time. And because the smaller ones that were done more quickly we didn't think that we needed um, to include those on the radar at this point. And then because it's a 12 to 18 month window, the 18 month window on the outside is June 30th of 2022. So these projects have to have a start or an end date between now and we put now as January 1 actually and June 30th of 2022. So what you have in your agenda packet are two lists. One of them is 
Um, one of them contains the projects related to the 12 to 18 month focus areas, so the three focus areas of fiscal sustainability, downtown and business revitalization and infrastructure. And there's a second list in attachment three for the projects supporting the guiding principles for recovery. So that basically aligns all of the project work in the city to a focus area or to the guiding principles. Just to give you a perspective on the work that you find on the departments, all on those lists, you'll find an enormous amount of work that the departments are embarking on in any given area. But those are really kind of what you see in the iceberg photo um, shown here, where that's what you see above the line. What is below the line is actually um, more reflective of the additional mass of work that the departments are doing operationally and on a day-to-day -day basis. So because um, what you see in the list is what the departments are working on related to the focus areas as well as to the guiding principles doesn't mean that includes the full mass of uh, the scope and the breadth and depth of the work that any given department is doing on a day in day out basis. So that kind of is what happens below the, what you can see on the ocean horizon. In your packet in the attachment to, these are all the projects that departments feel will um, move forward any given focus area, and it's sorted by the top area is ones related to, they're just fundamental to the interim recovery plan, so they're not necessarily associated with the focus area. And then they're sorted by um, the different focus areas, downtown and other business revitalization, then fiscal sustainability, then infrastructure. So that's your attachment to. In attachment three, these pro projects will help us make progress toward our guiding principles for recovery. So um, I added all funding sources in there just because it is it was an, an it was an articulated principle and process. It didn't make the final um, simplified graphic, but there were pretty important projects here, so I wanted to make sure that those were included. And then the rest of it parallels the guiding principles that you articulated during the um, interim recovery plan workshop. So that brings all of the different projects together that support either the movement forward on the recovery or the guiding principles that underlie our city's recovery. So basically we have those projects and we have also performance measures that council approved us to be able to gauge how we're doing as it relates to recovery. So what's the oversight mechanism for re-envision Santa Cruz? How will that work? But staff is proposing to you is there are three components of our quarterly report back to you. The first component of our quarterly report back to you is an outcomes report. So for each area, each focus area, fiscal sustainability, um, downtown and, and business revitalization and infrastructure, we're going to articulate to you what progress has made in each one of those focus areas, and we're going to focus on outcomes that we've achieved rather than just output. So anything in the list of projects we may report on, but we're not going to report on every single project in the list because as you can see, the list is quite um, substantial and long. So our ability to, to report on every single one of those every quarter is not feasible. But what we will do is report on outcomes for each focus area. And the, narr and the format that we'll do that with you is a um, narrative. And the beginning of the narrative is we included in attachment four are the descriptions and the goals for each focus area. And then underneath each one of those description and goal areas will articulate the progress and outcomes under each area. So that would be the first part of the quarterly report that we give you. The second part of the quarterly report that we would give you is the performance metrics report. And those that performance metrics report, we're envisioning as having two pages. The first primary page is the 13 identified metrics that you that you voted on in the workshop. So how are we doing on each one of those? And, and are there any trends or issues that we wanna to bring to your attention? And the format of that for, on the top part of the quarterly performance report, 
we would graph commercial occupancy rates and sales tax. So those were the two that we thought graphically were um, possibly the most indicative of how we're doing as it relates to recovery. And then there will be a table for all 13 metrics that you identified. The fiscal year 2019 year to date as of that quarter in fiscal year 2019 because that is kind of the last normal full fiscal year that we might have had and then the delta of that current fiscal year to date to compare it to. So this is how we were for this metric in the fiscal year 2019. This is how we are in fiscal year 21 as a comparator. And then we'll also report the current quarter, the previous quarter, what the desired trend should be and any comments related to that. Uh, there were also um, thought that in, this, in, the, in, the, in the realm of metrics, there are also other important things going on in the county that we may not necessarily directly have impact to, but would be very informative for a consumer of this information to have as it relates to recovery in our community. So in a secondary page, what we're proposing is we would put information of interest Around, about our surrounding community and county and how things are going, but that we might not directly have an, an impact to that our work doesn't necessarily move this piece of it. So we would have additional graphics, potentially of other information such as the COVID-19 case rate, the COVID-19 vaccination rollout, tourism, transient occupancy tax, um, any other industry updates and trends in the restaurant business, that sort of information that would be helpful to, for somebody to understand how our community is doing during this recovery period. The final component of the packet that we go to you quarterly is um, we put together the two project lists that you have in, in relative short order. So as we make adjustments or additional information or uh, descriptions need to change, we'll update that. But those lists will always be available in your packet of these are the projects that are related to the focus areas. These are the projects relating to the guiding principles for recovery so that you'll always have that depth and depth of work available for you to review and the community to review. And then you can always ask questions related to those um, items should you want to. The next steps that we're proposing is um, we would have a one to two page re envision Santa Cruz handout. So um, I don't remember how many pages the adopted uh, interim recovery plan document is, but it's, it's fairly substantial. So what we're proposing to do is um, condense that into a one or two page handout that clearly articulates what re envision Santa Cruz is all about and what the focus means. And then uh, you would receive the first round of quarterly reports, whatever it is that if you accept our staff proposal today or adjust it, you would receive those at a council meeting in April, and those would represent data from January, February, and March, so um, the first calendar quarter. Additionally, we'll be working with um, our communications manager, Elizabeth, and any other communications um, people in our departments that can help us on a citywide strategy to further align our work with what we're doing because city work needs to align to the vision that you have articulated in re envision Santa Cruz and making it all tick and tie from the what we do on a day to day basis to the projects we prioritize to the way that we budget. All this needs to hang together to what you articulated for us to do as far as your direction. Um, we would put together a campaign plan for community awareness and engagement. Uh, we'd get stand up a web page with the information so it's easily accessible to folks. And then we would also incorporate this into standing communications that we already published, like the city manager's newsletter. So with that, um, that's um, staff's uh, Opera, opera, I can't even say the word. That is how we propose to operationalize the interim recovery plan to re envision Santa Cruz and the components of the um, oversight that we would like to do back to you on a quarterly basis. And with that, I, I appreciate and open it up for questions. Donna, I think you're muted. Our Mayor Myers, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Laura, thanks for that. And um, yeah, for taking, a, yeah, like as you mentioned, a very long a very long document as well as a lot of bits and pieces of um, 
really good work, but um, really bringing it together, I think, um, in a really, really understandable way and a really, most importantly, a, a really clear operational way. So thank you to you. And I know all the departments um, have been spending a lot of time with this. So I just want to express uh, my support and my appreciation of all that work. Um, and Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. And then Councilmember Cummins. Great, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Laura, for the presentation and um, to everyone who put so much work into this. Um, I wanna state for, um, we've had this conversation, but I wanna state for the public that um, there, there are some um, parameters out there or suggestions from um, some folks on how to make jurisdictions grant ready. Um, as we, we know that we will be seeing federal and state funds coming through. Um, and the steps that, that you're putting forward and that the team is putting forward um, are really essential, important steps in making ourselves grant ready. Um, in particular, the one to two page handout really concisely will uh, synthesize what we are going for and what we wanna do. Um, I think the quarterly reports will, uh, will also serve as sort of a, um, almost like a case statement LOI um, for us to work off of. Um, one sort of question, suggestion I have is um, on top of listing what our goals are, what our outcomes are, or, or how, which outcomes we've achieved, um, perhaps having a column of what are the remaining gaps? Because that'll help us articulate when grant opportunities come up. And if feasible, um, what are the dollar amounts connected to those remaining gaps? I think that'll be important for us to know in terms of grant readiness. Um, and then, it, you know, in terms of the indicators, the metrics that are reported, um, one thing to consider to add is how many grants have we um, pursued and how many have we secured as another way for us to um, look at um, success around the fiscal sustainability piece. Thank you for all the work. This is really great. great. Thank you, Council Member. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm writing down notes and um, on the dollars connected and the dollars missing, um, one of the things that we could also do and we've started to do in the attachment two and three of um, when we're missing funding for, because some of the projects on this list are unfunded. So um, that would address, I think, um, what you're suggesting that we do and, and would help us as we pursue grants. Great, thank you. And I've got Council Member Cummings. Councilmember Brown, and then Councilmember Watkins. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Laura, for that presentation. I um, had two questions. One, um, and maybe you mentioned this, but what I was hearing from some members of the public was just some um, confusion and concern around what is, you know, with that, I mean, there's like, maybe not full, but about 18 pages of, um, you know, project names, departments, and who's doing what. And I think one thing that I've heard from members of the public is that it seems like there's a lot that's in there. Um, and for some departments, there's obviously more than others. But what's the prioritization around the different items that are in, you know, that are, that are being proposed? Because I think that the question becomes, this looks like a lot, this, this looks like there's a lot of projects that are on the horizon, but what, which ones take priority, especially given that we're in um, a very financially stressful situation right now, um, the times we're living in. So what's gonna take precedent over other things? And um, yeah, so I'm just wondering if you comment on, on how um, the city is intending to prioritize the different projects for each of the different departments. Um, I I think for one of the, and we, we can make this more clear in the attachments, one of the ways to look at priority is actually, if it's, if it's a high priority um, and if it's, it could already be active. So you'll know that it's active because of the start date. And then if it is, and, if, and once we put the funded, not funded, we'll know whether or not there is funding associated with that. And then um, as far as, for um, other prioritization related to funding, if something is unfunded, whether or not we pursue something in grants, but if there's a request for budget for fiscal year 22, for instance, that would indicate, and you would indicate to 
the department that's requesting funding through the budget process, your approval of that being a priority or not by whether or not you grant funding for it through the budget process. So those items that are active are prioritized, they're in process. Those items that are not started, it could just be a timing issue, but we will indicate through um, funding or not funding whether or not we're able to move those items forward if we have the budget associated with it. And then you would obviously um, direct staff through your approval or not approval of funding requests through budget in fiscal year 22. Did I, that, was there a second question or did you, did I answer your questions? I think so, okay. thank you. Okay, I have uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you, uh, thanks for the, uh, the report and thanks for all of the information that was included in our packet. Uh, I, um, I guess I'm, what I'm looking at here is, you know, it, it seems that you know, as uh, Council Member Cummings said, there's a lot here. Um, it's not entirely clear how we're looking at priorities uh, or prioritization, um, and it, it feels like, you know, kind of an inventory of what the city's uh, currently engaged in, either because we need to do it or because we, you know, decided that that's the direction we want to go, policy or program-wise. And some of these look to be uh, significantly longer term, although I, I get it that they may be initiated during this interim period. Um, but what I'm having a hard time with, and, I, you know, I'm, and I'm hoping that you can help me uh, understand and think about how to articulate, um, because I think what the, what the public wants to know and the community is asking for is, uh, you know, is a, is a sense of, of what we are doing now, specifically tangible things, specifically in the service of recovery, how that um, will support our community and various interests, you know, in a healthy way, our workforce, businesses, marginalized, uh, community members, et cetera. And then, um, you know, to demonstrate that they will actually help with the recovery process rather than just managing, you know, business that, and no, you know, and no judgment there. You know, obviously these are things we need to get done. So I'm just having a hard time um, when I think about trying to explain to a member of the public why this is uh, an important component for our interim recovery plan, you know, in many of these instances, like how to do that. So if you could help me uh, understand uh, how to make that more uh, apparent and tangible to the community, that'd be great. Laura, you're on mute. Uh, now we can hear you. Can you? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yep. My um, Zoom rebooted, and so I don't know what it's, uh, it's lagging. But Council Member Brown um, and Council Member Cummings, I, I hear what you're saying, and I will cycle back with the department on um, the information that we have to see how we could uh, better articulate that, and so it, it could be more. Um, clear to the average person of how any given project progresses the interim recovery and prioritization of them of those we'll see what we can do uh, can i just add the other thing of course that you know during a uh, an emergency or when you're in a crisis mode you know continuity of services is really critical too uh, and so that's a big part of this as well ensuring that that, that occurs um, and then uh, again, also going back and focusing on those areas that the council identified as uh, the priority areas. And so to a large extent also given the, where we are with the pandemic and, and fiscal situation, a lot of it is also just trying to preserve and keep what we, what we have. That's, that's by the nature of what we're experiencing has to be a big part of what we do. Um, and we are a um, ambitious community, so we have a lot of things in the works, which just just, so, just to complete the things we're already doing would be an incredible achievement if you think about all the housing and all the various you know, 
projects that are being that are in the works. It's it's pretty incredible. So it just by its nature is is a big part of it. Just to kind of note that. Other questions, Councilmember Brown. Okay. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. Sorry, um, I too just want to thank you for your work on this and appreciate the comments um, made by my colleagues. I, um, I have a few comments, one in, in sort of the spirit that Councilmember Kalantari Johnson brought up with being grant ready. And I know we talked about whether or not, you know, we need to provide more support for grant writing uh, for the organization as well. And so I just really want to kind of highlight that as um, you know, as an essential element to bringing in funding to do many of the um, activities and goals that we have laid out in this plan. So um, also adequately understanding how to support the staff and receiving those grants and the grant support as needed. Um, and then the other comment I have or um, suggestion is how to align um, our various activities with our uh, existing plans and we mentioned earlier in the agenda that we had a uh, kind of an item about the climate action 18 month work plan um with with alignment to goals there i know that came up a lot in terms of our planning process we also have the health and all policies outcomes metrics that are coming up so um how can we integrate those into this plan so we're seeing that uh sort of that um uh, nexus between existing work and efforts and initiatives underway. And I think with um, regards to kind of some of the work with the health and all policies is just looking at that through an equity lens and thinking about how we're factoring that into um, metrics or uh, decision making as well. So those would be my comments as uh, enhancements moving forward. Thank you. Um, I wanted to um, acknowledge that thank you for the appreciated appreciation and I wanted to acknowledge the all the work that the department um, put into this as far as sending in their information and they were they they worked like gangbusters and were really on time so I really appreciated all the coordination efforts that happened within every department to get everything back to the city manager's office and there was a subset of department heads that worked on um, filtering and continuing to refine the information over and over again. So I wanted to acknowledge that there was a sub team associated with this as well and thank them for doing that work. Uh, related to your first comment on the grants front, um, back, it's been a few months now, probably as the interim recovery plan began to emerge and the grant opportunities um, began to be very apparent of what we were pursuing and um, the fact that there were opportunities that we were missing as well. The city manager's office started um, putting together a business case. So assistant to the city manager, Susie O'Hara, is working on a grant writing business case of um, being able to justify the use of general fund budget to expend because if we expend you know, X number of dollars working with a consultant to improve our grant writing capacity and ability to pursue opportunities, X number of you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars will come back to the city in, in awarded grants. So we are in the process of um, finalizing a business case there and getting that in front of, um, we've asked uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson to kind of be a special advisor on that piece of it because of all the work she's done with grants. And then I'll go to the department heads and what we'll do is we'll coordinate better the grant opportunities across the department but also um, hopefully hire a, a, a managed service uh, partner to be able to help us increase our grant writing capacity so that we can win the dollars and win well back more than we would invest in that service and that consulting outlay. Um, re regarding the alignment of all the different plans and activities, um, Rosemary Menard is amazing when it comes to putting multiple pieces of long-term strategic visions together and then making sure that the puzzle all, all works effectively. So she's been very helpful and is continuing to uh, move us forward as far as uh, pull together all, we, we have so many plans and strategies, the Wharf Master Plan, the Health and All Policies, Interim Recovery, um, Roads, like there's, we have all of it, but 
pulling it together to see how they all inter interconnect and what we're working on and prioritizing and be able to move, be able to move that forward in an integrated, articulated way is something that um, we need to do more of. And so she's helping us get that part figured out. And um, that is part of one of the uh, first uh, rows of projects in the attachment to that has the 12 to 18 month uh, focus area projects. So w we recognize exactly what you're saying and um, we're working on that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Donna, you're muted. Mayor, yeah, Mayor, I think you're. <laughs> I'll chime in here a little bit. Um, yeah, I mean, I really appreciate the work. Um, what strikes me on this is 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 the 12 to 18 month period, but more largely the um, really the rollout over the next what I would really realistically say is about 10 years of of really change in the city of Santa Cruz, and so. Um, I think this plan represents sort of a really a decade type of a, you know d decade time frame that that it will take us to come out of um, the COVID component, um, but also the goals and the things that we are looking at to help our community come out of the out of the p pandemic with. Um, I'm excited that we've included things like our green and green infrastructure along with our traditional infrastructure, and we've also identified the um, the housing that we're looking at as well, because all of those things, um, new bike trails, um, housing, a new library, all of those things come together really, I think, over a decade um, of really probably the most investment in our community that really since the earthquake in 30 years. Um, and so, you know, every community, I believe, you know, we're gonna go through periods of renewal and I actually do think, um, and I appreciate the very uh, sunshiny uh, logo that you've come up with because um, I think this plan, little and mighty as it may be, actually really establishes sort of a, a forecast for work ahead and really one of those probably, uh, you know, 25 year kind of change in our community. So I, I'm excited to see it all in one place. Um, and I think unfortunately, um, despite all the, uh, you know, with the horrific things that COVID has brought, um, I'm glad to see that we now have also a federal government that's willing to invest in its people again. And um, I think we have to be part of that solution and we have to be investing in our community and the people who live here. So um, I'm excited to see it all in one place, um, ready for my t-shirt with the cool little sun on it. And I appreciate the work that the staff has done in doing this. So if you, you can't get there if you don't have a vision and the vision may look big, may look complicated, but um, I know that um, if we don't put it out there, it's we won't get there. So thanks. With, with our budget situation, I may have to uh, whip out my homemade printing press and iron on something for you on a t-shirt. <laughs> you could make some iron arms. I, I, we could sell those. Yeah. You know, we could make money yeah. off of it. <laughs> so thank you very much, Laura. I know you've put a ton of time into it yourself and appreciate yours and Martine's guidance and really, really kind of stepping outside the comfort zone and putting out a pretty big vision. So really appreciate it. Thank Other you. Questions? comments from council members before I take it out to the public. Okay. Uh, I see. Mayor Myers. Yes. I'm sorry, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, I, I have a quick question for Laura. Uh, one of the things you Will you clarify that maybe some of the priorities, it sounded like some of the priorities would be defined based on funding? Um, so I think for items that are unfunded, I think what I was trying to articulate is if an item is unfunded um, or funded, that would help address 
Council Member Kalantari's point of we need to be able to identify quickly um, for grant purposes those things that we aren't able to do because of a funding situation. And then um, I followed that with an answer, I, I, and what I was trying to articulate is um, you guys can articulate, the council members can articulate priority back to staff that if something is unfunded and we come to you in the fiscal year 22 budget process asking for funding, you can, pri you can articulate your prioritization and your desire for us to make something a high priority by your actions of funding or not funding during the budget process. Thank you, that's helpful. You're welcome. Question. Okay, I'm looking uh, out to the public for any public comments. I am not seeing anyone with their hand raised, but if you would like to comment on this item, which is item number 22, the interim recovery plan update, now would be the time to raise your hand so we can get you onboarded for making those comments. Okay, I am not seeing anyone out in the public. I'll bring it back for any final um, Comments from our council members. I see council member Watkins and vice mayor Bruner and uh, assuming maybe there's a motion in play. Council member Watkins. You assumed correctly. I was gonna move the item and the recommendation to accept the staff report and to work on opera, 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 operationalized. I got it, Laura. That's a tough one. The interim recovery plan and adopt ongoing status reporting format with uh, suggestions that were noted by council members today. Whew, that is a tough one. And Vice Mayor uh, Bruner, did you want to? I second. Okay, great. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor um, by council member Watkins, seconded by Vice Mayor Bruner to accept the staff report on work to operationalize the interim recovery plan and adopt ongoing status reporting formats. And could we do a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Golder? Aye. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. Mayor Meyer. Aye. That, pa that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laura. Next up is going to be item number 23. Um, we have a little bit of time in our schedule that we've gained. And um, Rosemary, I hope you don't mind, but I'm hoping we could just take a five minute break to um, just. Yeah, take absolutely. Okay. Thanks so much. So we will come back at. Uh, let's just come back at 2.55, please. If that works for everybody, and then we'll probably get out a little early. We'll come back at 2.55, thank you. Thanks for everybody for being so prompt coming back. Um, okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, Council member, just for our colleagues, Council member Golder has a, a work meeting she had to attend to. Um, so she'll be returning back for the 530 session. Okay, we are now on to item number 23 which will be um, an update of Santa Cruz's water shortage contingency plan. And I will turn this over to our water director, Rose, Rosemary Menard. Thank you, uh, Mayor Myers, Vice Mayor Brunner and council members. Appreciate this opportunity to bring forward today a really important uh, piece of work that we've been working on for about a year now and that uh, does a, a pretty good sized job of updating uh, an existing product that the council took action on in uh, 2009. So with that, I'm going to share my screen and um, hopefully we will get to a place where we can uh, 
have you see my presentation. Okay. Um, I would like to, uh, I, I do have a somewhat lengthy presentation here. It's, uh, it's quite a bit of material to, to cover, but I would like to kind of pause and, uh, at the end of uh, the kind of introductory and sort of what's changed phase and let there be an opportunity for questions at that time and talk about the direction we want to move in terms of the, how the um, allocations and, and targets were created. And then, uh, then finally sort of pause after that and then also to um, then do the last bit about the the actual specifics of some of the allocation strategies so that you can sort of see what we have in mind. Um, this this uh, project is being described, or the, the plan is being described as an interim uh, update. And the reason is that there's some elements of it that aren't included here that uh, will are being developed as part of the urban water management plan update. Uh, and will be ultimately married in. And when you get the urban water management plan to take action on, probably in sometime in the late in the fall, then we will put the pieces together and uh, we'll, we'll repeat that. But because of the, the significant changes we've experienced in the nature of water consumption, I wanted to get this plan in front of you and in front of the community before the coming uh, demand season and the off chance that we need to implement it. So. That's kind of what you're being asked to do is to sort of take that action to uh, adopt um, this this plan. Um, so again, my my plan today is an overview of the existing plan adopted in 20, uh, 2009, and then a uh, talking about change conditions, which are really at the heart of why this current plan is gonna look so different from the last one. And then talk about some uh, the reduction targets and the elements of the new plan and then demand the customer demand reduction strategy. Um, as mentioned, we do have an existing plan. Uh, it, it, has, it, it was the basis for what was used in the rationing that we did in 2013, 2014 and 2015. And uh, we have implemented that plan a number of times. You can see that we have uh, about half of the years between uh, the, when this plan came out and now we've, we've had some version of it in effect really only the years, um, you know, these 2010, 11, and then 16 and 17, which you will recall was a very wet year, and then 19. Last year we had a dry year, but we decided not to implement the plan in part because things were pretty um, chaotic in the community already, and having water restrictions on top of it did not seem like a good idea, and we were, you know, in a good enough shape that we felt like we could avoid that. Um, the plan, the current plan has uh, five stages, sort of as the as the required new plan is. The the initial stage in that one was only a five percent, and the second stage was a fifteen percent. That particular fifteen percent goal was <clears throat> to define the, um, the the activities that would occur to um, achieve the routine 15% curtailments that were included in the integrated water plan adopted in 2003. So that, as I mentioned, uh, and some of you have talked with about this, there was a sort of a three-legged stool that was adopted as part of the IWP about a water supply strategy. One was routine curtailments of up to 15% because that really was mostly focused on residential irrigation and reducing that, making that a little bit more efficient. There was a, a long-term water conservation, and then there was a supply augmentation piece to that three-legged stool. There are requirements in the Urban Water Management Planning Act that we comply with that require us to have a, an existing plan like this. And I think the really important thing for us to talk about here is that the uh, this this particular plan, uh, that plan, that plan, the 2009 plan, was based on water use characteristics and demand in the 2002 to 2004 timeframe, and uh, many many things have um, have changed since then. Uh, all of us probably weren't carrying around cell phones in quite the way we are today, or you know having the internet being quite so big of a part of our life, but. Uh, in addition.
addition to those kinds of things that have changed just in our community and our society, the overall level of water demand is now significantly lower than it was uh, when the original 2009 plan was uh, created. The peak season demand is also significantly lower, but our water supply crunch, the problem we have, which is the peak season and lack of storage in our system to get us through dry years, and particularly multiple dry years, has not changed. So that those factors are, you know, that problem is still in place. Uh, this graph is a little bit crazy, but I think it really does a, an interesting, uh, it presents the, the basic change that we've experienced in a pretty interesting way. All of these sort of gray and blue and this sort of dark black color, these are uh, annual daily demand sort of going around a, a sort of an average that occurred in the um, 2013 and before. And everything that's this sort of pink and red and these brown colors, 2014 and later, all the way through, um, I think this goes to 2019. But the trends right now that we're experiencing are, are exactly the same. And this is represents a fundamental uh, downshift in the way our customers are using con uh, water in our, in our community. I think it reflects a very long-term commitment to water conservation. And it also does something that's called hardening of the demand, which means that 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 15 percent we used to target to go after when we had dry years really isn't there to target anymore. People's use has been, uh, you know, substantially changed. Um, the sort of this table kind of talks. You can see that every one of the line items here is you know 30 to 40 percent lower than it was in 2002 to 2004 um, and that has really big uh, implications on both how our system operates and how we have to plan for um, our our water shortage contingency restrictions when we when we have that situation these numbers reflect uh, these changes in population which again is a demonstration of the very high degree of commitment to efficient water use that exists in our community. Really a, a tremendous performance, um, a little bit of a double-edged sword. So we're going to talk a little bit more about what that all means. Um, and this kind of breaks that, that the last two charts down into a little bit more detail. So you can see for each one of the customer groups that we have, uh, the kinds of changes that have occurred in this um, in this period, in particular, the representation of the the you know 40 percent decline in single family is a is a huge uh, re recognition of the fact that irrigation is not something that's going on in the way that was going on 20 years ago in this community. And I think that we all see that in the way our front yards look like and the, you know what people are doing in their front yards to um, improve water use efficiency. So this cumulatively really changed how we started to think about what we needed to do when we talked about going forward with um, with fix, fixing, you know, to updating the water shortage contingency plan. Um, this, the, the demand season that we really plan for is, has about, uh, you know, 40% of the, uh, or 60% of the total demand of, in the annual demand. So our number is about 1.35 billion. And this shows you how it's allocated among our various customer classes. The, the just plain irrigation number uh, is over here. It's a much smaller number than historically would have been the case. There is irrigation in this uh, in the single family area in particular. You're gonna see some more data on that a little bit further on in this presentation. But this is the place where um, you know these changes are pretty dramatic. And you'll see that this uh, the, the goals that we have to reduce the demand under the new required 10% um, per stage um, water shortage contingency plan requirement that we have from the state uh, are driven by this number, this 1,358 uh, million gallons. 
And I think with that, I'm going to stop for a second and see if the council members have any questions about the nature of the changed conditions before we move on. And I, council members, any questions on your end? Okay. Yeah. All right. So moving on, when we when we get a situation when we're starting to do this kind of planning. Uh, we are looking at a set of priorities. It's, uh, it, it was a, a process that was developed in the last go round of the planning process and for, for water shortage contingency planning. And it really does help to uh, us think about what are the priorities for water use among our customers. And the way that it was done last time and that we've maintained this go round is health and safety water is the highest priority. So the goal for us is to try to figure out how to, you know, protect that water as best we can as we make the sort of sequential cuts that might have to be made in the plan or in the implementation of the plan. Um, commerce water, water used in, um, in business, uh, whether it's a production kind of business or whether it's, a, you know, a restaurant that's using water for cooking food that it's selling or it's a uh, hotel motel that's using water, you know, for its guest rooms, that kind of thing. That historically has been protected all the way through like stage four. Relatively little cuts were, few cuts were made to those, that kind of usage in the old plan. And unfortunately, with the demand uh, requirements being what they are, the demand characteristics being what they are, uh, now we're not able to protect that use in quite the way we were in the last go round. And then the lowest priority is uh, irrigation water. And you know, we all know that this isn't a completely uh, zero value because we know that parks and open spaces are a really critical part of our community. But on the other hand, it's also the more discretionary use um, that does exist and that, that we've really targeted this for reductions at a higher level than the other, um, than the other uses. Um, when you take the same 113.58 million gallons and you divide it up into those characteristics, health and safety and commerce and irrigation, you get this picture and it helps you to sort of see that even in the situation that we find ourselves in, most of our water these days is being used as would be expected to support health and safety activities in our community. Um, this table shows on the individual class basis the proportionate share of the, you know, their, the total use for that class, how much is in health and safety, how much is in irrigation. And you'll see that in business and industrial, for example, um, typically all the business and industrial com uh, irrigation is happening under this category. So there's no irrigation, but we've divided it up between the health and safety uses. This is a, a business that maybe has, you know, employee restrooms, that kind of thing, and it's not using water much in the production of products or, you know, the sale of um, products to or services such as hotels or restaurants. Uh, UCSC has a fairly good sized chunk in health and safety and a, another chunk in irrigation water. Um, and then municipal includes all city facilities, including parks, all city parks are in this, uh, this category. And then just general irrigation. And we have a couple of other categories here. Um, the, the golf course irrigation in 2009, there was a lot of discussion with this community about whether they're a business or whether they're an irrigator. And there was a sort of a compromise made to give them a chunk of this water uh, as a recognizing that golf courses in general are businesses. Uh, at that time, it was Pasa Tiempo and Bella Viega golf course were the two that were in that conversation. And then finally, North Coast Ag Irrigation. So you can see that, that the water has been uh, sort of divvied up into these very ca various categories. And um, from there, we, uh, you know, we prioritized it and um, really are looking at uh, now allocating uh, for each each kind of stage how much of the original sort of baseline water would be provided. And you'll see that in some of these later on that 
in some cases, the numbers don't fall in the sort of general, like 95, 90, 85, that kind of thing. And it's because of the mix of, um, of irrigation water as that's targeted more heavily for curtailment and then health and safety water. So our, the plan requires us to, uh, the state requires us to come up with a six stage plan, a greater than 50% cut in the last stage. Uh, these are huge changes and we can talk a little bit more about this toward the end, but I'll sort of show you in a, a kind of a framework what this means. But uh, these stages, I will tell you, I think that anything beyond a stage two here is really, uh, it's really a painful cut that we would have to absorb in the community. And uh, we are certainly doing everything we can to get supply augmentation in place so that you know, the size of our um, worst year shortages are lower and more tolerable and, you know, maybe a stage one or a stage two at the most. Um, someone in the Water Commission has been very involved in this conversation, asked me at one point about, you know, how could we really do these higher stages? And the answer is, well, in our case, we really can't. So we have a strategy that's a combination of um, you know, some curtailment, even though we have to produce this larger plan, but really it's supply augmentation is, is the thing that we have to be focused on at this point. Um, again, you'll see that at the various stages, the proportionate share of the um, in normal year consumption that will happen. And kind of, you can see that after stage three, there is no irrigation water to cut. Uh, this is this is pretty draconian, and you'll see also in a in a very you know at the lower stages the amount of water that's available for commerce uh, is really significantly impacted also, and there's no way to protect health and safety water for you know residential customers or other kinds of uses. So it's this is this is a a big change from the plan that we currently have. I know this this uh, this table has a lot of, um, of information on it, and I don't want anybody to have to um, you know sort of. There's not going to be a test. Let's put it that way. Uh, but I will say that it does show the level of detail that we've gone to in trying to figure out you know how much each um, each customer class gets and, and the allocations associated with it. And you need this level of detail in order to really look at it and say, okay, what are the right demand reduction strategies that get us from, you know, a 517 million gallon normal demand, even under stage one to a 463 million normal demand or in a stage two to, you know, 100 plus million gallons a day less. And that's really the purpose of this particular, uh, this table. Um, ben and uh, Ben Pink from my staff, as well as Toby Goddard did a lot of work on this before he departed about a year ago to really get us at this level of detail. And again, this chart is really helpful in helping us think about how do we achieve these cuts in the event that we need it, we need to have them. Um, so any questions on that part about the sort of general, uh, you know, what are the targets? Because now we're going to move into the demand reduction strategies. Any questions? I have a question, Rosemary, but any other questions by council members? No? Okay. Um, I had a question about, well, one question I had, uh, Rosemary, was um, how do how do hospitals where where do hospitals fall in all this? They're not commerce, they're not personal or residential. Where do they fall if there was some of those scary numbers? Yeah, they're they're in the business and industrial class, and actually we do have a kind of an exception policy for certain businesses. We've had a lot of conversations with that because you know you take this information and then you start to operationalize it, and you get to these you know the places where you say to yourself okay, so what are we really trying to do here? And what, you know, what can we do um, to protect certain kinds of critical businesses? And hospitals are certainly one of those healthcare facilities in general are in that group. Um, okay. So it's, it's kind of done on an exception basis. Great. And then on the, um, I know the North Coast um, agriculture, I know that that, 
we provide city water up there, correct? And that is, uh, are those existing rights that that those, I'm just curious about the North Coast Ag, because I remember there's some kind of obligation on our end for that, correct? Yeah, so, th so we have two kinds of customers in the North Coast. We have raw water customers who are irrigation only customers. Those are typically growers, uh, either on their own land or on uh, tracks that they've uh, leased from Trust for Public Lands under Coast Dairies or the state parks, for example. Um, and and uh, the, the use of that community has gone down substantially in the last 10 years, I would say. Uh, at the time that this original uh, 2009 plan was developed, their annual use was estimated about 63 million gallons a year. And as you can see in the 2016-2018 in the uh, year that we use as our base year, it's about 13 million gallons. That's because of um, alternate sources that have been developed over time by many of the, the farmers. Um, so, so we have, uh, you know, have longstanding relationships with them and those are, kind of, um, uh, you know, in, in place. The other kind of use we have is a, is a backfeed of treated water that goes up the coast to feed domestic uses. And that one is, those people are, those folks are treated exactly in the same way as residential customers. Okay. And I guess my last question, when I look at, especially like the stage four, um, well, really even stage three, you start to get to the points where you're cutting back so much, but your cost to produce that unit of water doesn't decrease. <laughs> so you are still, you're still producing the unit of water, but you're basically, you know, you're getting, you're incrementally reducing what you potentially your rate would be paying. Um, yeah. Because they're, you know, everybody's using less water, so you're. Yeah. So I'm just curious, um, and of course, um, so I'm just curious about uh, how that gets built into the business plan over the long haul. Right. The production of the water currently, but then any other, any other things that you may have to do as well, because if you. If you had the double whammy of a long-term drought, which causes economic downturn, and then you also are producing water at the same rate that you're, it's costing you to produce it, you get the yeah. climate I mean, this is all about climate change. This is, we're living in a brand new world, basically. Yeah. We're moving towards a brand new world. And so maybe just a couple of comments for, you know, just your thoughts on that. Yeah, so, so it's really a good point. I mean, a very little, very, a very low level of the water department's total cost of operation are variable. In other words, if we produce, you know, 10 fewer gallons or 10 more gallons, it, the, our costs don't change very much. Really the only two variable costs we have are power and uh, chemicals. So when we have to restrict demand, Starting in 2014, when we did this, we did work with the council to put in place what we called then the drought cost recovery fee. So, um, you know, the unfortunate reality is that we cut production and we asked people to cut their use and then we charged them more because we had to make ourselves financially whole, right? Right. So at the, at the time that we did the 2016 water rate adjustment, we built in a set of drought cost recovery fees that would go into place automatically in the event that the council declared, you know, a stage for reduction. Typically in the spring, like April, we bring the council a recommendation saying, okay, here's where we are and we need to, you know, we're recommending that you implement stage two of the water shortage contingency plan. At that point, the drought cost recovery fee effects would go into a place uh, on the meter charge, so a fixed charge that would happen over a whole calendar year and then would be taken off once that had run their course. And we will be bringing something like that again when we do the uh, update to the water rates, which will happen later on this year. So so it's, it is a very, um, you know, 
it's a very difficult thing for the community to use less, pay more, right? But that's kind of where we are with our with our uh, water supply situation, and one of the one of the really important strategies for moving forward is to get that supply augmentation in place. So at the very least, if people are paying more, they have a reliable supply of act of water, uh, you know, that they can depend upon. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so continue on, Rosemary. Thanks for that. Okay. So we, in looking at how do we get there, um, we really understood, you know, how do, what kind of demand reduction strategy will get us where we need to be at each one of these stages. We really understood that the new demand characteristics, you know, lessened our ability to do the sort of less painful kinds of curtailments things where we tell people don't water your lawn between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, people aren't doing that, so there's no point in telling them not to do it. Um, and, and that really uh, made us realize that we need, if we have to do curtailments, we need some pretty strong you know, guarantees, if you will, that we're going to get the kind of cuts that we've asked for because we don't have a big backup or, you know, anything that supplies our needs in the event that we run out. So it's really important that we accomplish what we aim to accomplish. And it also is important that people feel whatever happens is done fairly and that it's easy to implement or relatively easy to implement and for customers to understand. So those are the kind of criteria that we were using and thinking about what the right strategy would be. Um, as, as mentioned, there's really generally two kinds of strategies here. One is prescriptive measures and prohibitions. At the last, uh, in 2014, we had you know, one of the prohibitions that went into effect when we did stage three was you couldn't fill your swimming pool or your spa. And we did have some real pushback from the local businesses that sold, you know, hot tubs saying, you're hurting my business because, you know, you're telling people they, if they buy one of these things from me, they can't fill it up. And so that certainly is a strategy that has been used and that under, you know, pinned the first three stages of the last uh, plan that we had. And the second strategy is sort of customer allocations. It's, that's allocations is kind of another word for a ration. This is what you get. And we actually are recommending that we use an allocation strategy because it gives the customers freedom to use water as they see fit within their allocation and it can be implemented using the mechanisms of the billing system. So the strategy that we're pursuing actually is from stage one for all customer classes, re reduced allocations. And uh, for our, for our um, residential customers, the current average monthly use is 6.1 CCF and we would be putting a uh, five allocation, five, five CCF in the, uh, in as the, at stage one, it would still be five at stage two, but after stage one, the um, excess user fees would, use fees would go into effect. The billing system can only have, uh, deal with whole numbers. So we're a little bit stuck with, you know, we can't say your allocation is 5.5, this go around and, and 4.9 the next go around. So, We've done some rounding. And then uh, at stage three, it would be four, and at stage two, it would be three, uh, and or stage five, four and five, it would be uh, three. It, it's um, important to note that in 2013, 2014, 2015, the allocation for single family residential customers, the ration was 10 CCF. So this is a lot less going into it. Um, and then for um, businesses, we've really sort of done a lot of work thinking about 
how do businesses use water? How can we, you know, ration them or give them allocations that match what we're, uh, what we really are trying to do and what they need? And what we've sort of concluded is that the best strategy is a kind of indiv individualized approach. Um, that would, I'm sorry, where did my graph go? Here it is. Um, this, this would say for take, take a business with a seasonal allocation uh, or a seasonal use pattern, that's the, the up here where they, you know, think of a hotel or a motel where their use in the shoulder seasons might be low, but there it would peak in the summertime when we have a lot of visitors and actually cut them back based on the percentage at each stage so that they're, um, they wouldn't have more water than they need in the shoulder seasons and not enough water to meet their needs in the peak season. So this is a more labor intensive process, but it also I think will give us a better likelihood that um, our business customers and industrial customers will be able to, um, to, to work with that. And I think that uh, the other thing to, to make note of is that there'll be a, a real need for a lot of customer resources that help people to identify ways that they can uh, take action to meet the needs that they uh, have with, you know, in the best way they can within their allocation. Um, one of the important things that we, that we know is that those people who are already conserving, you know, uh, and we do have many customers in the single family group, for example, who use fewer CCF per month than six, even in the even in the summertime, will have it an easier time of being able to um, comply, particularly in the first couple of stages of this. Someone who's having, uh, you know, either a larger household, for which there will be an exception process, but someone is less conserving for whatever reason will be struggling harder. And I think you did get a, a, a piece of communication from what, from a community member kind of commenting about, you know, what he saw as a challenge for his, um, his household. Um, so we will be developing, you know, a whole set of these kind of community resources that help people, you know, understand what, what, how they might be using water in their home or their, you know, in their residence, and then look for opportunities that would create opportunities for them to improve that or to reduce the, um, their use. And then finally, I just wanted to sort of point out a couple of uh, metrics here that I think really tell a story about what this means. Uh, in, this, in this calculated residential gallons per capita per day line, you can see that it goes with no deficiency, again, in the peak season from about 50 gallons per capita per day, which is still under the state, uh, the state goal, way substantially under, to roughly half of that at, at stage five. Um, the, the CCF per month is cut roughly in half, obviously. Our average production out of the water plant in, uh, you know, in the summertime is around 8 million gallons a day. It's down from, you know, what it was obviously 20 years ago, but that would roughly go in half again as well. So these are, these are significant changes that are, uh, you know, hard to imagine as actually getting to a place past this sort of 20% deficiency. Um, but it really means that we've kind of got ourselves in a situation where there's there's not much room to maneuver. If we have the 76, 77 kind of event or, you know, a couple of 2014s back to back, uh, which we're not really in that situation right now in spite of the fact that last year was dry, you know, we are going to be in a kind of a world of hurt and we're going to need everyone in the community to step up and do their part. And I think with that, I will take your questions. Well, just as I finished my coffee just now. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I have council member, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner and then council member Cummings. Go ahead, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you for that report, Rosemary. Uh, very thorough and very sobering. 
to learn all about um, all about what we're facing. So uh, in this allocation strategy, can you speak a little bit to how that works with multi-residential homes? Sure. So there is a section in the plan that describes the multifamily residential. And it's basically a strategy is used, it's based on number of units. So if the allocation is uh, for residential is five, and there's a multifamily residential that has, uh, you know, five units. It's going to be 25 units for that for that monthly allocation. There's a little bit of a tweak in there regarding whether they have a, a separate um, irrigation meter on the property for the whatever landscaping might exist, or whether it's an integrated piece. It would be a tiny bit less in the event that it's a separate irrigation meter because that irrigation meter would be being regulated under a um, it would be regula being regulated under an irrigation curtailment on that meter. So that's the, that's the strategy. And we do something similar to that right now with respect to the way the rates are structured. So there are tiered rates for single family and the same tiered rate structure exists for the multifamily except for it's the allocation in each one of the tiers is multiplied by the number of units in the building. And that's assuming they kind of each equally uh, use the same or similar amount. Yeah, and, and we do have a, um, one of the things about the, the plan that we proposed here is it includes a uh, assumption about three person per household. But there's a provision called an exception process that allows for a household with more people in it, a higher population density to come and get additional water allocation. And that would occur in the in the single family or in the multifamily as well, although uh, it it gets a little bit more muddled in the sense that you know you you would probably create the average um, population density over the whole set of units rather than each for each unit, right? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. most of the multifamily that would be covered in this kind of a strategy does not have a individual meters on their right. individual units. Right, and and most of them that I, at least that I'm aware of, have the water costs folded in with rent. Right, but, and but so again, incentivizing the, the, um, the property manager to, you know, keep in mind what the census is for the, the building mm -hmm or the, the property and coming to us and asking for additional water if it's more than an average of three per unit. Great, thank you. Council member Cummings. Yeah, thanks Rosemary for that presentation. I just wanted to get some clarification because it sounds like um, you know, this structure, I, I guess to, to provide some context, I recently was speaking with somebody about the water rationing the previous time and they had been mentioning how um, they would very, very much like to see this kind of like alloc customer allocation strategy because, you know, if one person wants to, you know, water the lawn or wash the car versus taking multiple showers a day versus somebody else who may have a large family where everybody's bathing, that having that option um, is really helpful so that individuals can control their water use. So I just wanted to just um, see if you could clarify that. And I guess along with that is, you know, under the um, customer allocation strategy, I'm just I'm just trying to make sense of teasing apart um, single family versus irrigation. So under this strategy for a single family home, um, would that person then have the option of whether it's, you know, deciding whether they want to use the water that they're allocated to water their lawn versus indoor use? Um, is that the... And then, Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So. The, the current Muni Code, uh, Chapter 16, I think it's point oh one or I forget, 01.10 or something. I, but anyway, there's a whole section in the Muni Code that is the implementation strategy for the current uh, water shortage contingency plan. And it includes in that code all kinds of prohibitions and restrictions and prescriptions. You can do this, but you can't do that. With the, with the exception of water waste, which we don't allow any time under any circumstances, all of that 
information, all that content will be stripped out of the muni code and the muni code will be, the muni code will become more of the, you know, the backbone of what the basic allocation strategy is. And customers will have complete control over how they use their water uh, and what they want to do with it. If somebody wants to, Mike Rotkin told me during the water supply advisory committee process that he likes to grow corn. Well, if he wants to stop bathing and grow corn, you know, he can stop bathing and grow corn. Not that he would, but you know what I mean. <laughs> sure. No, thanks. I, I think that um, there's going to be a lot of folks who appreciate this approach. And so I just want to thank you and your team for all the work you all did to bring this forward. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll wrap up my questions. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Martine, did, uh, Councilmember Watkins, did you have any questions? I saw your hand up, but then it went down. It went down. Yeah, no, I don't have any questions. Thank you, Rosemary. Well, I, maybe I just have one. Maybe just have one question. One is, I think, um, thank you for your work in your, and to the advisory um, committee as well. And I think as the vice mayor put it, it's very sobering information and concerning. I think compounded by climate change and the risk to our water source um, as a result of, you know, fires and runoff, right? So I, I know you've looked at that and that's also a factoring and sobering um, component as well. I know that we've talked in the past about kind of thinking about an equity um, lens for water rates for folks who are already stressed and yeah. taxed, right? And so I just wonder what your thoughts are on kind of that population that could be really financially yeah. impacted as a result of this. That's a, that's a really important uh, question and a big question. And, and I will tell you that the good news on that topic is that there does seem to be, for the first time, both at the state level and at the federal level, a real recognition that, uh, you know, equitable access to high quality, reliable water service is really uh, like it's a human right and we should be figuring out how to support that. And, and I think in, um, in California with Prop 218, but in other states where they have similar kind of constitutional restraints, there are, there are many constraints to our ability to, um, you know, lay out a program of, um, of uh, assistance for those customers. But it may well be that at the state or the federal level, there are some uh, opportunities that are going to arise that could, you know, provide that safety net. And there is a there's a whole conversation going on right now at the at the state level and at the federal level about the 638 million dollars that was in the water rate assistance or the utility rate assistance segment of the um, COVID response bill that was passed at the end of December. Um, and I know that, that there's been a lot of conversation about the, the low-income energy assistance program, LIHEAP, I think it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, acronym is, and um, talking about how, you know, a strategy like that may need to be uh, put together for uh, water issues. And I think that while undoubtedly that's not something that's going to happen overnight, it, it could be an important element just in general for, especially as we're looking at the kind of capital improvements that the water department is working on, you know, and rates that are going to be coming forward to you guys for, you know, later on this year, uh, it's going to be important for us to keep that, you know, square in our, on our radar. And all, we might have few opportunities to do something with it, you know, with local resources, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't be advocating really loudly for uh, help from other places and we and I'm already doing that it's wonderful well thank you and that's um yeah that's heartening to hear that that could be potentially something we can access and if there's anything the council can do to support you and your advocacy um you know let us know please we'll do well thank you Rosemary um for the presentation I'm going to go ahead and no more um there are no more questions from council members um I'll go ahead and take it out to the public um, so this would be, if you're here to um, speak to item number 23 on the agenda today, which is the update of the, of the uh, Santa Cruz's water shortage contingency plan, if you could please raise your hand so we know that you'd like to speak. I'm not seeing any. 
So I will bring it back to the council and uh, council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, I just wanna again, thank the staff for all their work on this. And uh, I'm happy to move the staff recommendation to adopt the 2021 interim update of the Santa Cruz water shortage contingency plan. Council member Brown. I'll second that and also second and third and fourth <laughs> appreciation for all of the work that has gone into this and your ongoing <laughs> to uh, trying to navigate a very um, unclear uh, future and a very daunting potential set of scenarios. And um, just echo uh, Council Member Watkins' uh, point, if there's anything that uh, you know we can do, just call on us to try to help with that, you know, the outreach efforts or kind of, you know, whatever, whatever can, we can do at our end, uh, it's, a, it's a lot. So thank, thank you. you. Great, and uh, yeah, Rosemary, I'll, I'll echo just from mine, yeah, just the appreciation of your department. Um, many water departments throughout California do not have the, the mindset of really what, um, Rosemary and, and all of the water, all the water folks um, in our department that are really projecting and using the most current tools around climate change and drought forecasting. And, you know, we're lucky that we have such a sophisticated department based on um, amazing science. And at the same time, they're also trying to take care of our threatened and endangered species, aquatic species that live in the watersheds that we actually share our water supply with. So, um, the only um, thing that's missing from your charts, Rosemary, is the frogs and the fish there and figuring out how they're gonna make it through all of this as well. Yeah. Um, I think that um, we have an uh, outstanding water department and, and we're keeping the environment and uh, the safety of our residents and our businesses um, actually all on, a, on the same scale and in the same thought in terms of planning. So thank you for the work. Um, so I have a motion from council member Cummings and a second by council member Brown to adopt the 2021 interim update of the Santa Cruz water shortage contingency plan. And could I get a roll call vote please, Bonnie? Um, a hand did go up from a member oh. of the public. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Okay, uh, why don't we go back um, before we do the roll call, Mr. Tabas? There we go, can you hear me now? Yes, we can, welcome. Uh, thank you. My question for Rosemary is uh, in terms of capturing rainwater runoff for residential properties, is that a strategy that um, is valid? And every time I look at it, every time I try to evaluate it, it's uh, you know, creating the, uh, you know, the storage reservoir is more way more expensive than uh, it's worth to in terms of the cost offset of buying the water from the city. Um, so going forward, as water gets more expensive, is there any possibility, or is there is this something that's done in other places that have already faced this, where um, there's some incentive programs to install water tanks for just for like outdoor irrigation use type stuff. Is that a reasonable strategy and, and um, have we, is that, is that a uh, efficient enough use of uh, resources, of the financial resources? Um, Mayor Myers, do you want me to respond? Yeah, usually, um, Mr. Thomas, we usually don't, uh, public comment is usually a time to just, uh, it's, we usually don't have a back and forth, but yeah, I'd be happy to have the water director answer your question. Thanks, appreciate it. Um, well, thanks for that question. The, I think the issue for us here locally is that our rainfall pattern, our, our annualized precipitation pattern is really concentrated in the winter time. And, uh, so, and the need is really for irrigation water is really in the summertime. And I certainly don't wanna say there's, there's no potential value for sort of on-site uh, coll rainwater collection. But typically it's not going to be enough to get you across uh, through the whole sort of summer demand season. So there's a, there's a limited ability of that particular strategy to work well. Um, there, there I think was a, um, 
in other places, many other places, including the Midwest and, the, and to some degree in the East and certainly in places like Australia where the precipitation patterns are less seasonally concentrated, it's a better, more useful strategy. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Uh, yeah, I see. We'll take one more. One more. Uh, we have call in user one. You're you're un, You should be unmuted shortly here. Uh, there you go. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, sorry about that confusion. I haven't called in before. My name is Douglas Deach. I'm executive director, founder of the Monterey Bay Conservancy, which is a 501c325 year old water policy think tank. Uh, did I say California and Monterey Bay? Uh, I have. Uh, sending in for the last five years uh, my proposal, which I call the 21,000 acre Monterey Bay Estuary National Monument, uh, which uh, uh, leaves basically the Castro Oil Reclamation Plant, which produces 31,000 acre feet a year of recycled water, uh, looking for a user. If you wanted to see this all spelled out, spelled out, you can go to dougdeach.com, excuse me, dougdeach.info, D-O-U-G-D-E-I-T-C-H.info. I have a successful 25-year-old pilot project, which you can see at dougdeach.com, which is a 43-acre, uh, formerly Willoughby Ranch at Smudowski Beach, which uh, the concept is farmlands back to wetlands. Uh, I've offered to, to oh, the, uh, I spend most of my time here dealing with the State Water Resources Conservation uh, Board and uh, Coastal Commission recently uh, I start, uh, uh, to basically get them to uh, take over water management in the Tri-County, Monterey Bay, Monterey, Santa Cruz, San Benito area, because that's the only way we're going to have a sustainable water use and plan here. Uh, may I come and run down my plan for you? I've offered, oh, I've offered many times, uh, I don't get any response back. Uh, I know Donna Myers uh, for uh, your mayor, 25, you know, oh, uh, please go to lawandorderliberal.org from 25 years ago, and that kind of outlines my plan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bonnie, could we do the roll call vote, please? Yep. Councilmember Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cummings? Aye. Councilmember Golder is absent. Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. That item, that motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Rosemary and Ben. Okay. We will move on to item number 24, and that is Measure U Implementation Working Group Update to the City Council. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order of this item will be a presentation by staff, or excuse me, by the council members who brought the item forward, followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. Again, if you're interested in commenting on Measure U Implementation Working Group Update to City Council, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set for two minutes. We have a presenter, uh, Morgan Bostic is here today. She is the advocate for the City County Task Force to address UCSC growth, and she'll be providing the um, presentation today. So welcome, Morgan. Are you here? Let me look. Hi. You are, there you are. Hi, welcome. Hi, I'm gonna, thank you very much. Let me just share my screen really quickly. All right. Are we all looking at the same thing? We are. Great. Um, good afternoon.
afternoon. Thank you so much for having me and for providing this platform uh, for me to share how concerned community members can participate in the UC Santa Cruz Long Range Development Plan review process. Um, my name is Morgan Bostic. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I am a UC Santa Cruz graduate and an advocate for the Santa Cruz City County Task Force on UCSC Growth Plans, which is the designated Measure U Implementation Working Group by the City and County and is served by Mayor Myers, Council Members Brown and Cummings, as well as County Supervisor Ryan Coonerty and Lee Butler, who serves as an ex officio member. Morgan, the task force was. Morgan, I'm just going to stop you for one sec. You're, it looks like you're maybe not in full um, slide mode. I don't know if you want to switch to that. There you go. That's better. Yeah, just very hard to see. Perfect. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank you for catching that. I appreciate it. Um, okay. So the task force was formed in response to local ballot measure U, which was passed in 2018 by 77% of Santa Cruz City voters. The primary objectives of the task force as directed by measure U are to fully participate in the LRDP review process to take policy and legal actions to ensure responsible growth for UCSC and to eliminate or at a minimum reduce the adverse effects of additional UCSC growth on the Santa Cruz community and environment, particularly uh, in the areas of housing, traffic, quality of undergraduate education, and public services like water. Commenting on the EIR and participating in the LRDP review process is an opportunity for all of us to collaboratively craft the future of our community and campus, to recommend policies for responsible stewardship of our community's natural resources and environment, and to ensure that all future UCSC students have the necessary resources that they need to succeed. Um, Long-range development plans are legally binding documents that are produced by the University of California, and in this case, UC Santa Cruz, uh, and they identify what resources and infrastructure will be necessary to support the success of future students based on academic goals and projected enrollment levels. The current UC Santa Cruz LRDP limits enrollment to 19,500 students and was scheduled to expire in 2020. Early last month, UCSC released their draft long-range development plan for 2020 through 2040 and the Associated Draft Environmental Impact Report. Uh, this plan envisions up to 28,000 students on campus by 2040 and also includes suggested land use changes that have the potential to radically transform the landscape of UCSC and negatively impact UCSC students, the environment, and the community at large. Um, I am going to just share the very basics of the proposal, but um, for a fuller picture of the 2021 LRDP, I recommend that concerned community members visit UCSC's website, lrdp.ucsc.edu, so they can view the complete document. UCSC is planning a 44% increase in enrollment, a 56% total increase in on-campus populations by 2040. Um, while the plan includes the objective to house 100% of additional students and up to 25% of additional faculty and staff on campus, these are not included in a way that would make these goals legally enforceable. Additionally, the LRDP and associated documents do not tie enrollment growth to the provision of critical infrastructure like housing. And finally, UCSC is planning for significant development in North Campus, about 43% of the housing development and 8% of the academic and support space is planned outside of the city's municipal services boundaries and within a CAL FIRE designated high fire hazard severity zone. This will have an impact on the city of Santa Cruz's water supply and increase the fire risk in an already vulnerable area of our region. In response to uh, UC Santa Cruz's initial announcement of a nearly 50% increase in enrollment, Santa Cruz City voters overwhelmingly passed local ballot measure U, which among other imperatives directs the city's participation in the review of UCSC's proposed LRDP and guides how the task force communicates their response at the campus level to the UC system, the UC regents, and the California State Legislature. Our goal is to ensure full mitigation of all adverse impacts of any proposed UCSC growth on the Santa Cruz community, particularly, like I said before, in the areas of housing, traffic, public transportation, and public services, like water and public safety. 
In particular, the task force's primary objective is for UCSE to enter into a legally enforceable agreement that includes the following. That UCSE will house 100% of additional students, faculty, and staff on campus, and that UCSE will provide all of the critical resources and infrastructure, includes, including on-campus housing, prior to or concurrent with students' admission and faculty and staff hiring. Um, as it stands now, UCSC's plans will not meet the objectives that are outlined in Measure U. So, in the draft EIR, UC Santa Cruz outlines some of the anticipated impacts of their proposed growth. Again, to get a complete picture of the anticipated impacts of the 2021 LRDP, I recommend that members of the public view the documents on UCSC's website. Um, but just to cover some of the, the most egregious uh, uh, and outstanding ones, uh, UCSC is projecting a significant unavoidable negative impact on the availability and affordability of housing in the city and region as a result of their proposal. UCSC anticipates the removal of about 12 acres of protective habitat that's reserved for endangered species. Um, UCSC anticipates that the increased growth of campus will contribute to the city's need to identify alternative water sources. And finally, UCSC's draft FDIR discloses that in order to meet statewide emissions goals and the UC's own sustainability objectives, they will need to purchase thousands of metric tons of carbon offsets. Uh, their proposal, additionally, as it seems now, is not expected to meet regional air quality goals. The release of the draft uh, uh, long-range development plan and the draft DIR for 2021 through 2040 presents a critical opportunity to come together and envision what development and infrastructure will be necessary uh, and essential to the success of future UC UCSC students, faculty, and staff over the next 20 years. Uh, the task force is urging all concerned community members to review the documents and to share their concerns with the UC directly before the public comment period ends on March 8th. To actualize the task force's goals and advocate for the will of the broad majority of Santa Cruz voters, over the past year, the task force has initiated a public campaign informing the community about the details of the university's plans. We are actively participating and have been encouraging community members to actively participate in the LRDP review process. The task force has organized topic-specific working groups that are providing mutual support for those who are interested in commenting on the DEIR as they share their concerns with the university. Um, additionally, city and county staff are currently preparing detailed comments on the draft EIR as well. As COVID pushed most of our efforts online, we have created a robust social media presence. We have a regular newsletter. Uh, we attend numerous uh, uh, virtual student organization and off-campus community meetings uh, where we discuss this issue and share how, can we, how members of the public can have their voices heard by the university. Um, in addition, we've begun lobbying our state legislators for meaningful action on this issue should UC Santa Cruz not be persuaded by our local campaign efforts. Commenting on the EIR, like I said before, is a critical opportunity for those of us who are concerned about the future of our community and our campus to recommend policies for responsible growth and for responsible stewardship of our natural environment and uh, sacred natural resources. Um, the task force is urging those concerned about the future of our community and environment uh, to comment on the draft EIR, which will be accepting public comments until 5 p.m. on March 8th. You can email your comments to eircomment at ucsc.edu. Um, Members of the public should feel free to contact me directly. My email is listed on this slide. It's morgan.bostic at actonucsegrowth.org. They can also reach the task force directly by emailing info at actonucsegrowth.org. Thank you all so much for your time and support as we advocate for responsible UCSC growth plan. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that the task force may have, or the council may have, sorry. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, Morgan, we really appreciate your presentation. Um, really, really clear and well done um, laying out what's ahead. Um, I'll turn it over to Council Member um, Cummings or Council Member Brown. I don't know if you guys have comments as well. Uh, go ahead, Council Member Brown. I'll just make a few comments. Uh, first, I really wanna thank you, Morgan, for the presentation and for all of the work you've been doing. It's been wonderful to work with you and the task force. Uh, around a uh, really challenging issue or set of issues. I, um, you know, I've just been uh, just really grateful for your level of, of clarity and organization in kind of getting us 
to move forward. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity today for this information to be, uh, you know, provided to the public in a more public venue. So those who are out there listening uh, really know a little bit more of the basics and how to be more involved. Um, I would say that, you know, we are, uh, you know, we, we face a serious challenge here and, and the community has uh, pretty resoundingly with an advisory measure uh, <laughs> support for us negotiating with the university around these uh, these issues and you know in particular with respect to the binding commitment you know i think you know i just want to put it out there because you gave us a great presentation then you know so i'm going to editorialize just a little bit um and say you know that this is um this is a really challenging piece right because um you know for one it's, it would be precedent setting and i think that the you know the uc regents are probably not wanting to go there um and it's it's also um you know, it's also tenuous whether or not they could meet those commitments, even if they do make it binding, right? So there, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of unknowns. There's, there's a lot of challenge. But I think that um, that this work to try to really make clear how untenable it would be to just move ahead with a, you know, significant, significant increase in the student population would not serve the students or the community. And so again, I just wanted, you know, I, I just wanted to say thank you for all of your work, and I encourage folks out there to, uh, you know, get involved, to you know, voice those concerns. It, it really helps us um, as your city representatives tasked with trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, speak up on behalf of the voters uh, about this issue. It really helps us to have uh, more input and, and feedback, and. Um, and so I guess I'll leave it there. Um, I, um, Council Member Cummings, it looks like you have more to say. And um, so thanks again for everything. Go ahead, uh, Council Member Cummings, please. Thank you. Um, and I'd just like to, um, Morgan, thank you again for all the work that you've done on this over the past year and a half. It's been, um, a really um, positive and collaborative effort that we've been leading, pulling in the county, and then also um, all the members of the task, the, the community advisory group, that's really been putting in a substantial amount of their time volunteering to you know, help the city and the community address this issue of really trying to figure out that balance between university growth and community impacts. And I just want um, members of the community to understand too that, you know, as we're fa you know we're faced with many issues this being just one that um happens to our community but you know we're not alone in this effort um, we last year as a task force were able to meet with the city of berkeley and they have been experiencing similar um, impacts as it relates to the growth of uc berkeley and the impacts that, that has on the berkeley community so i just want members of the public to know that um you know we are one of uh, a number of cities throughout the state of california who are really trying to who are dealing with these issues and really trying to figure out a way for the regions to acknowledge um, our concerns and really trying to work together to find a way that we can move forward um, to make sure that um, the growth is compatible with cities and so i just want to thank morgan you and and all the folks over the years who've worked on this task force um, to really try to get us to this point where we are today and to continue working on this as we move forward. Any questions from other council members at this point? I guess I will, before we open it up to public comment, I, um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, Morgan's work is really helpful. Um, there is an excellent website, um, obviously those, um, uh, web addresses were uh, given out, um, and uh, Morgan, what is the what's the easiest way? What's what's some people search on if they're trying to find? Is it under Measure U Working Group, or what is what is our actual group name? Yeah, the Santa Cruz City County Task Force on UCSC Growth Plans. I've tested it. You can just Google Task Force on UCSC Growth, and it will direct you to our website. Um, that's, yeah, that's a, an easy way to get there. Um, Morgan's done a great job. And um, we, again, we've been working um, also with other, as Councilmember um, Cummings mentioned, other communities um, 
And uh, I just want also um, folks to know that our planning department, actually all city departments um, are reviewing the environmental impact report and certainly will be, the city will actually, um, from the sort of departmental internal perspective of um, what, what kinds of um, concerns the city may have, um, there will be a letter transmitted from our planning uh, director to the University of California on the, on the LRDP EIR. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. Um, and that will be the city's communication um, in terms of, of, of official comment or, or full comment. Um, Morgan, I didn't know if you wanted to clarify thing, anything more on that. Um, at this point, the city council itself is not making formal comment, but that comment will be coming through our departments and all departments have been asked to review the EIR and those comments are being consolidated into uh, a, a, an official submittal on the city's behalf. And Morgan, I don't know if you have any comments on that. Yes, I also will be submitting comments um, on the EIR. So great, on behalf that of will be an addition. Okay, on behalf of the task force. So we have two vehicles that we're trying to express our um, our comments through on the long range development plan, environmental impact report, and uh, certainly encourage the big, 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 huge thing for our fam for our um, for our community. So uh, please get involved. And Morgan, we really appreciate you being here today to update everybody. I'm gonna go ahead and take it out to public comment. And uh, I see Mr. Longinati is on. Go ahead, Rick. Uh, hi, city council members, uh, Rick Longinati. Um, I, um, you know, just being observing this process over the last couple of years, I realized that, uh, you know, this, the university's uh, failure to commit to legally binding uh, goals for housing new students. Um, that's not an accident, it's not an oversight. Um, the chancellor convened a community advisory group uh, a couple of years ago, and that was a, a goal of that community advisory group for the last couple of years. And, and the university decided it was not going to make a legally binding commitment. So that's what that says to me is that the university uh, expects they won't have to make a commitment to add even a single dorm room for a, a, an additional student unless they get sued. And so this time period now before the close of the comment period on March 8th is important because it lays the ground for a lawsuit. And uh, I'm a little concerned that the council has not given any direction to the city staff about uh, what to say in their comment letters uh, I think the comments need to be tailored to prepare for an eventual lawsuit. And I'm hoping that what you can do at this meeting to, today is certainly individually speak to staff and let them know uh, to, to, to make a unified strategy, not just you know one department here and one department there making comments, but a unified strategy that will lay the basis for a strong lawsuit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak to this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will go back to deliberation and uh, comments or further comments or questions or um, uh, comments or, or deliberation. Uh, Council Member Cumming. Thank you, Mayor. Again, thank you for uh, that presentation, Morgan, and for those members of the public or that member of the public who was able to chime in, thank you as well. Um, I had prepared um, a motion to make, um, and in part through this motion, just given that we're having this discussion today, to be able to um, provide some comments from this group on the LRDP. And so I sent the message, the, the motion over to Bonnie, if she can display it. So the motion would be to, um, one, accept the report, and then to direct the mayor to write a letter to UCSC Chancellor LaReeve expressing the council's concerns with proposed campus development under the draft 2021 Long Range Development Plan and to request the consideration of the following revisions to the plan. One, consistent with Measure U, include a legally defensible commitment to house all additional students beyond 19,500 on campus. 
two, to tie the increase of campus population to new campus housing. Three, designate the creation of housing and childcare at 2800 Delaware to support off main campus housing as a high priority. Four, legally designate the UCSC Campus Natural Reserve as a permanent reserve ineligible for development in perpetuity for the purposes of environmental conservation, scientific education, research, and recreation. Five, prioritize areas with low endemic biodiversity for development to protect the most biodiverse habitats on the campus and areas that have undergone substantial regeneration. Six, adhere to or exceed the strictest statewide, regional, and UC-specific greenhouse gas emission targets and air quality standards. And then seven, given the increasing severity of wildfires due to climate change and the urban wildland interface, it's imperative that the university adequately analyze and mitigate the increase in wildfire risk that the 2021 LRDP will impose on the campus and by extension the community. And you know, a lot of this too is addressing some comments that we've received from members of the public who are wondering what stance we're going to take. And I think largely, um, you know, really trying to um, express on behalf of the community the concerns around growth, the concerns around environmental impact uh, in the upper campus, and really trying to you know, encourage the university to develop in areas where they're going to have um, the least amount of impacts on the environment is really the intention behind the motion and the comments that um, I'm hoping we might be able to um, express on behalf of the council today. And so with that, I'll um, close my comments out and turn it back over to the mayor. Uh, council Member Brown? Yeah, I, I will second that motion and uh, you know appreciate your uh council member Cummings you're putting this together I think this reflects a lot of the kind of ongoing conversation that we've had at the task force also with members of the community the input that we receive and you know I think that um that framing it in this way you know I mean we are uh, recognizing that uh, you know this is that we're requesting consideration of these things right so um, you know it really lays out some of the key concerns I think in a in a clear way and um, it doesn't um, you know it, it doesn't get into uh, any you know challenging areas around you know the you know, commitments that um, well, anyway, just it does it, it makes it clear that we are asking them, we are kind of really imploring them to think about these things and uh, work with the community in a, in a formal way. And I think that uh, that it would be it would really benefit us to get that in uh, through this process, get those comments in. Yeah, I'll just um, maybe make a quick comment, and then I've got Councilmember Watkins. Um, yeah, I, I'm on the committee, so I'm I'm a little bit confused as to why we didn't bring this through the committee, I guess, is one of my questions. So um, that's the only procedural thing is that um, I think we, so I, I'm not sure why we didn't have a committee or try to figure out how to, to maybe do this with the three committee members, but um, I pre definitely appreciate the intent behind it. Um, I'm just trying to figure out um, whether this should come, be coming out of the committee and we not quite sure how we do this right now. So um, I will go ahead and turn it back to, so we have a motion um, by Council Member Cummings, the second by Council Member Brown. Uh, and I see Council Member Watkins, um, you have your hand up and then Council Member Cummings, come back to you. I am. Um... I had a similar question, but I think you just answered it as to whether this went through the committee and or if there is potential benefit to having it go through the committee um, to affirm and or add any additional language before sending these um, kind of priorities. I don't know if there's a, if there's a timeline, um, if maybe I can understand the timeline or the urgency or if there's a willingness to kind of have this be just um, Given uh, another set of, of eyes and a vetting for um, affirmation and or addition. And I also want to thank Morgan for her presentation. She was a great job. <laughs> Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Brown. Great, thank you, Mayor. And 
just to answer some of the questions, um, I know that the committee met or the task force met earlier this month. I will, or earlier this month or late last month, and I will say that I wasn't able to attend that meeting. Um, one of the concerns that came up was that uh, all the comments have to be received uh, on the LRDP by March 8th, which meant that the only time that the city council would be able to meet before um, the deadline was today. And so um, Morgan was able to pull together and uh, we were able to bring forward this item that's on our agenda today. Uh, but unfortunately, given the uh, timeline for being able to get this on the agenda, we weren't able to meet to um, discuss any recommendations prior to this meeting. Um, maybe once, and so I think that what we were hoping to do is have an opportunity to get the council to weigh in in case we were able to put something forward on behalf of the council. I do think that something that, you know, if there's a concern around this needing to go back to the task force and the task force moving something forward, you know, one thing I think we could see happening is if, if council members want to weigh in, the direction could be that these recommendations go back to the task force and that the task force craft a letter and authorize the mayor to send that letter out on behalf of the city council after it's gone back to the task force uh, for further input and bringing in input from the, the council today. Um, or the, the, you know, the, the task force can um, write a letter on behalf of the council as well. Um, I think that the intention today was to get some kind of feedback from uh, other council members so that we could provide a comment uh, that's based on the um, sentiments of the city council. And we were just really hoping to get that in before the deadline. So, um, you know, I'll leave my comments there. Um, if we were to meet again, I would just ask that if the task force members, if we could try to find a date early next week so that we would have enough time to be able to craft a letter you know, get the appropriate signatures and then get it to the chancellor uh, by March 8th. I think that that's something we can we can do together. So um, I'll end my comments there. And um, it looks like Council Member Brown, well, I'll turn it back to the mayor to call in whoever's on stack. Uh, Council Member Brown and then Council Member Watkins. And then I have uh, Lee Butler, planning director. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so I uh, just uh, echoing uh, and kind of building on uh, Council Member Cummings' comments about this. Yeah, I mean, the, so the urgency really was related to the the deadline for for comments, and um, and I, I guess I would say that you know two things about uh, you know the procedurally it coming to the council in this way at this time. You know, one I think uh, all of these. Uh, perhaps not with the, the level of detail uh, in some of the items have been discussed um, at the task force and in other venues. Um, you know, we did not deliberate on them uh, as a you know potential set of comments that uh, the task force would recommend that the city uh, uh, submit or the city council submit, but they have been talked about as you know important components uh, over over time. And the other being that uh, we have not really had a venue at the city council, a space to, in order to be able to have this conversation or put this kind of recommendation forward. And so this is really the, the space that has, was created. Uh, and so it, it, part of that is just about the necessity of, uh, you know, being able to, you know, conform to city council protocols and, and do this in public. Um, you know, with an, uh, with an agendized item. So um, that's, I think, kind of where, where I, you know, it made sense to me to go this route. Member Watkins and then Director Butler, and we'll try to wrap up. Sure. No, I appreciate um, what Council Member Cummings brought up in terms of having this sort of just another set of eyes and revisiting prior to sitting. I think these are really um, important asks and big asks, and I think we want And so since this group has been working really diligently on this and unfortunately wasn't able to have it be part of the conversation due to um, uh, the meeting schedule, that um, if they could have uh, the time to revisit and really kind of affirm that this strategy um, embraces all of our concerns and alliance additional um, input the staff may be bringing 
Um, and then on behalf of the council, there's no real harm in having that process ensue. So I don't know if we want to make that some sort of friendly amendment or um, uh, sort of adjust the motion to um, have the committee read prior to sending it on behalf of the council. Um, I'll see if Lee, uh, yeah, I, I think I'll just make a comment. I, I do, re, I, I did attend the last meeting, uh, uh, council member Brown and I were there and in, in, in my understanding, we had made a, we had decided on a process, um, that was gonna, so, uh, that, again, I'm just, I'm trying to understand exactly how we're working. I would prefer, and I think it's important to use the task force, the full membership of the task force to try to, try to craft i'm not i'm not disagreeing with the intent of what's here on the list but um uh you know it, we i worked we worked hard to get this on the agenda and you know a lot of this is kind of been kind of coming a little bit disjointed so just trying to understand and make sure that the task force has the ability to um look through this and and move forward with it first time i've seen any of this and again as a member of the task force it's sort of a little bit broadside. <laughs> so, uh, Director Butler. Thank you, Mayor Myers. I just wanted to um, share one uh, perspective on item number three. Um, Council Member Brown mentioned earlier the um, vote that recently happened at the Regional Transportation Commission about um, the rail transportation. And, um, one of the things that drives rail transit is employment, um, more so than um, residential uses. And with the 2800 Delaware being in close proximity to potential future rail transit locations, um, we may just wanna consider that uh, an employment center there would have a higher um, likelihood of driving um, uh, transit use than residential would. Um, and so this was a, a comment that I shared when we talked about this at the community advisory group. And um, so there are uh, certainly um, other options to consider with this, you know, if um, there is employment and then the housing that's associated there um, is um, uh, prioritized for um, people that are employed on site, for example. Um, and so, you know, I just wanted to share that perspective and, and consideration as part of this. Um, and I will also tell you one thing that the um, uh, university uh, group um, uh, commented on. They, uh, at the time, mentioned that um, their preference was to have people on campus um, for um, their residences so as to encourage them to participate in um, after uh, hours lectures and programs and so forth. So um, I just wanted to share that perspective with the council as they're uh, considering uh, these particular items. Thank you, Lee. Uh, council Member Brown. Um, I, so I, just one quick comment. I understand the um, the interest in moving through the task force more officially for this but i think the other thing that uh the other point here is that we are um re the recommendation is to to get to ask the the city council to make these uh recommendations and so um you know to have the task force which is not entirely city centric um kind of create that uh that framework and then deliver it to the council um you know it i mean i suppose I, I could support um doing it in that way if we can get to the you know the the goal of getting some comments in on time but i also just want to remind us that um this is about the the council as a body weighing in um, and the task force is do also doing quite a bit of work uh, and then, um, because, Lee, because you brought this up, I um, I hear you about the um, the issues around uh, industrial or business uses uh, being more likely to uh, generate, uh, you know, passenger uh, passenger demand uh, with a potential rail service. And I'm just I'm just wondering. Um, I think part of the conversation that we've had around 
this site as a potential site for housing is um, it's not entirely clear what the university's intentions are with that site. Um, you know, I hear kind of different things um, at different moments. And so I think, you know, I don't think that the goal was to um, suggest that make this kind of recommendation to preempt other use, business uses, right, that generate employment. Uh, it was more to, uh, you know, think about how that site can, you know, potentially provide, uh, you know, both. Or you know, or or other other uh, uh, functions as well. So um, anyway, just wanted to to get that to you know, because I, I totally I hear you. I think that that's a, that's a concern, and we we don't want to overstep um, on something that we may not even want to see happen entirely. You're muted, Mayor Myers. Councilmember Cummings and then uh, Lee, and then I'll put myself back in the queue. Thanks, Mayor Myers. Yeah, I, I was just, um, I, w I wasn't trying to, you know, suggest that um, we completely remove um, industrial, well, I wouldn't say industrial use, but uh, commercial slash office space use at the site. I think that having it as mixed use would probably be obviously the most beneficial for the community. Um, but wanted to express that I mean, even hearing in the community that people have expressed you know the the desire to see housing go in there because of the fact that we have so many students postdocs faculty staff that are working at the coastal campus additionally that are working at 2800 delaware and um you know this notion that you know providing more housing can also can one activate that area because we do know that um at nighttime there's obviously a lot of use of RVs in that area. And so, you know, what can we do to activate that space? And in addition to that, provide, um, you know, additional housing off campus on the west side that could help support the functions of the coastal campus and um, the operations at 2800 Delaware. So um, just wanted to clarify that, that number three was not to um, completely remove any kind of commercial use from that space, but to consider the incorporation of housing within that space as well. Director Butler. Thanks, um, and I appreciate those clarifications as well. I just wanted to add um, one additional point for consideration. Um, a number of these are directly related to the EIR and should um, adhere to that deadline um, of March 8th, I think it is. Um, uh, whereas others are um, more broadly related to the LRDP itself, and um, wouldn't necessarily have that same uh, strict deadline. And so, you know, there could be opportunities for um, further discussion of some of those policy items, um, and there, there could be some additional time for that, whereas we do want to get the um, EIR comments um, in um, fairly quickly. So I just want to make that clarification. Thank you, Lee. Um, so I have a question for the maker of the motion. Um, if the committee, if the task force can be convened um, and a letter communicated regarding this, uh, it, this is, um, are you amenable to convening the committee next week to try to actually run this through the task force? I understand that the intent is to somehow have the city council weigh in, but the task force is a city count, county task force. We actually are supposed to be working as a city county uh, response space. So I don't, my understanding is that the, uh, the, the LRDP comments would be coming from as a representative in the city county task force. So I'm confused as to why the council would be taking action. If I'm just confused. So is there a friendly amendment or would, would the maker of the motion um, consider maybe convening the committee early next week? I'll make myself available. Um, otherwise, I'm not gonna, I can't support the motion, which is puts me in a very awkward position because as a member of the committee, um, I would like to discuss this, but um, I, a motion has been put on the floor that I actually had no idea that was gonna happen. And as a member, 
a three person member of a committee that's typically that it's just surprising to me that to have this be put on the floor right now. So if there's a way that we can convene the committee and potentially work through um, the strategy, I would appreciate that as a member of the committee. I don't have a problem with, um, you know, having the committee weigh in on this and taking into account you know, the fact that we do have a supervisor that's on the task force. Um, I would like to maybe hear from other council members their thoughts on, um, you know, if they have any comments or if they would be willing to um, provide the task force or the city members of the task force to um, express um, their concerns or their comments on behalf of the city council and that the letter that would be coming from the task force would also include the sentiments expressed by the city council of Santa Cruz. And because I think that the, the point was to try to give the city council an opportunity to weigh in. Um, and then, you know, cause I think that the task force obviously is the community advisory group along with the county supervisor, the three city members. Um, but as council member Brown pointed out, you know, aside from that task force kind of working with our uh, county supervisor and the other representatives, we haven't had a chance to allow for the city council members to weigh in on this. And so I'm, I'm totally open to, um, you know, if, the, if we can get direction from council to take this back to the task force and to draft the letter, um, I'm happy to, to make that as a friendly amendment, um, but I think it'd be good to hear what other council members have to say and figure out what the appropriate direction would be from this body. Okay. Council member, uh, excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner, and then Council member Watkins, and then Council member Kalantari Johnson. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, so, you know, I wasn't aware that this would be an action item. I, I, I was prepared for an update on uh, the Measure U implementation and the update on the concerns with the proposed development. Um, so with that, uh, these seven items, I have no, um, I'm not, I wouldn't be prepared to, uh, uh, without, I'm just seeing this now. And so, you know, we've had our packet since Thursday and there was a lot of information to go through already. And so, to comment or or vote on these specific points, um, I, I don't know. I have sufficient information or understanding to do that. Um, the the motion to direct the mayor to write a letter um, sounds straightforward, but I also feel there is there there would be weight um, to have. Uh, this task force uh, voice the, the concerns coming from the working group that's been working on these issues um, and concerns. Um, so I think there is value to um, uh, direct this back to the task force. Um, and, uh, you know, Lee Butler did bring up that I don't know which items would be the March 8th deadline and which ones aren't. Can, can anyone speak to the specifics on that? I, I can speak to, the, to that um, generally. Um, so, uh, and just taking a quick look at this, um, one, two, and three, I think are more policy statements. Um, Certainly there could be an argument that two of tying the new campus housing to uh, the campus population. Um, but you know, really the EIR is evaluating the, the total build out. Um, and so I think really four, five, six, and seven are more tied to the EIR. Um, and um, understanding the concerns that you have, Vice Mayor Bruner, um, you know, the, the council could, if, if the council chose to weigh in on a, uh, a, mo 
motion collectively. They could, uh, four and five are really speaking to um, protection of biological resources and habitat and so forth. And so the council could weigh in and say that, uh, make a statement about, you know, including comments on the EIR that um, uh, seek to uh, strengthen the mitigation and ensure that uh, biological resources are protected. Something general like that, and then that can go back to Morgan and the crews working on those comments. And then uh, similarly, I think six is um, a uh, something that could just say yes, thumbs up, um, and um, that can go in as a comment. Um, it's pretty broad um, and something that I think um, you know, the council may not need additional information on. And then seven, of course, the risks for wildfire. Um, those are, are pretty straightforward as well, and also something that we would want to comment on on the EIR. So if, uh, and so just my own perspective and something that you may want to consider is, you know, a general statement covering four and five, um, pri providing uh, direction to Morgan, and then uh, six and seven you could adopt, and then the policy statements in one, two, and three could have uh, additional um, options for consideration. Just an idea to throw it out there to, as I'm trying to, as I'm hearing the council debate these issues. Okay, I have council member Kantari Johnson, council member Watkins, and council member Cummings. Um, excuse me, excuse me. Yeah, Councilmember. Thank you. Um, yeah, I share some of uh, Vice Mayor Brenner's um, sentiments and concerns that I wasn't prepared to um, to see this motion or, or, or um, take a vote on a detailed motion like this. Um, I don't have very expansive knowledge in these areas. They, they, on the surface, they seem very much aligned with what we just saw in our presentation. Um, I think if we have an opportunity to, to provide feedback, um, we wanna make sure that we're thorough and we're not missing any pieces and there aren't any gaps. So I think um, having this go back to the committee and doing it in an efficient way so that we are able to not miss the March 8th deadline would be my preference. Um, and then in terms of um, items one, two, and three, I guess in particular three, um, if we were to, to move forward with this language, I think some um, further language and clarification that we're speaking to this as a mixed, potential mixed use um, type of a project. Thank you, council member. Uh, council member Watkins. I wonder for the purposes of trying to move this forward, given um, I think where I'm sensing the council is with this and just um, sort of echoing what my colleagues uh, have uh, stated um, in particular to not sort of anticipating making a decision specifically on that, that we move forward with having this committee um, review this and, um, and, and how additional council members could potentially weigh in is by emailing the mayor who sits on this committee our input um, after we have a chance to digest sort of the information um, and we could get it to you uh, ASAP for your deliberations as a committee uh, given the short timeline if that's appropriate. Council member coming? Yeah, I'm just, if we can just get the language on the screen then so I can see what the friendly amendment is. Sure, I'll just, I'll just say, I don't know, Tony, I saw that you popped on here, I don't know. Um, if the concern I have is that that would entail a quorum of council members working on a uh, item of city business outside of a notice meeting. So there's a Brown Act issue with regard to weighing in on uh, some letter that the committee might be uh, drafting because of the Brown Act issue. Right. So so just to have a clear, because I know that we had an opportunity to weigh in um, with the mayor on the letter to the governor as a, as a council, how is that different than this, potentially? Okay. Here eventually we'll send the letter, correct? Um, I'm not I'm not quite familiar with the process that was uh, that was followed in drafting a letter to the governor, so I'm not really prepared to comment on that. 
Um, okay. Sorry, I'm just confused because I thought that was something that we could explore. But given the input or confusion of our city attorney, I, I, it appears that that maybe isn't the appropriate route. So that said, I think uh, maybe just consensus on that these are areas that we are, as a council, supportive of the task force exploring in the letter to the chancellor, including what was discussed in item number three, which is essentially factoring in transportation, but also prioritizing housing and childcare. Um, and leave, and we can leave it at that, if, uh, unless others have additional comments. Is this a friendly amendment or? Um, no, I think what, the, I mean, the amendment would be to have this go to the back to the task force for review prior to submission at this point, I think. And leave Sorry, it at that. Can you say that? Have the task force. Can you restate that? Sure. Have the task force review the motion before us prior to any kind of letter being sent to the chancellor. Can I ask for clarification on that? Does that contemplate a letter from the mayor or a letter from the task force? Uh, can I see the uh, can I see the um, the first paragraph? Well, so I guess this is where the confusion lies because essentially the task force is a agreement of process between the city and the council as a result of Measure U for how to implement our advocacy efforts on behalf of Measure U. So I think when you have it from the task force, it includes the council's concerns because the task force is representative of the council, but almost could potentially have more strength because the task force is beyond just the council, right? So um, so I guess it would be on, on behalf of the task force essentially because, but I, I, you know, I defer to my colleagues who sit on this task force for clarification. Um, if I, if I may speak to this, yep. um, so maybe what I could see happening is that, um, you know, as the, the amendment would be to have the task force review the comments proposed above with the other members of the task force and then submit a letter on behalf of the task force and the city council to the chancellor, including comments that have been approved by the task force. Does that sound like it's a, and I guess what I'm trying to get at is that we've had this opportunity to discuss this. And I will say there was a, um, you know, recommendation that maybe we include the EIR LRDP, but those documents are so big that there was no reason why, you know, it was, discouraged to include that in the report. But, um, you know, part of what the recommendation was was for us to provide input as appropriate, which is why these um, suggestions have been made today. But, you know, again, I I don't have anything wrong with, with us taking this back to the task force and, um, you know, having the task force be the body that sends the letter. Um, I, I think that it would be good, though, to understand if that when sending this letter out on behalf of the task force, if that also includes positions shared by the city council. And the reason why was because we, prior to putting this on the agenda, we were receiving emails from people who were asking whether the city would be willing to sign on, for example, to, um, you know, whether it's a petition or if they would be willing to take a position on, you know, upper campus development, what have you. And so that's, you know, part of what motivated bringing this to council and really wanting the entire council to weigh in, uh, because while our individual opinions matter in these in these um, types of comments on the, on the LRDP, that having a position that the city is going to take also carries some weight to it. Um, and you know, if it's if it's most appropriate that 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 those comments come from the task force, I think it would just be good to know whether or not that will reflect the position of the city as well. So we're able to act on behalf of the city council as a whole. Maybe that's a question for Tony, but my understanding is that the task 
force is convened as and members of the city council sit on the on the task force as does members of the county mm -hmm. and so i would assume that since there's members of the city council on the task force as is supervisor coonerty's office that the task force would represent those two entities moving into any kind of communication from the task force but tony please please clarify yeah, i think that's i think that's right the, the task force would be corresponding on behalf of the city and county and the council could give the task force that authorization okay so do we have um so bonnie i think the letter the it just uh, so it's it could be a, there a lot of discussion so i just need somebody to state it <laughs> I'll take a run at it. I, I, and so is this a friendly amendment from Councilmember Watkins or an amendment from someone? Yeah, um, I think it would be from Councilmember Watkins' amendment um, to direct the the following or to direct the seven items brought forward back to the task force for completion uh, in a letter from the task force. Regarding the, it says up above Justin, the draft long range development plan, but I'm thinking you're also wanting this to also be part of the EIR comments. Is that, okay, so it should say to complete a letter from the task force regarding the draft EIR and draft 2021 long range development plan to be completed before March 8th. Does that work? Yeah, let's um, direct the seven items brought forward. Back to the task force to complete a letter from the task force regarding the draft EIR and draft 2021 LRDP. And then I guess, and then to be completed and submitted before March 8th. Yeah, that's okay. And Bonnie, you might want to put in the measure you task force, just so it's clear what task force, because that's the task force we're assigned to. Yeah, I was trying Thank to you. type that back. Do we have a workable? And then this is accepted by both council member Cummings and Brown. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the conversation. Uh, Bonnie, can we do a roll call vote? Do you want me to, you've got the motion, right? I do. Mm -hmm. uh, Council members Watkins? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Brown? Aye. Cumming? Aye. Councilmember Golder is still absent. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner? Aye. And Mayor Myers? Aye. And that motion passes unanimously. Okay, we will adjourn until our 5.30 session. Um, so we will be back in about 40 minutes. Thank you, everyone.
Hey, Donna or Renee, can you guys hear me? Yes. Does it sound robotic or weird? Justin and Martine, if you guys are back, if you could turn on your cameras, it'd be great. Hey, Donna, I need permission to turn my video back on. Okay. Bonnie, can you help with that? Yeah, I got it. Thank you. <laughs> We will go ahead and get started. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to our 5.30 session of the February 23rd, 2021 meeting of the City Council. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website at cityofsantacruz.com. All council members are participating in this meeting remotely, and I want to thank the public for staying home to view tonight today's city council meeting. And I would like to ask the clerk to please call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council members Watkins? Here. Kellen Harry Johnson? Here. Brown? Here. Cumming? Here. Boulder? Here. Vice Mayor Bruner? Present. And Mayor Myers. I'm here. Thank you. We'll open the oral communications item now. Uh, this is for members of the public who are streaming this meeting. If you want to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not listed on today's agenda. If you're interested in addressing the council, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comments so that we can accurately capture it in the meeting minutes. However, it is not required that you state your name. Please remember that this is a time for council to hear from the public. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been completed. And again, I just wanna make sure everyone's clear because I know we have a lot of, um, a lot of interest in, in our next uh, agenda item number 25, um, but this is oral communication. So this is for items not on the agenda uh, for this evening. And I will open it up. I see I've got um, a number of hands raised. If you've raised your hand and you intend to speak for item number um, 25, please wait until we finish with oral communi communications and then you can get queued back up. Okay, the first caller I have um, for oral communications, I believe, is ending in 4844. Is it your intention to speak to, on oral communications tonight? Or are you here for item 25? Thank you, Mayor. This is uh, Robert Norris of Huff Homeless United for Friendship and Freedom. 
Uh, the broader context of the situation is an unprecedented pandemic with mutating viruses still spreading, a federal court decision criminalizing the city council's sleeping ban, a local court decision slapping down city manager Bernal's assault on the vulnerable homeless in San Lorenzo, and then recently at the Huff meeting we received a report that the uh, city if it's not colluding with, it's not doing anything about the presence of what's called a noise-disrupting device placed at Wells Fargo Bank and directed across the river at the San Lorenzo Camper Sleeper residence there. It's called a mosquito device. They were originally put in by Scott Collins, assistant city manager, about uh, half a decade ago. Yesterday, Food Not Bombs was directed to relocate its storage locker from lot 22 to lot 27 you know, to make way for the council's luxury downtown development. Today, the group was threatened again by the city to remove that same locker again from its new location in Lot 27 somewhere else by Friday. Reports of regular harassment by Chief Mills Rouse the RVs unit continue to reach us at Huff at a time when those in vehicles need help registering and repairing what are not just vehicles, but if they're housing, they're, they're vehicular homes. Since City Council has shown itself hostile to this vehicular community, overturning your own Public Works Commission's support of uh, homeless vehicle dweller Alicia Cool, president of the Santa Cruz Homeless Union, it is up to the community, you and I, those of us listening, who must do what housed neighbors did on Riverside Street about a month and a half ago, show up physically in numbers to challenge police bullying, illegitimate harassment. It takes a village to restore justice when city council allows the city manager and his staff to run wild. Thanks, community, for listening. Thank you, Mr. North. Next item up, uh, excuse me, next person up is with the telephone number 1810. And again, this is for items not on tonight's agenda. Go ahead, please. Yeah, this is Garrett Phillip. In America, people succeed by providing what other people need, want, and are willing to pay for. I suspect our people who either don't agree with that or don't understand that or are unable to do that, especially I've noticed in Santa Cruz, but it is the engine that provides economic wealth creation like no other system, and not to be part of that will involve poverty and greater suffering. There are things not many people could ever afford themselves, such as libraries, roads, utilities, police, and fire, so the people support a government to provide. The land use authority of public property by government assures these public assets are available without discrimination and for the purposes as intended by the people for all the people. Some public assets aren't always free, but if so, cost the same without discrimination available for all to use. A public golf course is a golf course, a parking space is a parking space, a road is a road, a sidewalk is a sidewalk, a park is a park, and a beach is a beach. In America, most of us believe in God-given rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, but those rights must come with equal respect for those rights and others. Again, the government attempts to preserve those individual rights and prevent others from interfering with others' rights, and public land use authority is part of that enforced by policing compliance with land use purpose. The, the woke generations... Whoops, excuse me. Uh, the woke generation's obsession with victimology, the assignment of blame for all suffering, has some people continuously believing they are victims which does not lead to prosperity, but dependence, resentment, a false sense of entitlement, and a willingness to try violence, defy law, or embrace defective authoritarian political systems, and can sacrifice everyone's rights, freedom, and prosperity. Uh, we all suffer. It's a human condition. I'm having audio trouble here. Oh, man. Maybe. Oh, okay. The, pr the pursuit of net less suffering is one of life's more meaningful activities, and that starts with oneself, then others around you, and finally the greater community, but in the context of capitalism, and respect for individual liberty and the rights of all. Welfare is the responsibility of the federal government by Constitutional Section 8 Declaration. The purpose and authority of cities is limited more to providing the public services all the people need, want, and are willing to pay for, similarly to what individuals do, as well as enforcing that mutual respect of individual rights between people. Thanks. Next, we have Tiffany Worthington. This is, again, just for oral communications, not on item number 25. 
Go ahead, please. Can I just ask, is item, item 25 has to do with the overnight um, sleeping uh, thing. I, I don't want to speak out of turn. I just want to make sure that I'm not. Okay, so I'm, I want to speak on that, so I'll, I'll uh, wait till it's appropriate. Yeah, just stay on the line, but you can raise your hand when that item comes up, and, and I'll, I'll be taking public comment during that time. Thank you. Thanks so much. And KB Foster is next. Again, this is just for item number 20, uh, oral communication. Thank you, Council. My name is Bryce Foster. I'm an advocate for anyone who wants one, and I see an unusual opportunity here for people to take a walk in someone else's shoes, to see eye to eye with someone you never thought you could, I'm talking about my body, my choice, your body, your choice. Yes, this is about masks. And yes, let's protect our at-risk loved ones, but not at the expense of our frontline workers as seen in the video of what happened at Trader Joe's Santa Cruz on YouTube. It's not right to leave them out there as pawns in a battle that's between citizens and the city and state officials. These Trader Joe's workers and others, I'm sure, are being abused and emotionally slaughtered by frustrated people I won't stand for it, and you shouldn't either, regardless of what side you're on. It's time for a middle path because it takes all kinds for this world to go around. Let's move on from our linear thinking that favors one extreme versus the next. Let's grow up like a tree with branches that come together in the middle to support the whole. We know prohibition didn't work with alcohol, leading me to think the next thing could be breathe easy making more criminals, overcrowding more jails, as well as taking money from our city via tax evasion. That means less job safety, more forbearance, more pain slips, and so on. So that leads to the question, what is the middle path? I propose we survey the community with one simple question, to wear a mask or not to wear a mask, yes or no. Take the percentages and based on those, allocate a safe or masked happy hour and vice versa, a face or smile happy hour system for all public commerce and consumerism in relation to public demand based off percentages. If somebody wants to shop without a mask, it leads me to believe there are those who are ready to work without a mask and so on. I'm asking that we give the options and choices back to the people to keep the peace in our community. Again, my name is Bryce Foster. My phone number is 831-331-7016. If you want to work with me, text or call me. Thank you very much. Next up for oral communications. Um, this is not for item number 25, but uh, items not on tonight's agenda. And I just see a Galaxy A11 phone. Go ahead, please. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Hi, I'm Miss L.A. That's my, my real name, and that's what everybody knows me by. I've been homeless for 14 years here in Santa Cruz. I've got the perfect minute solution for the homeless issue. We have our own spot, which is the meadow. Put it all up there and let us become our own community and let us work together. I know I have hundreds, thousands of friends here. I've lost my voice because I've been advocating it. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. But I, I, it's going to be the Dana Spruce Foundation. It's going to be a homeless garden project, Cannery Art Center, Goodwill, and Shelter all in one. We're going to train them and give them something positive to look forward to. We're going to put them back in the workforce and let them be positive for, the society, for society and our community. I've got everyone to sign a petition that they want to do this. We can take them out of San Luis Park, put them up here in the meadow, but it's all together up here, even the vehicles, and let us go. Let us show you what we can do. We can do this. We can make a big difference. If Santa Cruz can make a big difference. Instead of being the bad guys, you can be put on the map for being the best guys and make this happen because we are good people and we deserve a chance. No matter what the reason is that we're homeless, maybe traumas or setbacks or someone else's fault, doesn't matter. 
We deserve the right to have a home, a stable, warm place where we can rest and heal and get our minds straight so we can go and be productive in society. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is uh, phone number 2412. And again, this is not on item number 25 regarding the ordinance. Go ahead, please. Go ahead, please, if you are number 2412, if you're here to speak on oral communications. If you're not, I'll move on to um, phone number ending in 2279, if you are here to speak on oral communications. Not on item number 25. I think we may have reached the end of. Yeah, uh, I'd like to speak for item uh, 25. Okay, well, we're going to be get, getting to that next. Um, yep, yep, I'll wait. Hang on, great, thank you. Okay, uh, okay. I think we have reached the end of oral communication. Am, am I unmuted? You are unmuted, yeah. Are you Thank you. I I, I am not, it, this is not about item 25. I, I live in Harvey West and I'm hoping there's some way that we can just slow down the traffic in here. That's all I'd like to offer and, and I'll end it there. Okay, thanks so much. Thank you. Let's see. I have uh, someone with the name of Mars. Um, if you're here to just do oral communications but not uh, item 25, you're welcome to speak. Oh, I'm, I'm going to wait for item number 25. Great. And Mr. Mick, if, are you here for oral communications or item 25? Oral communications, excuse me. Okay, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, I want to talk about the uh, action that took place at uh, Trader Joe's. And I think it should be considered a terrorist act. That is, a dozen people or so uh, went into the store and infected, knowingly infected, uh, all of the patrons and the workers there. I'm a shopper there, and I now do not feel safe in my own grocery store. Now I'm told that there is some action going on on the 28th that's uh, invade everywhere. This is what happens when you allow terrorists unfettered access when they're not punished. And I'm asking the city council to consider some sort of ordinance, maybe call Santa Cruz a plague-free zone. Now, it can be done in a lighthearted manner. It doesn't have to be done seriously, but there definitely needs to be some action. And Trader Joe's workers are also suffering. They're getting calls of harassment, of people threatening them. They've had to unplug the phones from that particular store. So please, you know, do we all have to stay inside on the 28th because a dozen people in Santa Cruz, and they're all known. They're not unknown. They all make themselves fully known. So I'm urging the city council to take action on this. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mick. And one more um, on the list. Uh, it's your known as call-in user two. Uh, please go ahead and unmute yourself. And again, this is oral communications, not item 25. Am I on? We're on, yes. Yep. Uh, Douglas Deach, uh, we spoke with you earlier. Uh, I just wanted to fill in. I know I came on kind of strong. Uh, two minutes isn't much time, but. Uh, uh, First, I wanted to make sure you're aware of the, the fact that the Coastal Commission has recently uh, indicated a 3.5 SLR rise by the year 2050 in the next 30 years for their planning purposes. This is a, I don't know if you have been reported to that by your different water agencies. That's an astounding amount. What I'd like you also to do, uh, please, uh, I left some websites. I'd also please like you to review uh, the 12 minute advice video from 2015 that Francisco Real Estate. 
Conservancy, I'm a water policy think tank for California and the Monterey Bay. Uh, a little background, in 1995, I incorporated as a... Mr. Deach, we're, we're losing you. Okay, uh, please, please review, please, San Francisco Real Estate.com, the 12 minute video on that, particularly the uh, 3.5 uh, uh, foot SLR rise. Uh, I'm not coming out of projection, but the uh, Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, I believe we've already heard from the next caller on oral communications. And so we will go ahead and move into our next item, which will be item number 25. Mayor, if, I'm, if I may, before yeah. we jump in, and I know um, when things are brought up during oral communications, we can't necessarily take action on those um, as they haven't been agendized. But I'm wondering if either our city attorney or city manager could uh, return with some sort of update on uh, this group who uh, storms Trader Joe's and have planned other uh, anti-mask um, kind of events in our community and what we as a city could do to uh, protect our community from these types of instances. Yes, we've been in uh, close communication with the police department on this and we can certainly send the council an update. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, uh, we will go ahead and move on to, I'm sorry, uh, council member Cummings, did you have a question or? Yeah, I just wanted to follow up with that to see if, um, in that memo, there can be recommendations about what actions the city might be able to take in terms of the implementation, whether it's an ordinance or different laws um, around that kind of behavior. I know that that was one of a number of events. There was another instance that happened uh, at the farmer's market where uh, a member of the public who I personally know was, someone tried to rip their face mask off, and it's happened multiple times on West Cliff where people have tried ripping off the masks of individuals who are walking. And I know that that in and of itself is assault, but given the circumstances that we're under with there being a pandemic and the potential for exposure, um, if there are <clears throat> um, laws or penalties that we can put in place that would not only discourage that kind of behavior, but um, you know, there would be consequences for people who engage in those actions, I think will be uh, beneficial for our community as a whole. So thank you. Thank you, um, and I don't know if Chief Mills is here. He is here. I know he did some discussions um, with our DA following the Trader Joe's incident. We have been exploring our options, um, and we are um, assessing uh, actual action by council. Um, I'm sorry, Council Member Colder, I missed your hand up. So. Um, if you have a comment, and then I, I'd love to have Chief Mills uh, speak a little bit to the community as well on this. In addition to the, the incidents um, with the no masks out and about, there's this other group, and I don't know if it's the same group that have been giving out free hugs, and a, a number of people have reported that they're super aggressive with the hugs, and um, even outside of a pandemic, that makes a lot of people really uncomfortable, and it seems really inappropriate. So I don't know if that's the same group or different, but if not, they, maybe we could tie them in together. Chief Mills, if you wouldn't mind, maybe just give a very brief update as long as this is appropriate. Um, Mr. Condotti, uh, the incident, uh, just for the public's knowledge, the uh, the incident did occur after our ability to agendize anything for this meeting. So um, just to let everybody know, but Chief Mills, please make any comments to you. Yeah, yes. we, can, we can briefly respond to questions or comments from council members that arise um, during the oral communication. Good evening, Mayor and uh, council members. This is Andy Mills, your police chief. And uh, we are very, we also are very concerned and uh, upset about the events that have taken place in our community. Uh, we have reached out and talked with the management at Trader Joe's, uh, both at patrol level and I went in there as well and talked with the management. Uh, we also sent them uh, correspondence via email uh, when questions arose over what to do and how they can best protect themselves. Uh, for the trespassing part, the corporation needs to get permission to the local store. And so we've asked for them to get that clarification ahead 
ahead of time so that when we go in there, we can make those arrests, and we absolutely will make those arrests. Our officers have been instructed that this is zero tolerance uh, for this type of behavior. Uh, and then uh, there also is the possibility that uh, the we also can cite under the executive order given by the emergency manager, which is the city manager, uh, to be able to cite people for not wearing a mask uh, for events such as the free hugs and so forth. Um, which are not really free. There's a cost to them uh, in terms of public health, and this is this is unacceptable behavior uh, in our in our community. Uh, the 28th, allegedly, there's supposed to be a uh, event that's uh, nationwide uh, concerning uh, giving out, uh, protesting, wearing masks, and uh, we are actually staffing up for that to make sure we have adequate resources in place. And again, our position is this is zero tolerance and that we will make the necessary uh, law enforcement contacts and arrests as needed. Thank you, Chief Mills. Okay, we will move on to our next item tonight, um, which is item number 25. And for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, um, if this is an item you want to com comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order of this item tonight will we will we receive a presentation by staff and then following uh, we will have questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. We have um, a lot of interest in this uh, agenda item tonight. Um, we've had hundreds of email communications on the item. Um, and I do want to allow the council to have um, time and uh, the energy, frankly, to make our way through a very complicated ordinance um, that is obviously of great interest to our community and is um, of great importance to get right is, to the extent that we can. So um, I just want to let everybody know there's going to be a few things, a few changes. Um, I have received um, uh, requests from 12 individuals for extra time. I have granted those. Those folks are going to be going first and they will be getting three minutes. After that, um, this is when we open the uh, public comment. After that, um, I will take public comment um, at one and a half minutes each until 9 p.m., at which time I will close public comment and to provide time for uh, council deliberation. Uh, this is an attempt so that um, we can deliberate and get through this tonight without working into the wee hours of the morning. So I appreciate, I'm seeing the numbers climb on the number of attendees here tonight. Um, it is not my intent to try to cut people short on communicating with us. We are still receiving emails. You can still communicate with us. We do all uh, see our emails live, but in the interest of trying to um, get through and deliberate on this. I am going to um, restrict um, public comment after the extended time to a minute and a half, and I will be stopping public comment at 9 p.m. tonight. So uh, I will now turn it over to Lee Butler, the Director of Planning and Community Development, to start the presentation tonight for City Council. Uh, and again, we will have questions from the Council following the presentation, and then I would like to go to public comment after that. So thank you, Lee. Thank you, Mayor Myers and Vice Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development and the Homeless Response Director for the City. And I'm going to share my screen here. Okay, just confirming, um, are you seeing uh, the notes pages or the full screen? We see the, we see the full screen. Thanks, Lee. All right, thank you. All right, um, with me this evening and participating in the presentation will also be Tony Elliott, our Parks and Recreation Director, as well as Andy Mills, our Police Chief. And we also have Cassie Bronson and Tony Condotti from our City Attorney's Office who are also here to assist. All right, so I'm gonna go through a number of things here and um, just 
just want to let you know what we're going to cover. I'm going to start with some local statistics, and Tony and Tony Elliott and I will speak to recent issues that the city team and the community have had to address. Um, I'm going to talk about how we got to the ordinance with community feedback through the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, as well as um, council direction. And we'll also provide some background uh, related to the Martin versus Boise case. And then I'll go through the specifics of the ordinance um, with Chief Mills um, providing information on the enforcement. And I will also let you know that um, we've had hundreds of pages of comments, as Mayor Myers mentioned, and um, we have a number of potential changes that the council may want to consider that um, have uh, resulted or are potential results of the um, community comments. So before jumping into the presentation, I'll just start by saying that we are not alone up and down the West Coast in particular, but across the nation, cities are struggling with how to help unhoused individuals. It's really the most challenging issue that many cities are facing, and it's a multifaceted problem with roots in economic factors, mental health issues, substance abuse and addiction, affordable housing, individuals' loss of connections with others, and inadequate federal and state resources, to name just a few. I want to acknowledge the complaints that we receive literally on a daily basis about quality of life impacts and environmental concerns related to our unhoused population. These are real and legitimate concerns, and, and we hear those. I also want to acknowledge the voices calling for additional homeless support and resources. We have systemic funding and resource gaps at the federal, state, and local levels, and we're actively lobbying our state and federal representatives for additional financial assistance. The city is not going to solve this issue on its own, nor is it equipped to. Many of the factors are outside of the city's control and purview. I'll speak briefly to some of the distinctions between the city's and the county's role later. And I'll also talk about many of the things that we as a city are doing to support unhoused individuals in our community. To really address the problem, systemic changes are needed in the way we as a nation and as a state view and treat the unhoused. And I'll note here that Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz County is taking significant steps in setting goals in its six month and three year strategic plan for addressing homelessness. And that'll be going to the Board of Supervisors early next month. So I encourage you to review those materials. While we are working closely with the county on many issues related to helping the unhoused population, our community experiences impact from the impacts from the unhoused on a daily basis. And in response to that, the council has directed staff to update the, counting, the, the camping ordinance. And so um, I'll jump into the rest of the presentation here. Based on the 2019 point in time count, we had about 1,200 homeless individuals in the city of Santa Cruz, with about 865 of those being unsheltered. That uh, we as a city represent about 24% of the county's population, but we have about 55% of the county's homeless population. And so many ask, why is there a concentration here? And there are really many factors that uh, contribute to this. As the county seat, we have the county's jails, we have the county's courts, and many of the county's services, like their health services, within the city's limits. And we're relatively compact. So if you don't have a vehicle, it is easier to get to goods and services in the city as compared to areas of the county where goods and services are more spread out. Given this challenge that everyone's aware of, what are we doing? Well, we're doing quite a bit as a city to help the homeless individuals here. This year, we'll be spending about $4 million for services, homeless prevention, and cleanup, not to mention a substantial percentage of police and fire calls that address the issue of homelessness. And that's in a year when we have slashed budgets and mandatory furloughs. So a few of those things that uh, the $4 million goes to. 
um, two mental health liaisons from the County Behavioral Health Services team uh, are out in the field with our city police officers. We contribute to the county's HOPES program, the downtown outreach worker program, and to county sheltering programs. We support mobile showers and fund a variety of nonprofits providing services for people experiencing homelessness, such as Downtown Streets, Housing Matters, Encompass Community Services, and the Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, among others. We dedicate a significant percentage of our community development block grants, our CDBG funding, towards addressing homelessness. Approximately $1.2 million in 2021, and typically hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. We got additional funding this year due to COVID. Um, the funds, uh, the CDBG funds go to homeless prevention activities like security deposit assistance and rental payments. They also go to infrastructure investments like nearly $500,000 that we're spending to support a new hygiene bay at Housing Matters so that unsheltered individuals have a place where they can shower and use the restroom. We also have significant costs related to cleanup efforts. Before the most recent storms in late January, our teams walk through flood prone areas along the San Lorenzo River. They ask campers to move to higher ground. And they, after those individuals moved, they removed four and a half tons of trash and debris from the area, preventing it from washing into the Monterey Bay. We had another cleanup and restoration effort earlier last year that had a $200,000 price tag just on its own. And I'll share some photos that depict some of those cleanups in just a bit. In addition to the $4 million, the city offers rents at well below market rate to Housing Matters to encompass and to the Homeless Garden Project as a means to support the great work that these service providers do each and every day. And of course, to address homelessness, we need housing. So just since November of last year, the city has approved or authorized construction of up to 425 affordable units. And 184 of those are expected to be supportive housing units that um, homeless individuals would qualify for. So that's five separate projects that the city has approved. So we really are trying to step up and do our part. Um, there are affordable housing projects that have recently been completed and others that are recently, that are under construction right now. And we're looking forward, very much looking forward to getting these additional units online as well. We've also increased the number of beds that we have for the homeless. And we work closely with the county on this. And these are estimations, but we had approximately 155 beds pre-COVID between the Pauley Loft, the Armory, and the Laurel Street shelters. And we now have a little over 400 beds. And um, that includes the Vets Hall, the Armory, Paul Lee Loft and 144 rooms and four motels across the city. And the city, excuse me, the county has worked to expand shelter facilities in other parts of the county as well. And we have more beds now, both in the city and within the county than ever before. But of course, we still have a great need. While I'm mentioning the county, I wanna remind the viewers here of some of the varying roles between the city and the county. One of the things we regularly hear as the city is that we need to provide mental and physical health services as well as addiction and substance abuse treatment. And those are absolutely needed. And the county is the one that provides those services. The city does not have a public health department. Those services are provided by the county. And I'll note here that the city and county are working collaboratively on a wide range of issues, such as temporary shelter, long-term supportive housing options, outreach to people on the streets and hygiene services for those individuals. And the city and county are actively lobbying state and federal officials for additional resources. And despite all of these efforts and despite the highest number of beds we've ever had in the county, the situation remains increasingly challenging. I'm gonna share with you some slides of recent situations that our teams here in the city and thus our community have been dealing with. You can see here um, some of the 
the grading that's occurred and um, some of the issues associated with um, restrooms that um, occur in our open spaces. And um, you can see in these photos, some of the trash accumulation that occurs that our teams need to come in and pick up. <clears throat> Here's some more photos of that. You know, really significant costs that we bear to haul all of these things out. Um, oftentimes in areas where um, it's really challenging to get mechanical equipment. And um, in the midst of this, of course, you know, we hear often from the community, not only about the, the trash and debris, but also um, very real and very significant concerns about needles. Um, you can see here some of the um, uh, effects, uh, after effects uh, or the outcomes after um, some of the cleanups have occurred um, where people have uh, either city and, uh, employees or um, volunteers have collected needles and we appreciate the work of people who are out there and um, helping with all the cleanup efforts that we have. And then, you know, there are quality of life issues associated as well. Um, there are um, instances of uh, bicycle thefts where um, individuals um, you know, are um, collecting bicycles and it's, it's something that um, affects the quality of life. It, it affects people's ability to have you know, a kid ride their bike over to someone's house and leave the bike in the front yard. Um, I don't think um, many people would advise of that here because you know, we do have challenging situations related to um, uh, bike chop shops. And, and this um, isn't a, a, uh, a stale issue. Um, just this past weekend, you can see um, that some volunteers collected a large number of bicycles and, and also um, trash that our uh, teams went out and helped clean up. And then um, you know, we also hear from people about an, an inability to use um, some of the public parks and um, concerns surrounding that. We, hear, we also hear that, that people can still occupy parks and that people can still go to parks and um, there um, certainly is that ability. There are also challenges though, depending on the users. You know, if, if someone is planning to, to throw a Frisbee or kick a soccer ball, um, you know, the presence of a large number of tents um, does impact people's abilities uh, to use our parks um, in um, all the ways that they, they could potentially be used. And so um, we, we do hear those complaints on a regular basis. Um, with that, um, I'm gonna turn it over to our parks director, Tony Elliott, to speak a little bit more about um, the parks system. All right, thank you, Lee, and uh, thank you, Mayor and City Council. Uh, for the chance to share some perspective uh, from the Parks and Rec uh, Department. So uh, I just wanna briefly share with the council uh, the context uh, to which this ordinance, outdoor living ordinance applies uh, to the parks master plan uh, and also some recent work done by the city's Parks and Recreation Commission. Uh, so to start and just to be really clear, parks are, are just not good places for people to live. Uh, they prevent, uh, present harsh environmental conditions for individuals experiencing homelessness and ultimately the effects of people living in parks has negative consequences on our habitat, protected species, public safety, uh, and it creates increased risk for wildfire and contamination to our drinking water. And as you can see from the photographs that Lee shared uh, and as many have experienced uh, firsthand across the park system, unregulated camping in our city parks and open spaces uh, poses significant impacts and threats to our national environment and to our community's ability to safely access and enjoy public spaces. The Parks and Recreation Department hears concerns uh, similar to what Lee was alluding to. Uh, we hear concerns on a near daily basis from park users about safety, cleanliness, and accessibility of parks as a result of widespread camping. 
and I won't go into great detail uh, just in the spirit of, of time here, but I wanted to share an example, a recent example from uh, Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz County uh, that recently conducted a survey to gain feedback on whether or not um, homelessness has affected trail riding in Santa Cruz. Uh, and based on the survey, 52% um, of respondents said it has affected how they use the parks. Yeah, thanks, Lee, on the, on the graph there. Um, so 52% said it affects how they use the parks. 15% of all of the respondents to the survey specifically called out the Emma McCrary Trail in Poganip as one they simply won't use. Uh, and female riders in particular expressed significant concerns about being fearful, not being able to ride alone, and not willing to take their young families to certain trails. And I want to acknowledge that 15%, while that seems like a small number to, to many, to me that's alarming. If 1% if, uh, if of our community says that they're not willing to go to a city park or a trail because of fear, that, that's alarming to me. So that 15% to me uh, uh, feels like a, a, big, a, a big number and a significant issue. Talking about the uh, Parks Master Plan here a little bit, the 2030 Parks Master Plan states the heritage of the park system reflects a community that deeply cares about providing and preserving the quality and diversity of the recreational, natural, and urban environments. And among the Master Plan's four overarching goals, two that are especially relevant um, as it relates to the Outdoor Living Ordinance are uh, one, to provide ample, accessible, safe, and well-maintained parks, open space, and active recreation facilities. And the second is to provide well-managed, clean, and convenient public access to open space lands and coastline. The current conditions, as you saw from some of the photographs uh, across many of our parks and open spaces uh, in our city park system are in conflict with these goals uh, set by the Parks Master Plan. So I want to shift gears uh, and talk about a, sort of an operational viewpoint. And so what I'd say is the city departments, including Parks and Recreation, are subject to wide-ranging regulatory mandates. Uh, CEQA, we had to go through a long CEQA process with our Parks and Rec Master Plan. The City Parks and Rec Department in particular, as a uh, regulatory body to some degree, requires a variety of permits, <clears throat> excuse me, and agreements uh, for things like special events, use agreements and leases. And from my perspective, the outdoor living ordinance will provide clarity on the city's rules and the city's conditions under which camping may occur. And ideally it will help us to avoid costly remediation of large camps in the future. As Lee mentioned a little bit ago, cleanup um, in Poganip last year cost the city around $200,000 uh, to clean up. And the eventual cleanup of San Lorenzo Park will also be uh, very expensive. Uh, so this proposed ordinance that's before the council today is, in my opinion, an important step to clarify the rules and use conditions across the park system and ultimately help preserve our natural environment. Um, and finally, I just would like to briefly summarize uh, an important body of work that the City Parks and Recreation Commission completed in 2020 related to parks and staff safety. Uh, in January 2020, the Parks and Rec Commission initiated an ad hoc subcommittee to address concerns about the health and safety of parks and recreation staff and park users. Uh, over the course of six meetings stretching from February to September of 2020, a commission subcommittee met with employees, the police department, uh, and other staff to hear about challenges as well as methods involved in addressing negative, negative experiences of staff and parks users. Parks and Rec staff have experienced cases of assault, vandalism to vehicles, theft of supplies, break-ins, destruction of park grounds and facilities, and frequent aggressive behavior from individuals living in the park system. The Parks and Recreation Commission voted unanimously to provide a four-pronged recommendation to the City Council. Uh, and what is most re uh, re excuse me, relevant as it relates to the outdoor living ordinance is recommendation number two that came from the Parks and Rec Commission, and that is that the city needs to address regulatory and operational uncertainty regarding its camping ordinances and interpretation of court decisions related to encampments. These inconsistencies are driving the lack of enforcement against behaviors that threaten 
uh, staff and system users, as well as leading to facility damage and environmental degradation in open spaces and natural habitat areas. And so from my perspective, the proposed outdoor living ordinance tonight is an effective mechanism in response to the work and recommendations put forth by the city's Parks and Recreation Commission. And the last thing I'll say here is just from the Parks and Recreation Department uh, viewpoint, we understand that this proposed ordinance won't solve homelessness. Um, however, what it does is establish clarity for the community and for park users and for individuals residing throughout the park system. It gives us an opportunity to match our operations with the goals set forth by our master plan and the Parks and Recreation Commission's recommendations. Uh, so I really appreciate the opportunity here to share a bit of perspective from Parks and Rec, and with that, I'll send it back over to Lee. Thanks, Tony. Um, <clears throat> there are individuals who are unhoused, who are camping in our community that um, are doing so in a manner that um, are not creating um, many of those challenges that we saw in those photos. There are individuals in our community that are, um, uh, you know, cleaning up after themselves that are, that are employed, that are um, productive members of our, um, of our society. And there are also individuals that um, have, um, uh, that can create some of these challenges in the photos that we saw. Um, and that can particularly become exacerbated when there are large groups, when there are large encampments, um, and when those become entrenched. When you start to see the environmental degradation um, and you see the um, large amounts of uh, debris and trash um, that is typically, not always, but it's typically associated with larger encampments. And so um, that was part of the focus of um, the work that was done. And um, <clears throat> that's a, a little bit of background and a little bit of the situation that our teams have experienced. And I'm going to jump back uh, a couple of years, going from recent to a couple of years ago, when um, the camping ordinance that we have on our books right now was suspended. And so um, we do, right now we have a, a ban, a camping ban, um, and um, that camping ban on our books, we have direction from the council to not um, implement that. And that is because it is inconsistent with the Martin v. Boise case. And what the Martin v. Boise case says is that if there, that essentially you cannot criminalize the act of sleeping if there aren't adequate shelter beds available for the unhoused individuals in the community. So sleeping in and of itself cannot be criminalized. Now, cities, can regulate the time, place, and manner of um, where sleeping can be allowed, um, but it cannot be banned outright, as is the case with our, our current ordinance. And I'll just say, you know, the current ordinance um, on the books also, um, you know, has been on the books for quite some time, and, you know, there were unhoused individuals in our community that were camping before that. And so, um, as Tony mentioned, you know, an ordinance in and of itself is not going to solve homelessness. Um, that is a much bigger issue and it involves many of the, the social supports that um, I talked about earlier. Um, so, following the Martin v. Boise case and the camping ordinance suspension, the council um, put together a, a committee, a Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, the CASH. And the CASH met 16 times between 2019 and 2020. It came up with a whole series of recommendations. And those recommendations, many of them were presented to the city council back in February of 2020. 
And those became the basis for, that, that was, became the foundation of the ordinance um, that um, is before you this evening. And the agenda report, you can take a look, it, it evaluates each of the um, recommendations and says um, you know, why things were included or if they weren't included, why they weren't, and, and if other things were, why that was the case. And so, um, again, a lot of that focused on these large encampments and how to address the large encampments and entrenchment. Um, we also have uh, policies related to um, equity, public health, and sustainability as the pillars of our health and all policies consideration. And that's another lens that we use in considering policy. Um, the ordinance that is under consideration uh, by the council this evening includes a number of things that address the health and all policies pillars. It includes things like a daytime storage program for the unhoused so that they can safely store their belongings while going to jobs or medical appointments. It contains behavioral expectations and locational criteria that protect the environment, thereby contributing to sustainability. It has provisions that, that preclude enforcement until COVID vaccines are available to the unhoused and on an ongoing basis includes provisions that uh, preclude enforcement during inclement weather and it provides additional allowances for disabled individuals and as you'll hear in just a little bit um, we're also recommending um, some changes for um, uh, families and also uh, disabled individuals caretakers um, that came about as a result of some of the public comments that we received. And it has provisions that help ensure that all Santa Cruzans will have access to park resources that contribute to their health and well-being. So with all that um, background, um, I'm gonna jump into the ordinance here. So I'm gonna um, uh, talk to you about um, private property, prohibited areas, acceptable areas, behavioral requirements, and then I'll invite Chief Mills up to talk about the enforcement. Um, so starting off on the private property, um, right now um, there are um, opportunities for religious institutions to host uh, recreational vehicles, up to three recreational vehicles. And we're proposing that this um, uh, goes to uh, six, from three to six. And for businesses, um, that is proposed to go from um, from two to three, sorry, I didn't fill in that number there, but from two are currently allowed in businesses up to three. Um, that's, that's what the proposed ordinance is in front of you uh, this evening. There also, uh, there's a minor change that came in as a result of public comment, and I'll get to that um, in, in just a little bit. When we get to the um, prohibited areas, um, I'll highlight some of the, the key things. So. Uh, the tents and encampments would not be able to block first responders or access to city equipment. They also um, would be prohibited from um, areas that are dangerous to occupants or first responders or to special status species. So uh, first responders, that includes um, fire or flood prone areas during uh, seasons when those issues um, could create hazards and then uh, special status species. We've depicted those um, as um, our mapped sensitive habitat areas. However, um, not all of those areas may be off limits at all times. Um, so um, we would, uh, if the council chooses to um, support this provision of the ordinance, then staff would come back and identify here are the areas of the sensitive habitat where camping is off limits and here's where they could still occur. Continuing with prohibited areas, um, inside the San Lorenzo River bike ped path between either side of the uh, river there, um, in the water department director's source water protection zone, we do get a lot of our drinking water from San Lorenzo River and there's a map that identifies areas that, um, where, where camping would be prohibited. 
and enclosed areas. And there are um, a number of areas that the uh, city could, or a number of reasons why the city could deem an area closed, such as um, repetitive cleanups being necessary or um, uh, significant issues with the police as it relates to um, uh, uh, illicit drugs. Um, and then um, one change here, we, we cited the um, neighborhood and community parks as a prohibited area. And um, for clarification, um, we wanted to make sure that we were also including um, the um, regional parks and the single amenity parks as part of that. And so um, those are considered as, as parks, but uh, we're, we're just making a language clarification so that um, all of the parks are included. That does not include the open spaces. We'll get to that when we're talking about areas where camping could be allowed. Um, and <clears throat> we'll show you the text of, of those changes uh, in just a little bit here as well. Um, and then city-owned beaches and uh, identified oceanfront areas are also um, cited as prohibited. Okay. Um, we talked about the, uh, the various um, parks here. And then um, continuing with the prohibit prohibited areas, um, downtown, there um, would be a prohibition in downtown. Um, there would also be a prohibition on city-owned parking lots and specified open spaces. So Neary Lagoon, Jesse Street Marsh, and Arroyo Seco Canyon would be prohibited. And then within 75 feet of trails in other open spaces. And so um, any areas um, that are outside of the 75 feet of trails and open spaces and that are not in the three identified um, open spaces where camping would be prohibited, those would be areas that, that could, uh, where camping could occur. So what areas are those? You can see here, um, Moore Creek could potentially um, have individuals in Poganip, um, De La Viega Wilderness Area, and Arana Gulch. So, um, we talked about the prohibited areas, so the potential encampment areas um, include um, the open spaces outside, greater than 75 feet from the trails, um, the um, sidewalks outside of the prohibited areas, and then specifically designated areas, areas that either the council, the city manager, or the parks director um, identifies. And um, we've heard a lot about the sidewalks um, and we've heard concerns about sidewalks um, uh, in residential areas in particular. And a, a key issue here is that we are, that we need to make sure that we do have an adequate amount of space where unhoused individuals can sleep. Um, and so, um, that was one of the key considerations in um, including sidewalks throughout the city as areas. Um, and um, we'll talk about the options related to that in, in just a little bit. Um, I wanna go back to the specifically designated areas and um, clarify, and we have some uh, additional text that would clarify that um, these additional areas may be authorized on public or private properties in any zoning districts and in areas that would otherwise prohibit such uses. So a downtown parking lot, for example, downtown has a prohibition and parking lots have a prohibition. However, specifically identified areas can still accommodate safe sleeping or outdoor living encampments um, if they are designated as such and only in a manner that is authorized. So um, showing the maps of what those uh, areas look like, you can see here is a map of the prohibited areas. So you can see the 75 feet of, e of either side of trails is shown in these sort of linear uh, paths that go through our open spaces. Um, and then downtown, some of the uh, identified prohibited um, open spaces 
and um, then some of the other prohibited areas like the wharf and the beach areas and so forth. Um, we also have a map of potentially prohibited areas. And yes, this looks like a, a large portion of the city and it is a large portion of the city. Um, what this includes is um, the wildland urban interface in the yellow hatch. Um, and that area would not be closed. It's not anticipated that that would be closed year round, um, only during um, fire hazards. And um, that would be up to the discretion of the, um, the fire chief. And then also there are um, areas where flooding could occur and those areas could be closed um, in, uh, on a seasonal basis or in advance of storms subject to the public works director's discretion. And then of course the, the sensitive species areas that we talked about, again, um, we would be doing an evaluation of those areas and uh, determining whether or not um, camping in the manner authorized by the ordinance could be done um, in, uh, in a way that would not harm sensitive species. And then here are those two maps overlaid and you can see that there is um, you know, quite a bit of overlap between the prohibited areas and some of the um, uh, potentially prohibited areas as well. So moving on to the behavioral requirements, um, one of the um, big issues again is the uh, number of um, individuals in an area and the um, entrenchment associated with that that can create environmental uh, challenges. And so, um, tents, the, the ordinance before you would prohibit tents between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m., except there are a number of exceptions. There are exceptions for disabled individuals for inclement weather. And um, we've added, as you'll see in a little bit, some exceptions for families and also for a caregiver for an individual who may be disabled. Um, and these would only be enforced after a daytime storage program is in effect and only after COVID-19 vaccines are available to the unhoused uh, community. So we did hear a lot of concerns about um, you know, the, the daytime prohibition and the effects that that could have during a uh, pandemic. And um, we have sought to address many of those concerns through the fact that these provisions would not be enforced until vaccines are available. And then the daytime storage program would provide an opportunity for individuals to store their belongings so that they can go to their jobs, so they can go to their medical appointments, so that they can um, go and uh, get the services that they need and not have to worry about whether or not their belongings are gonna be there when they get back. Um, we have um, a uh, provision here um, that we're proposing to change and that is um, a deletion of the reference to vehicles in the outdoor living facilities definition. And that is because that this ordinance is not specifically intended to uh, address uh, the, the uh, individuals who are residing in vehicles. Um, that would be addressed through um, uh, different uh, regulations. And so we wanted to clarify that here and we'll be going through these and some additional um, uh, text changes in just a bit. Continuing with the behavioral requirements, limitations on storage. Um, so car tires, bike parts, gas generators, various other items have limitations. Um, sorry, no fires. Um, I skipped over that one. Fires would not be allowed. Trash and litter standards. This is another one that we heard some um, good suggestions from the community and so we'll have um, some additional updates related to that in a moment. And these include things like um, staying clear of, um, uh, of not having improperly disposed of needles. Um, and then we have a uh, 12 foot by 12 foot per person um, limitation and uh, a restriction on uh, not uh, 
creating environmental damage. Um, with that, um, we are on to the enforcement section here, and I will welcome Chief Andy Mills to speak to this section. Well, thank you, Director Butler, for that uh, thorough briefing on, on what the ordinance looks like. Uh, I think the main thing to understand is that uh, Santa Cruz Police Department is fully prepared uh, to enforce uh, the ordinance as you uh, implement it, should you choose to do so. And uh, the goal certainly is not to criminalize the homeless, but to gain voluntary compliance when possible. And so there are three tiers that have been set up in the ordinance to gain that compliance. Uh, the first tier is to warn. And uh, this is what we have been doing for some time, is warning people, trying to talk with them, helping them move, uh, trying to prevent some of the problems that come with a significant size encampment. The second uh, uh, level up would be to cite people, and it would be a maximum of a $20 fine. And as you are aware, uh, if they get cited multiple times, uh, it can go to collections. And that's the most that we could possibly do. Uh, how, however, it could be diverted to community service uh, should that uh, person desire to do that instead. And then the third level up would be a misdemeanor charge. Uh, if a person refuses to leave uh, or we have to um, warn the person and cite the person multiple times within a 30-day period. Uh, this would be the leverage that we would need to actually gain some level of compliance. And uh, we felt that that was uh, important from the standpoint of uh, going forward, there are a certain percentage of the community who just doesn't want to go with uh, the norms and standards uh, that this community is setting forward. And so there has to be some kind of consequence uh, for that. We have to remember that a vast majority of the citations are uh, they don't appear on. And so if there's no consequence to it, it becomes difficult to manage the population. Um, I think one of the things I'd li really like for you to know is that this is about addressing the harms associated with uh, unlawful camping. And, and uh, because it allows us to prevent a buildup <coughs> of large encampments by making sure that people are taking down their tents at, during the daytime and, and, and not getting entrenched and collecting all sorts of other uh, items that uh, sometimes these uh, encampments collect. And then the third thing is we want to make sure that we're activating the space uh, for the entire community to use. Uh, because right now, certain spaces in our community, because of camping, uh, people are prohibited from going there. And, and our focus initially would be on the beach, the downtown area, and the city parks uh, as our enforcement, uh, and, and then move on to the other areas of the city as we um, get the opportunity. Uh, this will take some cost and some time and some effort. Uh, we're gonna have to put people out in uh, probably in overtime a couple times a week uh, to just get out there and uh, educate first, warn, and then um, start the enforcement uh, process uh, when we can. At least you could advance. The property removal and storage is obviously a, is an important piece. Um, this would give us a 24-hour notice unless it's exigent. Uh, and some of the camps that we come across are, are pretty exigent. I mean, they're large, they're environmental uh, hazard, uh, they're a public health hazard and those, those could be abated uh, fairly quickly. And then uh, the second piece would be a misdemeanor. So if there's personal property available uh, in those tents that might be stolen and we're going to arrest somebody, then we would collect that, uh, those personal items and store those personal items for the individual uh, to come back and get later, um, uh, rather than having them, be, having them stolen or wind up missing. Uh, we also have and will continue to post encampments, uh, and then that will allow us to go in and abate those encampments um, after a week uh, without, um, if people are not, haven't, haven't moved by that time. 
and it also gives us a little bit more flexibility to storage rather than in going to an encampment where there's an enormous amount of things to be impounded. We could impound it and store it all in a locked facility and allow them to come and get their stuff uh, without having to itemize every detail. It would be, um, it would be an enormous uh, effort uh, when some of these encampments have so many uh, different pieces. Um, the bottom line for us is uh, we want to make sure that we're uh, using uh, interpersonal skills, citations, and then arrests to gain compliance for our community. If that's the direction that you should choose to go. And uh, we're, we will stand by for uh, questions a little bit later. Thank you. So as Chief Mills mentions, and as our parks director mentioned as well, this is not a uh, ordinance that is going to end homelessness, but um, it does provide some tools to address some of the problems, particularly those problems that arise with large groups and entrenchment. Um, moving on to the last section, uh, thanks for hanging in there. We've got um, a, a big last section here because um, we had many, many public comments, um, hundreds of pages of public comments, as you all know. And um, some of the things that we heard were that um, residential sidewalks um, should not uh, allow camping. And um, one thing that um, we would recommend is that if um, the council is considering taking residential sidewalks off of the table for um, a place where uh, unhoused individuals can go, we would recommend that the council simultaneously provide recommendations on alternative identified locations. So whether that's parks or parking lots or closed portions of the right of way. Um, and um, we've got um, some draft language in case you are um, interested in doing any of that, uh, you can consider that draft language. Um, hours of camping, we heard some people say more, some people say less, and um, we started building in all the changes um, and we could not actually um, get them all into the PowerPoint. So I'm gonna shift for a moment and go to a uh, Google Doc here. Can you all see this uh, document? Great, I'm gonna just see if I can make it larger here. Maybe it's a little too big, okay. Um, so we have a series of uh, of uh, potential changes for the council to consider based on a wide range of uh, comments that came in. Um, I'm gonna try to go through them quickly and we can go back at the end, um, if, if we can go back after the presentation, if anyone has questions, we'll have opportunities. So um, we talked about removing the vehicles and vehicular camping. Um, here, um, it's a clarification that if items do remain in, uh, this is part of the outdoor living encampment definition, if items do remain in the same location for 12 hours, then it's considered an outdoor living encampment. Um, other comments, this is part of the, um, this is the only change uh, other than the, the numbers going from three to six and from two to three in private property. Um, there were some suggestions that, um, that the private property should also not be used for trafficking in illegal drugs or in a manner that creates a public or private nuisance. And those uh, seem like reasonable um, uh, items for the council to consider. Um, and then this is the change related to um, uh, eliminating neighborhood and community parks, just all parks, but not including open spaces. Um, and then we still have the, um, no outdoor living allowed in the identified open spaces. Um, I've just highlighted these. I, um, we don't have anything to speak about uh, unless the council wants to make uh, any edits related to that. This is where I talked with you about the, uh, the additional um, allowances for families um, with one or more children under the age of 18 years old um, and for a single caregiver for a person with a qualifying disability. So um, this section speaks to both of those, allowing for um, members of a family unit um, uh, or for a caregiver to remain in a location. You'll recall down here that this would allow for 
um, individuals to occupy uh, space for 96 hours instead of all of the, uh, the daily um, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. prohibitions. And then there is one additional addition here, which is just that a physician's verification is evidence, but isn't necessarily binding evidence in all instances as it relates to a qualifying disability. Um, this section right here, this is um, if the council wanted to um, eliminate um, residential sidewalks, this could be some language that could be used. So right here, um, this is the section that allows for camping on um, sidewalks. And um, the, uh, the ordinance could be modified to um, eliminate these residential sections. And then um, there's some additional uh, items where cleaning could be allowed. So maintenance, limiting the incidence or frequency of the sale of unlawful drugs, um, limiting or controlling crime, um, limiting domestic violence or other violence, accumulation of debris and syringe waste, um, du amount, duration, and effect of urination or defecation on public pri and private property, and uh, limiting adverse effects on surrounding area. So some additional clarification for why uh, uh, the city manager could um, close an area. Um, and then um, let's see if um, we keep moving on here. So, um, so this is, I, I talked about this. This is the section where um, camping or outdoor living is permitted. And this is the clarifying language. These may be authorized on public or private properties in any zoning district and in areas that would otherwise prohibit such uses. And then if the council wanted to eliminate um, the residential sidewalks, this is a, uh, a piece that the council could include to expand um, the additional allowances. So if you're saying no residential sidewalks, um, the council should also consider alternative areas and this would say um, in a part or all of a city owned parking lot, closed portion of a public right of way on private property or in an alternative space or area designated by the city manager for safe sleeping. And this says that the city manager or his or her designee shall establish a program for overnight use of no fewer than 150 safe sleeping spaces in such areas subject to all the criteria contained in the section. I'm, I'm sure um, if the council is interested in the residential portion, um, we'll be back at this and we'll have opportunity to discuss it at length. The council can provide direction to be very specific or very general. You could say, you know, keep this language, but focus on areas. So it's, it's up to the council's discretion on how they might want to treat this. But we wanted to have a starting point for some language in case the council did want to um, make modifications to that section as we heard from many of the um, the uh, people who were writing in. Um, this one was some clarification language that we received um, that I thought was good. Um, so electrical connections, we had, we had previously just said uh, electrical taps. And so that clarifies electrical connections or taps. And then um, there's some clarification about fires that they may be allowed in a lawfully created um, fire pit or other permanent receptacle provided for by the city. And then um, I mentioned some of the um, litter and debris. There were some suggestions from the community. So um, the encampments shall be maintained reasonably safe, tidy, and healthy, free from various debris, and with, food, with uh, debris contained in a bag or container. And then this just states that uh, it will be contained and that the encampment shall be cleared of personal belongings as um, uh, the occupants um, leave the area. Continuing on, this um, is a companion to the um, item with relation to the um, person with a qualifying disability is allowed to occupy a 12 foot by 12 foot space. Um, and this said that, um, that if you've got 20 people at a camp, and there's one individual with a qualifying disability that 
you know, you don't, you don't get the 20 people having a 12 by 12 area. Um, we actually got a, a comment, we got some comments with some confusion about that, and so we, uh, we thought to clarify that here, and we also wanted to say that your caretaker can also have their own 12 by 12 area. And so that's the, the language that's included right here. And we're happy to, I'm happy to spend more time on the language here if, um, if you all have questions about it. Um, and I believe that is the last, um, yes, that is the last. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the PowerPoint here. And um, thank you for hanging in there with me. I know this was a long presentation and we are on the last slide. Um, so we are available for questions. Um, there will be public comment and then um, following that, there will be um, council deliberation, including um, the edits and options. And um, these are a few of those but um, we're happy to answer any questions that you may have and um, we look forward to hearing uh, the direction from the council. And Mayor Myers, you're muted. Okay, um, yeah, what I'd like to do if we are uh, amenable to it because I have the feeling that our questions might go into wanting to start to work on the language. Um, but I'm happy to have council members if you have specific questions of clarity, maybe we could at least limit it, that now and then we can allow the public to weigh in and then we can come back for, um, for additional uh, questions and comments because I have a feeling with this language, all the language we've looked at. And then Lee, I guess I would request that as we start to get closer, if you could maybe put that language up um, just so that we can look at it live. Um, it's pretty hard to see in the PowerPoint. Um, so I um, will go with council questions. Um, Council member, I believe Kalantari Johnson was first, but I'm not sure because um, I have been managing different things coming my way. So um, I'll call um, Council member Kalantari Johnson, Council member Cummings, Council member Golder, Council member Watkins, and then Vice Mayor Bruner. And again, if you just keep the questions sort of too specific and try to, so please go ahead, thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have a number of them, so I'm trying to organize them in my head. But the first one is if you can clarify around, uh, Lee, this is a question for Lee, um, the piece around adding, allowing for members of the family unit or caregivers to remain during daytime hours. And then there was a piece around um, 96 hours. I, I just, it was moving really fast. So I wanted to understand where that fits and what that exactly means. Sure, thanks for that. And, and sorry, I was moving fast there. Um, sure. So um, the provision, and I'll, I'll pull this back up here so that you all can see it. Um, so the council will recall that we had included a, um, a section that allows for individuals with a qualifying disability to remain in a location for um, 96 hours. And, and let me just first ask, um, can you all see the screen okay here? Um, do, should I enlarge it? I can, I can see it. Yeah, better. Okay, great. Um, so um, what we did is we added, so, so that was already in there and it said that um, individuals with a qualifying disability can remain in, in a location for 96 uh, hours and um, they um, uh, don't have to move between the 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. And we subsequently heard from individuals who, who said, um, you know, what about families? You know, that could be really challenging for a family with young children um, who is, is having to move. And so we said, hey, that should be, uh, that's a fair comment, that should be something we'll put out there for consideration. And I just wanna be very clear that, 
you know, all of these things are for the council's consideration. And, um, you know, we, we kind of picked things from the, the many comments that were received to say, hey, council may want to weigh in on this. Um, so this adds to both the families with one or more children under 18, as well as the single caregiver. Um, so, you know, before, if there were two people, a person with a qualifying disability, what we heard from uh, a commenter was that many times people with disabilities actually have someone who um, is caring for them that lives with them. And we said, okay, well, let's put that out there for the council to consider. Maybe that individual will also be exempted. Okay, thank you. Um, my my next question is also for you, Lee, around the um, uh, storage program. Um, has has staff considered where the locations of storage program would be and how um, individuals would access the storage program and sort of connected to that if we would be, um, if the transportation piece um, has been considered? So um, we have had some very initial brainstorming sessions surrounding this. Um, we um, have not identified specific locations. We've, we've brainstormed uh, potential locations, but we haven't said yes, who would be here. We've said, you know, where is it gonna be convenient? And where is it gonna be most likely to be utilized? And I think what we would be looking to do is maximize the utilization and if we're, um, we're finding that a specific um, location isn't being utilized, uh, asking individuals why it's not being utilized and seeing, you know, all right, well, where can we move this such that it is um, more readily utilized? So, um, you know, I think we still have a lot of work to do in that respect. We um, want to make sure that um, that is in place um, before we are, um, enforcing any of the daytime camping um, restrictions. And so that was one of the reasons why the ordinance came to you as it was, was um, we, would, we would not necessarily have that storage program up and running right away. And, and how about the transportation piece? So that would be dependent on where that actually occurs. You know, we've talked about, you know, should it be multiple places in close proximity to the um, locations where campers are? Um, ideally, that would be the case. Um, if, um, if that can't happen, then we may need to um, uh, organize some uh, transportation. But um, I, I will say, you know, our initial brainstorming session was, you know, where is this going to be conveniently located such that people can access it without needing transportation? But that's still to be determined. Mm -hmm. Thank you. My next question for clarity is for um, Chief Mills and um, Mayor Myers, if this is more than a question for clarity, we can hold it off until the deliberations. Um, but it's around the um, uh, enforcement piece and the warning piece um, and if there is consideration of integrating outreach and engagement as part of that, that warning effort. Well, we certainly would welcome uh, the county or any other uh, NGO or social service agency to assist with uh, reaching out uh, to people who are challenged and outside uh, to en enable them to access services and resources. So that would be a positive step. Uh, that we could certainly utilize. Uh, we currently do not have that resource other than our mental health liaisons who do a fabulous job, but they're mostly focused on just mental health, um, even though there's a significant overlap. Um, but uh, we would certainly welcome that if the county uh, decided to uh, give us extra people or we find a grant or something else that we could uh, hire those, those bodies with. Thank you. And then the, my last piece is, um, you know, you, I think you were saying that this, this piece around the 8 a.m., 8 p.m., I don't know if it was you or Lee, um, is, is really to um, in some ways manage the, the large, the, the growing encampments and the large number of tents. Um, I wonder if you could just expand on that a little bit um, as, as that being a tool from uh, keeping large encampments from popping up? Yeah, so I view it as a way to manage 
uh, the entrenchment. And once people get entrenched, they tend to grow in numbers. Uh, we have seen that in multiple places around the city. Uh, so if people can't get entrenched because they have to pick up their uh, property every day, it's harder to collect more and more pieces of property. Uh, for instance, when people leave stuff out on the curbs, uh, that winds up oftentimes in our homeless camps. And so um, building that collection of, of things and, and entrenching themselves in those locations, that's what becomes difficult, that's what becomes costly, and that becomes very difficult to undo for us. So uh, by having them lower their tents every day, packing it up, storing it, and then going out to uh, whether it's appointments for medical or, or jobs, uh, that would be the, uh, the opportunity for them to store that, uh, that property and then avoid uh, any uh, conflict with uh, the rest of the city staff. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions for now. Donnie, you're muted. Council Member Cummings is next, please. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you, staff, for the presentation. I have um, a bunch of questions, and so I'm gonna try to be, we're gonna try to not repeat the same ones for now. Um, and I just wanna, you know, make sure it's clear to the public that, you know, I think there's a lot of areas of alignment, and I totally understand why this is important, because, you know, we really need to try to keep people from camping in some of our very, environmentally very sensitive areas. Um, also, the fact that we need to mitigate some of the behaviors that are negatively impacting neighborhoods um, and to the point of, you know, trying to keep these large encampments from getting entrenched, um, I think that that is something that it's really important that we try to focus on um, and at the same time figure out, you know, what are some compassionate solutions to homelessness and to providing opportunities for people who are experiencing homelessness, but, you know, overall, I, what I, the sense that I get is a big part of this is trying to mitigate some of the, the negative environmental impacts and the negative interactions between community members and people who are experiencing homelessness, or housed and unhoused, I should say. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of concerns. And um, I, out of curiosity, am just wanting to understand really how this came forward, because this item, last year came before us as part of a quality of life ordinance package where there were seven um, ordinances that were being proposed for the council to consider. We, because of the pandemic and because of COVID-19, work was stopped on these ordinances in part because the CDC was saying, you know, we don't need to disturb encampments. Um, if there are people who are experiencing homelessness, they need to stay where they are to help mitigate the spread of COVID-19 and not have these people get impacted. And so, you know, given that, although there is a light at the end of the tunnel, um, we're not out of the, the pandemic yet. And so I'm just wanting to understand, you know, why this is coming to us now, um, because it also seems like there's a lot of factors that are gonna inhibit us from enforcing this and for this to actually be implemented. And I, I don't think we should be providing this false sense of you know security to the public that you know if this gets passed that we're going to start putting something through it and enforcing anytime soon because there's a lot of restrictions um, that will prevent us from doing this so I don't know if it's council members or staff who may want to comment on um, this is coming forward but I think it would be good to get some clarity around you know why now for this ordinance Martine Bernal I don't know if you would like to take a shot at that Yes, I'd be happy to try to answer that. I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, one was there was previous direction uh, about a year ago when the when the council considered the cash recommendations, and one of those was to amend our ordinance to uh, uh, comply with uh, Martin versus Boise. Uh, other another was uh, the fact that uh, we have uh, a multitude of. Uh, as you saw in the presentation of complaints uh, and uh, just the need to respond to the ongoing situation. Uh, and then I think others were uh, interested uh, on the part of council members to, 
to try to bring something forward. So I think there's a variety of reasons. Uh, again, both a uh, combination of council direction, uh, the, the need to uh, try to address uh, situations that, and conditions on the ground, uh, and the interest of council members to bring something forward. If I have a... And I'd like to just make sure that just during this time, because we have, a, we have you know, 150 people waiting, um, I'd like to just try to make questions very clarifying in nature right now. I'm, I think we will be deliberating for quite some time on some of these other, but if there's maybe clarifying questions on the ordinance, um, that would be helpful just in this point in time. I mean, I have, I, that was helpful for just kind of the under, for me to understand, you know, how this came about, given that there was seven quality of life ordinances, ordinance recommendations. So that was helpful. I, I would say that, um, you know, one, if, if we're going to talk about the ordinance in and of itself, um, I would like to understand, you know, we're not out of the pandemic and we just, we just, found ourselves in a lawsuit because um, there was an attempt to try to clear the homeless encampment at San Lorenzo. And so I'm just wondering if this ordinance were to move forward, it seems like um, we might find ourselves in additional legal you know, troubles with telling people that they can't set up their tents during the daytime. And so I'm just trying to understand under the current laws how this ordinance um, whether or not this ordinance would put us into legal trouble. Not, I'm not clear. Um, I, I was hoping to get questions on the ordinance right now, um, the contents of the ordinance. Um, I'll look to Mr. Condotti to, I'm, I'm just trying to, trying to get questions on the on the ordinance contents, but, um, and I understand there's a lot of deliberation types of comments that, and questions people have, but I'll, I'll look to Mr. Condotti. I don't, I'm not sure if. Well, I think the answer to the legality of something we haven't even adopted yet, or I'm not quite clear on how we manage this particular question. I think the answer to the council member Cummings question is yes, but in the context of uh, there is a significant deal of uncertainty in uh, these issues. The Martin versus Boise decision was not a model of clarity. It did suggest some reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions that would be permissible in lieu of a citywide ban on camping. And that's what has been prepared uh, for the council's consideration tonight. Um, did we hit the mark uh, perfectly? Probably not. Um, but but this is a good faith effort to draft an ordinance that, uh, that tries to strike a balance between a lot of competing and compelling interests in a way that, um, that, that we believe uh, is intended to be consistent with the, the decision in Martin versus Boise and, and other cases that have interpreted it uh, since. Thank you, Mr. Pindotti. And I guess along those lines, um, you know, we're, I saw within the ordinance that under 6.36.040D that it says that this wouldn't be enforced until homeless and unsheltered have access to vaccines. However, we're being sued currently because we tried to remove an encampment and the CDC has outlined that we are not to um, disrupt encampments during the pandemic. So. I'm concerned with that language that's in the ordinance as to, you know, whether or not that will stand up in court. Because if we get sued because we're trying to move people who are camping and our excuse for doing so is that, well, there's enough vaccines, but yet that does not, that's still in violation of the CDC. I'm wondering, you know, how we'll, we'll reconcile that because I do feel that, um, I. I have a lot of concerns with what's before us, all the changes that have been made that we haven't had a chance to look at, and some of the provisions within this that I think 
and I believe that people in our community will sue us over, and we are in a financial deficit. We try to avoid lawsuits under certain circumstances, and I think this is one of the ones where we absolutely need to be trying to avoid this since we're already being sued for trying to disrupt homeless encampments. So it'd be good to understand um, this situation as well since it's written into the ordinance. Yes, yeah, so um, you're right that the, the CDC guidance is, um, uh, is is to not dismantle encampments uh, to avoid the risk of the spread of COVID-19, but we're not operating per se under the CDC guidance. We are operating under a federal district court judge's order that among other reasons, concluded that a preliminary injunction should be granted to uh, to bar the city from dismantling the San Lorenzo Park encampment um, at this time. And uh, I don't think there's any intention of moving forward uh, in contravention of the district court judge's order. And so that is an ongoing discussion that will be had in court and, um, and, and less than until the judge uh, provides the city with a viable uh, mechanism for dismantling uh, these encampments, uh, we, we cannot do so. So I'm not concerned about um, the city being in violation of the district court judge's order in this case, because we intend to comply with it. I'm gonna... Okay. I'm gonna, I'll hold off on the rest of my comments until later. Council Member Golder. No question. Council member Watkins. I'm gonna reserve my question for later. Okay, thank you. Um, Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, okay, my clarifying or, uh, ordinance questions are uh, the first one being on private property 6.36.030. A1, um, would that be uh, Tony Condotti? With consent of owner or occupant, shouldn't it be both? Or uh, I, how does that work? It could be both. Um, this is um, reflective of existing text. So the council certainly has the ability to modify that as part of this. Um, we, we made very few changes to that section, but it's within the council's purview to um, make that modification should you see fit. Okay. Uh, my next question was on that same section A3. Um, can you speak to the number of vehicles and um, where that context comes from in terms of not being site specific. For example, some sites may be larger to uh, maybe accommodate four vehicles. Another site might be smaller to accommodate less vehicles. Where does that number come from? Sure, so um, this is where, um, and for members of the public who are listening, this is um, related to um, uh, allowing for RVs inside, uh, so allowing for camping inside a licensed and registered motor vehicle in the parking lot on the site of a business institution in a non-residential district with the written consent of both the business institution and property owner um, with some various other provisions. So currently that's allowed at two. Um, we um, included an increase of that to three. Now, the council certainly can increase that uh, to a, a greater number, um, and um, that, or you could you could provide some direction and tell us, you know, come up with an idea of, of how that relates to, you know, no, you could say, for example, no fewer than uh, three, but um, it could be one-fifth of the parking spaces up to a maximum of eight, you know. So it, you, it's certainly within your purview this evening to um, make some modifications related to that should you see fit. And uh, Vice Mayor Bruner, I might just for the public in case, so 
We're, we're uh, discussing section 6.36.030 private property, just so that everyone's clear. Is that, that's the section, right? Correct, but, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, let's see, my next, uh, I'm moving to the next section. I'll try and be. No worries at all, no, you're Okay, 6.36.040. Um, let's see, A3, have these areas already been identified was one of the questions. I'm pulling that up. Sure. So, so if it helps to read it. Yeah, I've got it right here in front of me. Um, okay. And in fact, if it's, if it's helpful, I could share my screen so members of the public can see. Maybe that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so this is again in the um, at-risk areas and areas um, where um, camping would be prohibited. And Vice Mayor Bruner was asking about subsection three here and whether or not these um, areas of reasonably foreseeable danger to occupants and first responders and special status species um, have been identified. And um, somewhat. Uh, so I'll, I'll clarify for you. Um, so um, I am going to pull up um, some maps here to assist with this. And um, I will share my screen again here. Let's, let's do this. Yep, you got it. You got it, Liz? Lee? Yeah. <laughs> Um, so, the prohibited areas um, have been um, identified here. I'll, I'll make this larger. Uh, prohibited areas have been identified. Um, and then when we start looking at the additional areas, the areas that are potentially of danger, um, the hatched areas here, this is all the wildland urban interface. And our, our fire chief would actually determine which areas and specific portions of those areas um, would be off limits during certain times of the year. You know, a, an area might be fine to camp in right now, but um, come late August, the fire chief could say, hey, you know, it's really dry and the fire risk is too high. Similarly, um, there are flood areas, again, um, during the winter, maybe that, uh, those, some of those areas are off limits. Um, and then um, the sensitive species areas or sensitive habitat areas, um, we would need to do a further analysis of those areas and um, identify um, whether or not um, those areas could accommodate campers. And it could vary throughout the year, you know, so if there's a migratory species, for example, um, perhaps um, camping is allowed there when that migratory species is not there. But when it is expected to be present, um, the, uh, the camping could be prohibited. So um, I don't have a, a clear yes and no answer for you. It is. Um, uh, is there only the map form, or is there a list form, or? So what we would at do at this point, yeah. Yeah. So so right now, all we've got is is the maps that are there. Um, now, um, what we would do is the the ordinance actually requires us to maintain a website and keep that current with respect to the areas that are prohibited. So if the fire chief comes in and says, hey, this Wui area is, that wildland urban interface area is um, off limits right now, um, then we would update that map and say, our fire chief has said this is off limits. And the same thing would happen with um, the sensitive species. We would, we would need to specifically identify those areas um, in advance of the ordinance um, uh, being enforced. Okay. Uh, my next question is uh, the same section A4. Where is the interior side and the inward side? And uh, would there be signage? Is that? So that is um, essentially between, so this is uh, the San Lorenzo River and maybe I'll, um, all right, I think I can explain this one without pulling that up. <laughs> That's the San Lorenzo River path. 
and it's in between the two um, trails, so on either mm -hmm. side of the river, so the inward side of that. And um, there are a number of signs out there, um, and um, we can we can look at that again. We want to make sure that it's clear for um, everyone for um, those who are looking for a place to sleep, that they have a good understanding, um, as well as the community members um, who are um, wondering where folks may or may not be allowed. Okay, uh, my next question, there's no A6, it skips from A5 to A7. Sorry, typo. Okay. <laughs> we've, we've, gone through, we've gone through a lot of versions of this as we're... I bet. Okay. Um, where is there a list of city-owned beaches? So the parks master plan actually identifies the city-owned beaches, and I can pull that up here. Um, so um, the city beaches include Mitchell's Cove, Its Beach, which is Dog Beach, um, Cow's Beach, and Main Beach. Okay. It does not include um, the um, uh, natural bridges or Seabright. Those are state-owned beaches, and for okay. state-owned, as we as we identified in the agenda report, for state-owned properties, if they're conducting state-owned businesses, business, the city has limited land use authority over them, and so um, we have uh, explicitly limited this to the city-owned beaches. But I think. Important to note, Lee, that the California State Parks does not allow camping on any of those sites. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, uh, same section A11. It states within the boundary of the city's downtown plan. Can you talk about that? boundary in relation to the bid, the BID district, to the business improvement district? So um, I don't know the exact boundaries of the business improvement district off the top of my head, but um, I think probably the easiest way to um, to call this out is to just pull up the map and it is, it's gonna be um, a, um, it's gonna be a- Is it different? Or is, and I guess that's my question. Are the, where is, are there differences? So there are differences, um, and some of those we captured as part of the language here in that, you know, the, uh, the downtown plan actually covers a little bit east of the river and a little bit north of water. And um, in some of those areas we excluded as part of this text. Um, let me open up, I'm gonna open up um, here, I'll, I'll just, um, Council Member, or Vice Mayor Bruner, do you, how many more questions do you have? I'm just curious. I have four more questions. Okay. I'm going to open the map here and that will give you an idea from the downtown uh, perspective and I'll zoom in on that. So this will give you an idea. Again, it's at a, a fairly large scale, but zooming in, you can get an idea. So water on the north side, um, capturing um, down to basically over to City Hall and then down around, um, uh, down that would be um, center and then looping over to Cedar and then over to the river, essentially, um, and then including parks. So you've got um, you know, San Lorenzo Park over here as a park that would be excluded. Okay, thank you. Um, section 6.36.060B, uh, and that is the um, section for, additional criteria. Mm -hmm. um, where are gray water dumping sites currently? So I believe the closest one um, is at the corner of uh, Soquel and um, Highway 1 at the, I think it's 
it's a, a 76 station right there. Um, there's a, a gas station at the, off the northeast corner of Highway 1 and SoCal, um, right back there near, uh, like on the side, uh, across from the hospital on the side uh, where Toys R Us yeah. used to be. Okay. That gas station right there, I believe, is the closest one. Yeah. I will also say that the city has been um, working on um, looking into whether or not an additional one can be provided locally as, as a resource for um, individuals who are, are living in RVs. And so um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to, to bring something else online that's um, more convenient because we recognize that is, you know, it's, it's not super far away, but um, it is also a, a burden to drive all the way across town, particularly if you've got a, a limited amount of funds. Okay. Um, and then in that same section, F, what is the definition of unreasonable amount of litter? So that was um, a good, good question. Um, that was one of the areas where we had um, community comments come in and we're actually recommending removing the unreasonable amount of litter and just saying okay. free from litter and debris. Um, and again, um, you know, we're, we're putting this out as a recommendation for the council to consider. Uh, we thought that that was good language, but you know, this is this is all up to the council's um, purview. Um, okay, and so that brings me to um, some of the uh, some of the the ordinances that we currently have and address the the disruptive and criminal behavior and activity already. And um, so in terms of the litter and, and debris and all of that, we have that currently. We have um, possession of stolen property. We currently have um, you know, illegal drugs, intoxicated in public, open container, urinating in public. Um, uh, Sidewalk obstruction laws. I, I, I'm, um, I'm trying to understand uh, why it would need to be additional in addition to. When, I, when I, go ahead. Sorry. I was just wondering if maybe that might fall into the deliberation section because I, I think maybe many council members might and I'm just trying to, um, is that a deliberation type of question, Tony, that we could get into with m much more discussion versus just sort of answering question, specific questions at this I time? Can, I can take a, a brief crack at it. Okay, go for it. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Mayor. Yes. Okay. Um, and I, and I, and the chief has, uh, Chief Mills has discussed this on m multiple occasions that in order to cite someone for littering, you either have to observe them throwing a piece of litter on the ground uh, or have a, uh, a witness to that sign a citizen's mm -hmm. arrest complaint. Mm -hmm. And this, this ordinance specifically um, addresses maintaining an encampment uh, with those conditions present. So there's a distinction. Um, you're right, we have some tools to deal with these types of sort of nuisance behaviors. Um, but in the context of an encampment, they're difficult to enforce unless you actually observe the person, um, you know, discarding needles, uh, littering, relieving themselves uh, uh, at a location. So that's what this is intended to address. Uh, thank you. That's it for now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Um, and I'm sorry to, to be the uh, time police, but I just want to make sure we can get as much public comment in as we can. Um, so I will go ahead and uh, start the public comment period. As I mentioned, um, there were 12 groups that requested these are organizations that requested um, additional time, which I was able to provide each of you with three minutes. If you don't need that three minutes, um, then please feel free to give back your time um, to anyone uh, behind you. So I'm gonna ask J.M. Brown um, with the 
uh, Parks and Recreation Committee, Ad Hoc Safety Committee to please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. There we go. Okay, there we go. Okay, I see you up. Um, J.M. Brown, uh, Bonnie, are you ready with the timer? Uh, you'll have three minutes, Mr. Brown. You are star nine to unmute. Okay, there. Mayor Myers, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, good evening, Mayor and members of the council. I'm J.M. Brown and I've served for the past two years as chair of your Parks and Recreation Commission. I sincerely appreciate the opportunity to address you this evening on behalf of commissioners who served on the safety committee mentioned by Mr. Elliott earlier. Those members are Vice Chair Jane Mio, Commissioner Jillian Greensight, and myself. Let me begin by saying how appreciative we are for the Parks and Recreation employees who shared stories with us about the impacts of dangerous and threatening behaviors they experience while working in our parks, open spaces, and facilities. Because some of that behavior has been exhibited by people living in encampments within our city parks, and because one of our key recommendations that was passed unanimously by the full commission called for greater clarity about rules pertaining to people living outside, we felt it was important to provide input this evening on the ordinance under consideration. Members of the committee support the purpose and intent of this ordinance as outlined in the resolution and specifically the ordinance's efforts to prohibit camping in our neighborhood and community parks. We believe it is a good first step, as Mr. Elliott said, toward providing more access for all users of our parks, improving the safety of our employees and providing more protection for our natural resources. We believe more work can and should be done in the future to support those goals outlined in our parks master's plan, namely to better protect our environment, including vital waterways and sensitive habitat areas from destruction as we have seen happen over and over again in places where folks have camped. Should the council be interested in expanding areas within our park system where camping would be regulated, including more of our open spaces that would be prohibited for camping, camping, the commission could certainly be a good venue for exploring recommendations to bring back to you in the future. Lastly, we, we recognize that any successful effort to address healthy outdoor living will include securing more low barrier sheltering options in our community, as is being addressed in the city's collaboration with the county. We appreciate that this ordinance tries to achieve a balance of providing places for people to sleep safely outside with places that remain accessible for all members of the community. Thank you for your time tonight and for your service to our city. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Uh, next up, I have Carol Polhamus with the Westside Neighbors and then following Carol, uh, Reggie Meisler with the Santa Cruz Democratic Socialists of America will be uh, right after Carol. So if you guys can queue up. And um, um, Mayor, if we could just have everyone not, I'm, I'm lowering everyone's hand, if they could just not raise their hand until okay. their, so their name is called. Please don't raise your hand until your name is called. Carol Bohemus. There she is. Okay, Carol, just star nine and then you can unmute. Please uh, put your hand down if you're not the person speaking right now. Can you hear me? Yes, we can, go ahead. Okay, great. I was on the phone and Zoom because I wasn't sure. <laughs> Sorry, so I shut the phone off. Um, Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council members and staff. My name is Carol Polhamus. I'm a retired educator and 40-year resident of the Lower West Side. Thank you for letting me speak on behalf of the West Side Neighbors. West Side Neighbors was established three years ago in response to a proposal for RV camping in the Delaware neighborhood. Our 1,000 plus members live primarily on the Lower West Side. Our membership is fairly evenly split between young parents of school-aged children and seniors with businesses, students, and others rounding out our group. Parents are very concerned about safety issues in our city parks and want their kids to be able to walk or bike to school safely. The ends of seniors voice concerns about not feeling safe to walk in their neighborhood. Our neighborhood is plagued with bike thefts, break-ins, drug dealing, a recent shooting at Garfield Park, a recent meth bust of someone living at the end of Delaware, to name a few. 
Neighborhood safety is definitely a priority. Parents want parks and rec programs for their kids and are concerned about recreation budget cuts, and seniors are concerned about budget cuts to city services. The Lower West Side has been significantly impacted by people living outside, resulting in environmental degradation of our open spaces and parks. Negative impacts include garbage, human waste, discarded drug paraphernalia, etc. A recent example was this weekend's cleanup of a chop shop in the Schaefer Road area, which yielded many stolen bikes and parts. This past summer, there were four camping-related fires, which caused serious concern. Santa Cruz has a greater per capita homeless population than San Francisco or LA. We know that many of our homeless suffer from chronic mental illness or drug addiction or both. Our governor describes our mental health system as a massive failure. What we have been trying to do clearly isn't working. We know the city has neither the legal mandate nor the funding for homelessness services, mental health or addiction treatment. All are the responsibility of the county which receives the funding to provide them. We're really happy to hear progress is being made in working with the county and asking for help from the state. We encourage the city council to insist that the county provide managed shelter and safe RV parking on county property with much needed services, particularly for those with chronic mental illness. We don't want tent or vehicle camping allowed in residential neighborhoods. We want our parks open for everyone's use. We can't spend our limited budget on the repeated cleanup of unsanctioned homeless encampments. We want an equitable approach so that the needs of the 2,000 homeless are balanced fairly against the needs of the 63,000 other residents in our city. We support this ordinance as a step forward toward restoring that balance. Thank you all for listening and for all the work you and the staff have done on this challenging issue. Thank you. Carol. Next up is Reggie Meisler, and again, just please press star nine to raise your hand, and then we will, you'll, you'll be ready to speak. Anyone else, please keep your hands down. I'm just gonna call the people who are scheduled to speak now. Go ahead, Reggie, thank you for being here. Hi, uh, this is Reggie Meisler. I'm speaking on behalf of the Santa Cruz chapter of the Democratic Socialists of America. We vociferously oppose this ordinance, and let's, really be real and re sort of frame how this is going. Just two months ago, while city council was on break, city manager Bernal, with the support of city staff, tried forcing through an executive order to sweep hundreds of people from San Lorenzo Park, despite knowing the conditions of frigid wind and rains uh, that they were throwing people into, despite knowing that there was no alternative shelter available, despite knowing that we were in a COVID lockdown, and despite knowing that the ICUs were full. Make no mistake, city staff knowingly delivered a death sentence to the campers at San Lorenzo Park. And it was only thanks to a coalition of activists throughout the co county known as Stop the Sweeps with the intervention of a district court judge, Susan Van Kulen, that city staff was finally forced to abandon their plan. This city staff, who so callously and recklessly worked to displace houseless people this past holiday season, are the same city staff who are now trying to draft this set of policies to reinforce their ability to do that same thing again. And while this ordinance claims to be informed by the more thoughtful work of the Community Advisory Committee on Homelessness, CASH, we have spoken to former members of CASH who do not approve of city staff using their name as though it were some sort of endorsement. While cash often focused largely on meeting the needs of the houseless community, the temporary outdoor living ordinance is far more interested in where houseless folks cannot be, what they cannot do, how best to legally allow police to continue displacing them, destroying their survival gear, and impounding the vehicles they use for shelter than it is in helping them survive. It shouldn't have to be said, but if a houseless person is in living in a public park, that does not mean that housed members of the community are now unable to use the park. Many residents continue to use San Lorenzo Park with children in spite of the large encampment that resides there. Bigotry is not an accessibility issue and the city should not treat it as such. One would hope that Black History Month might provide some much needed perspective on the notion of developing apartheid-like policies based solely on the bigoted fear of wealthier, whiter housed persons. 
But once again, here we are. Instead of city staff serving the needs of Santa Cruz's most vulnerable working class residents, they are instead asking the police to subvert our rights to soothe the nerves of some of the most privileged individuals in our community. In this ordinance, city staff argue that public lands have essentially been privatized through their use by the public. We instead argue that police have been privatized by Santa Cruz's wealthiest residents to target the houseless. The presentation by Parks and Rec was particularly nauseating, pure bigotry laced with false appeals to foul environmentalism. We hear time and time again. Thank you. Defund police, fund support housing. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Next is uh, Danny Drysdale with the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Go ahead, go ahead, Mr. Drysdale. Press star six to unmute and you will be ready to go. Hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. Okay, that's uh, Ms. Drysdale, thanks, Donna. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Danny Drysdale, I use she, her pronouns. I am the certain services program coordinator for the Harm Reduction Coalition of Santa Cruz County, speaking on behalf of our organization. As a public health-centered service provider that works closely with our unhoused community members in the city, um, we are very invested in the outcome of this discussion tonight. HRC SCC opposes this proposed ordinance wholeheartedly. We do not believe that giving the city police department more tools to criminalize people sleeping outside is going to positively impact any part of our community. In fact, we think it will lead to more negative outcomes, including more syringe litter, more fatal overdoses, and more infectious disease being spread. <clears throat> The broad strategy of making whole areas off limits for sleeping and living is unethical and unworkable. And the specific regulations proposed around camping that is quote unquote allowed in certain areas would be a disaster. I specifically want to point out that reference to quote improperly discarded hypodermic needles is extremely vague and would allow police officers to write citations based on their own interpretation of what quote improper disposal means. And we've seen firsthand how police officers and other city employees have claimed that used syringes stored in a proper and sealed sharps disposal container are somehow improperly disposed or stored or even considered litter. Furthermore, under the new state law AB 2077, any citation issued as a result of a syringe possessed for personal use would be invalid and could be challenged under that state law. Syringe possession is now fully decriminalized in this state and attempting to include syringe possession in this campaign ordinance opens it up to legal challenges separate from the ones about COVID, disability rights, and Martin v. Boise. There's been research done on syringe litter and the reasons that it occurs, and it's extremely clear that this ordinance would create more syringe litter. Santa Cruz County's uh, Health Services Agency 2019 report on syringe access <coughs> and litter showed that the two biggest factors that contribute to syringe litter are fear of police and lack of access to programs like ours. This ordinance would substantially increase the stakes for people to keep their syringes on their person in a sharps container, thereby incentivizing them to litter syringes elsewhere. Allowing people to remain where they are allows service providers like ourselves to consistently provide sharps disposal containers and collect those containers. Moving people from place to place makes it that much more difficult to find and provide disposal services for those people, and evidence shows that will increase syringe litter. Besides that, if we can't reach people with our services, they will not receive clean syringes or naloxone, leading to a strong chance of an increase in the spread of infectious diseases and fatal overdoses. If other service providers, such as a homeless person's health project, also struggle to reach those people, the negative health outcomes will be even greater. In short, it is our opinion that this ordinance is unethical and immoral, probably illegal in multiple ways, and would lead to worse health outcomes for the entire community, including an increase in syringe litter, fatal overdoses, and infectious disease. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Brent Adams with the Warming Center Program Footbridge Homeless Services. Please press nine on your phone to raise your hand. Brent, are you on? You could press star six to unmute. Um, I can't tell. Brent, are you on? What was that? I can't tell either. KB Foster keeps raising her hand. Brent Adams, are you able to get on tonight? Please sure. press star, there he is. Hi, Brent. Press star six, please, and we're all ready to go. 
Sorry for that. Hi, it's Brent. Can you hear me? Yeah, Brent, go ahead. All right, firstly, we encourage council persons to vote no on this proposal, but if one must vote yes, let it be a yes and. Um, admittedly, an 8 p.m. to 8 uh, a.m. tent camping uh, is vastly different than we had been enduring for many decades under that previous camping ban. But we're wondering uh, what has become of the city plans to establish the heat-funded jumpstart of a navigation center, let alone the interim shelter. There were several million dollars spent, right? Uh, where are the day service programs? Where even is the well-funded rhetoric of housing the chronically homeless? It all seems to have evaporated, and all we're left now with is a tent that must be broken down in the morning with nothing much else offered. Meanwhile, Warming Center Program established Footbridge Services Center, serving more than 800 discrete individuals with storage, a uh, thousand more with laundry, showers, donation materials, and device charging. Uh, we've transformed homelessness to something vastly more dignifying. You may know we've done this largely with our own, uh, uh, on our own without city or county help. Certainly the city has worked with us to remove a third of the trash of material from the Felka Street camps that existed for more than a year without complaint. We were only, uh, and were only removed for fear of river water rise. We've established the agreement camp in Harvey West that's been there in place for four months. The city has honored it with garbage, porta potties, and AFC weekly showers. Noting the amount of materials and the establishment of large encampments, we do understand the need for constraints. Though there have been new ideas implemented, including agreement camps and the possibility of non-profit -per uh, permitted transitional encampments. Yet where, here we are tonight with this proposal that would establish the ability to set up tents between eight and eight and bring those items into storage. If there are specific areas where people may set up camp, given our success with the Harvey West Agreement Camp, our nonprofit would like to discuss what shape that can take. Today, Supervisor Koenig and I visited the Agreement Camp. We witnessed many people enjoying the park, playing ball, hiking, etc. Relating to storage, we become highly trusted for the integrity of our work. It can be difficult to build trust within that population of those people who sleep outside. It's been our goal to vastly reduce the amount of materials people carry throughout the day and keep belongings safe at night. We'd like to work to help provide the best opportunity to provide such storage. But tonight we see the proposal as a legal exercise that a municipal corporation thinks it needs to engage in what, uh, but what of creative inventive thinking? Clearly what's missing here is the opportunity of local churches and nonprofits to operate managed camps that both the city and the county have obliged themselves to stage the city clearly has been failing at serving this population and, and uh, that it plays host to. This is the perfect time now to make a permit process for nonprofits and churches to share the load of this, our shared challenge. Please tonight consider adding a permit pro process for nonprofits to operate such encampments. Uh, thanks for this time. Thank you very much. Next up is Greg Pepping with the Coastal Watershed Council. And just press star six and you can start, Greg. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, Mayor Myers, Vice Mayor Bruner, Council and staff, good evening. My name is Greg Pepping, Executive Director of the Coastal Watershed Council. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on this topic and, and thanks for the leadership you're demonstrating and bringing this topic up. Thanks for going straight at this. The Coastal Watershed Council is in support of the ordinance. In this community, like in many river towns, in addition to people experiencing homelessness, the poorest housed people live right next to the river. And you won't hear many of their voices tonight. They're at their second job, their third job, or they're exhausted from those jobs and making dinner dealing with kids, et cetera. The Coastal Watershed Council is hearing from those families who used to use the Santa Cruz River Walk, that longest city park surrounding the San Lorenzo River. We hear that they don't feel safe. They don't feel comfortable. They do not demonize people experiencing homelessness. They just don't feel safe and they don't use that park. That's a park equity issue to consider that's not often included in this conversation. They don't matter more than people experiencing homelessness. They also do not matter less. Separate from seeing this through a parks equity lens, I have just three suggested clarifications or edits. The first one is in order for this to be successful, we need regulatory and operational clarity, which is what you heard as a reminder, a request from the Parks Director and the Parks, Parks and Rec Commission again today. 
now you, you know if you pass this after a second reading i think you have regulatory clarity what i mean by operational clarity is what's really going to happen on the ground we have a chief of police that has always been very direct with the u.s council even when it's what you might not want to hear we're fortunate and i think you need to hear the community needs to hear from the chief more details on what this is going to look like out in santa cruz it doesn't fix everything so what does it do really do we have the officers who will enforce this the overall resources the will are we truly going to see a shift into a proactive and reasoned enforcement of the new ordinance the second piece is about the outboard side of the levy you have the inboard side of the levy but not the outboard so from the path into the river but not outside and you're going to have tents right by the path and if you have tents by the path you're going to have tents and stuff in the path i continue to be amazed that we can't even keep the path clear i think it's a very basic low bar a, a test of our enforcement ability and will but i'd like to include the outboard side of the levy and then the third one is very specific the red map of prohibited areas has a gap that all um, not all of the San Leandro river is included some of it is but not all of it again regulatory and operational clarity number one the second is outboard side of the levy and the third is having all of the river in the prohibited areas the coastal watershed council supports the ordinance i think we can be pro river and pro human thank you for really for your leadership it really matters Thank you, Greg. Next up is Josh Peterson with the Ghost Riders Waterman's Club. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Press star six and you'll be, yeah. Thank you, Mayor and City Council for your energy and attention on this very important issue. My name is Josh Peterson. I'm president of the Ghost Rider Waterman's Club a local 501c3 nonprofit organization that has worked for the last decade to raise awareness of ocean safety in our community. Now we as a group strongly support this ordinance in order to protect our community and environment. Now whether you surf, swim, paddle, or walk on the beach, many of us in the community would agree that our beaches and ocean waters together are the true heart of Santa Cruz. However, today, through the uncertainty of camping ordinances, the city of Santa Cruz is actively contributing to the pollution of our beaches and ocean. By allowing homeless encampments to entrench, the city is unintentionally facilitating the buildup and concentration of trash, hazardous materials, and human waste that will eventually run into our ocean. There's no way around it. I don't think there's a single person on this call tonight who would, as an individual, knowingly pollute, not at all. We all love clean beaches and ocean waters, but by enabling homeless encampments to entrench, our city leaders enable gross pollution of our beaches. 11,000 pounds of trash collected along the San Lorenzo River a couple weekends ago, dumped by those living in homeless camps. By letting these homeless camps persist, the city is complicit in that massive level of dumping and pollution. Now on a summer day in July, when a nine-year-old junior lifeguard kid running on the beach with friends get stuck by a washed up hypodermic needle the city will also unfortunately be complicit in that horrific event and it sickens all of us that this has actually happened in the past and will persist with these encampments now none of our civic leaders here wish this pollution on our environment and ocean there's no way but mayor and council this is up to you now in a world of increasing pollution you can actually do something you can act to mitigate our problem locally by prohibiting homeless encampments and preventing their massive buildup and concentration of waste, you guys can keep our beaches and ocean beautiful and clean. So on behalf of the ocean community and ghost riders of Santa Cruz, all families and individuals who rely on clean beaches and ocean waters for physical and mental health, I urge you to ban homeless encampments, pass this ordinance, and protect the heart of Santa Cruz. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Denise Pan with the Santa Cruz People's Kitchen. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, um, my name is Denise Payan, and I'm speaking on uh, today on behalf of the Santa Cruz People's Kitchen. Uh, we are a loosely organized group of uh, about 15 to 30 volunteer community members who provide meals, supplies, and other essential services to our house's neighbors, and we are completely funded by donations. Our position on the ordinance, the outdoor living ordinance, is an 
is absolutely against it. Um, outside of its questionable legality, um, we'd, <laughs> um, we've determined that this ordinance undermines the humanity of our unhoused neighbors. One of the main points brought forth by Lee Butlers and Tony, Tony Elliott in their presentation is um, surrounding the issue of quality of life, bringing up trail riding, parking, and issues of safety. Um, however, this ordinance doesn't actually solve any of these issues, and not to mention that it undermines the quality of life of the individuals who are forced to live outdoors. Uh, they're going to be forced to face harassment, imprisonment, and increased indebtedness, and be put in a cycle of um, an increased cycle of poverty, addiction, and homelessness. Um, and I've also also wanted to mention a note on the disability provision. Not only does this not really do anything to help the people, the person who is disabled, or the people who are disabled. Um, it doesn't provide them with any resources, but simply gives them an extra 96 hours to move. Um, but it also doesn't change any rules around uh, the conditions of their movement. Um, another thing I would like to mention around that is, the, is that encampments actually provide safety and community, particularly for houseless women who depend on each other and who aren't forced to be alone at any part at, during any point of the day. I think that there are a couple of things that give us insight into what this ordinance is really about, and that is the criminalization of homelessness. Uh, the first reason is that there are no alternatives being provided. Um, instead, homeless people are expected to be shoved around like herd animals. And um, the other thing is that provisions such as camping on private pop property, so long as they are out of sight, really shows us that this is more about houses people being an eyesore than it is about their humanity or any kind of actual equity or um, change in resources or in the way that we handle things. It's really more about more policing. Um, I also wanted to note that um, one of the um, main people who helped write this ordinance and who is in staunch support of it is um, City Manager Bernal. And in a personal email that I got from him, he um, described that many of the indiv in individuals at the encampment in Ismesson to San Lorenzo Park are not actually homeless, but are there to access and use drugs and to party. Uh, clearly, homelessness is an issue that is a struggle, that is traumatic, that nobody would ever want to be there voluntarily, it, that nobody would ever want to be voluntarily in. Um, but our own city manager doesn't seem to have a grip on this idea. And um, in, additionally, in addition, the criminalization of homelessness has shown over and over again that it really doesn't do anything but make, make things worse. Um, it increases uh, people's indebtedness and um, systems of uh, cyclical, cyclical um, entry into, into, the, into the prison system. And for these reasons, SCBK um, yeah. urges me to vote against Agenda Item 25. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Norse, um, you are up. Press star nine, and you're ready to roll. Robert Norse, you're up. Robert Norris, are you there? Robert, I see your number, I believe. Press star six. If you're not Robert Norris, please put your hand down. Please press star six, Robert. Okay. I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can, thank you. All right, thank you. Can community solidarity regulate city council's bad behavior? The community has taken years to recognize it's not just compassion but common sense to take direct action to correct the city manager's mistakes. The Santa Cruz community finally knows it's wrong to harass, cite, arrest, fine, or jail folks for sleeping at night where they must. Yet that is the underlying message still of the new temporary outdoor living regulation ordinance, no sleeping. Chief Mills' drive away the desperate law is worse than the prior sleeping ban in many ways. It does not actually provide for specific safe places for homeless people to sleep outside or inside. Simply restrictions and punishments that can be imposed largely at will, unaccountable to the city council for 30 days. Not that the council has ever shown any interest in protecting the poor from police sweeps. It's the community that is mobilized to do that. Food Not Bombs, Black Lives Matter, Nomad, Homeless Outside in Santa Cruz, Cop Watch, Stop the Sweep, Santa Cruz Union of the Homeless, Huff, and a variety of other organizations who have spoken here tonight.
The law and the council provide no expansion of shelter, nor clear promise that the current COVID expanded shelter will be maintained. The so-called $20 fines for violations are actually $198 when you add in court costs. The penalty for sleeping in a park, so-called engaging in improper temporary outdoor living, has been increased to a misdemeanor for the second offense. That's jail and indeed possibly prison, something we thought removed at the recommendation of the city's own homeless issues task force 20 years ago. The law criminalizes possession of sleeping bags in so-called at-risk areas, you know, the areas city gentrification masters want homeless people gone from, like downtown, the beaches, the parks. The law ignores the catch committee's recommendations, as has been pointed out. Any law or set of police practices that criminalizes the poor in our community for necessary survival behavior is wrong, abusive, futile, costly, and presumptuous, particularly egregious in a pandemic. Courts in a series of decisions over the last three decades have recognized this in the Tobe, Icorn, Pottinger, Jones, and Martin versus Boise cases. Unfortunately, the only way this law will be dumped is if the community actively dumps it through direct action, scornful publicity, mutual aid, and legal challenges after your council rubber stamps it. Will that happen? Police may put up fences and city bosses issue orders, but it's up to us to decide whether the community will allow these actions to go unchallenged. And thank you to the community for hearing me. Robert. Next up is Joy Schindelek Decker from with Sanitation for the People. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And then you wanna press uh, star six to unmute. Go ahead, please. Hello. Hi there. Hi. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the, the mutual aid working group, uh, mutual aid group Sanitation for the People. Sanitation for the People is a mutual aid group working for sanitation and waste management services for all. We clean up and we work on system change so, so that people living without houses get basic services. We work from a non-judgmental harm reduction ethos. We oppose the proposed temporary outdoor living ordinance because it proposes very little to improve life for people living unhoused in Santa Cruz while increasing the burden on those residents exponentially and essentially further criminalizes homelessness. In addition, the exceptions for disabilities are shamefully inadequate. They put undue burdens on disabled people to get doctor's letters and are cruel in demanding that people move every 96 hours. I hope the letter of opposition from Disability Rights California is taken very seriously by the city and council members. What we have found working with the community living at Highway 1 and 9, helping residents with waste management weekly and on dumpster days, is that the reasons for garbage buildup are many. First, after months of no garbage collection at all, the buildup is overwhelming. Most people do try to keep things clean. Some people are not physically able to clean. Some garbage is the result of storm damage where tents and possessions end up abandoned and neighbors don't want to be accused of stealing when cleaning up. There's also a lot of well-meaning help from sympathetic community members that ends up as garbage that is no one's responsibility. People don't have access to laundry, which creates an enormous amount of clothing and bedding that ends up ruined and ultimately landfilled. If the goal is to prevent entrenchment in order to protect the environment, there are much better ways to do so. First and foremost, provide increased and adequate sanitation services, including toilets, hand washing stations, laundry and shower trailers, and garbage collection. The city and county have a responsibility to cooperate on funding these services. Why should the poorest people suffer because of this dysfunctional bureaucracy? Preventing entrenchment also prevents stability. And we know that people benefit from stability on so many levels. They have continuity of care with outreach workers. They can be found for second doses of the COVID vaccine. They can build community with each other and those who support them. They can be found by friends and family. They can rest and recover from physical and mental illness. They can access services where they are rather than having to expend enormous energy seeking out those services. Lack of stability increases physical and mental health issues, increased hunger and malnutrition, 
increases the likelihood of substance use disorders to cope with destabilization, increases loss of survival gear, personal possessions, and essential documents. Okay, I will end there. I have more to say, but thank you very much. Thank, thank you for hearing me. Thank you very much. Next up we have Captain Yoon Sahile with Stop the Sweets. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Go ahead, please. Should I assume that that's the person you authorized? Are you with Stop? Yasmin, are you with uh, Stop the Sweets? I think so. Yes, okay. I'm reading the, the, the statement on behalf of Stop the Sweeps. Got it. Great. Go ahead, please. Um, the grassroots movement Stop the Sweeps stands with our unhoused neighbors and against the temporary outdoor living ordinance. While the idea sounds positive for the city to supply a facility for unhoused people to store their belongings during the day, the issues of accommodations and accessibility arise. The ordinance refers to a reasonable quantity of daytime storage and the program being reasonably available in the city of Santa Cruz. The language is too vague and what is considered reasonable needs to be explicitly addressed for feasibility, like convenience of location. Also, while people with disabilities are exempt from moving their tents and belongings during the day, they still would have to move every four days. Breaking up encampments would make people lose contact with or have difficulty getting to their service providers. Nurses and social workers regularly visit encampments and would struggle to connect with, even completely lose touch with, the people for whom they provide care. Many unhoused people would be forced out of their current static spaces where they are more easily found during the day. They would also lose access to resources like community members and mutual aid groups who bring donations to encampments. This would cause irreparable harm to those who rely on those visits and supplies. Those who seek out services and resources would face a major boondoggle as they would have to prioritize packing up their space every day and setting it up every night and dropping off everything and picking it up every day. Furthermore, when people are scattered about, it becomes harder for the city to clean up because people aren't concentrated or allowed to stay in set places where sanitation resources, dumpsters, and regular trash pickup can be provided without giving people a consistent space during the day that has access to toilets, hand washing stations, and dumpsters, the issues would increase, become more dispersed, and therefore more difficult to deal with. There would also be an increased risk of harassment, violence, and even death when people who look out for each other in small communities are forced out of their spaces. In those communities, there's not only an increased prevention of harm, there's also a higher likelihood for intervention in case something does happen. People who choose to stick together in groups to look out for each other would have much greater difficulty continuing that practice when they can't stay put together. This disproportionately would adversely impact women, LGBTQ+, and people of color who are unhoused and have security with their camp neighbors. Finally, anyone who violates the ordinance twice in 30 days would be guilty of a misdemeanor. This would go against Martin v. Boise because it would make sleeping during the day in a tent illegal. In addition, people who prevent, delay, resist, obstruct, or otherwise interfere with any removal of personal property could get misdemeanors, which would be a violation of the First Amendment to freedom of speech and peaceful assembly. Instead of further criminalizing unhoused people, the city and county should stop neglecting their duties towards their own community members. The ordinance itself acknowledges the need to expand shelter capacity and very low income, long-term housing options, et cetera. Yet there's no transparency on how federal funding to Santa Cruz County through the Housing Action Partnership is spent and how it can be effectively used. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the last speaker and the extra time speakers is Serge Cagno with Stepping Up Santa Cruz. Please press star nine on your phone and raise your hand. Go ahead, search. Hold on, Donna, sorry. Yep. PowerPoint? Yep. Okay. Go ahead and unmute yourself, star six. Uh, does that work? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, hey, thank you for uh, taking the time to listen. Thank you for the patience that you guys have shown tonight. Uh, it's a long evening and I'll try to keep my uh, comments brief. Um, my name is Serge Cagno, uh, Stepping Up Santa Cruz. I have a resource directory. I was also on the CATCH 
um, and some of the materials that you guys were given in the packet uh, from the Safe Sleep Committee. I actually wrote those, so I just want to clarify one thing. Um, we did not support this uh, ordinance. Um, we said our first line of that, uh, if you go to the documents, uh, we do not support as written. Um, and we were doing the best we could. If it was to be implemented, we had some suggestions, but we were not supporting the document. So just to be clear on that one. Um, could you go to the next slide, Bonnie? Um, my sincere gratitude. That's two, there you go. My sincere gratitude and appreciation for Lee Butler, the amazing amount of work that everyone's put in trying to address the society's most complicated problem. There are a lot of good things that are trying to balance um, the life of people experiencing homelessness in this. Um, and I can't list them all. I can't list all of the inaccuracies either, um, including how funding works or the relationship with the city and the HAP. Uh, the short version is the city manager is a voting member of the HAP executive and general boards to decide how homeless funds get spent throughout the county. So trying to blame the county for not doing more um, is a misunderstanding of the city manager's office's authority with, as a voting member. Uh, for this um, um, ordinance, like let's tweak it in a couple ways. Um, it's true that there's a lot more no you can't and trying to just have a reasonable expectation for somebody who's trying to live within the ordinance. Um, we want to have clean and safe streets and we want to get people housed. Uh, can you switch to the next one, Bonnie? Really quickly, the issue is bathrooms. So right now they can't go downtown, they can't sleep downtown in the ordinance or in parks and that's where the bathrooms are. So my comment would be figure out how, where you're gonna put them so that they're not um, urinating and defecating outside because a lot of them don't want to. Uh, Bonnie, next slide. Um, disability is vague. Um, by legal definition, that includes mental health diagnosis and substance use disorder. So who is deciding which kind of disability is allowed? Uh, that needs to be clarified. And inclement weather, uh, raining or uh, heat. Next slide, Bonnie. Uh, to improve the ordinance, I would suggest uh, creating a design work group, setting up people for success who don't want to break the law, clear outstanding tickets for those working with a case manager for volunteering, working and receiving services, and find a nonprofit that will find funding to, ma they can find funding themselves to manage fiscally viable managed encampments on city owned lots. And that's it, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Serge. We'll now move on to um, comments from individuals. It's 8.16 and I'll go till 9.10 tonight with this. Uh, give a, try to give ourselves a full hour. I'm sorry, 9.15, 9.16 we'll go to. Um, if you're interested in commenting on this item, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you've been unmuted. The timer will then be set to one and a half minutes and I will be, um, stopping folks for right at that one and a half minute period of time. Uh, first up is KB Foster. Unmute your phone and please go. Thank you. Santa Cruz has patience. Your emotion makes you louder, which means you get heard. We don't need to pretend money value the homeless, please. We just need to value them. We do this by loving them like a child because more often than not, not getting that is why they are acting out. They are acting outside of themselves. That's what homelessness is. That's the truth. The problem we have with that, well, it's hard to hear. It affects. The math is more. It inflames the nation. Growing pains don't need pain medicine or opiates. That isn't working. Why? Because you're ignoring the roots, the feelers, the feelings, the sensitives. Don't be scared of the homeless. They simply have the anti-serving genes. 
What a nerve. So corporations don't like them. Well, then it's our job to show them love. Thank you, my name is Bryce Foster. My phone number is 831-331-7016 if you want to work with me. Next up is Brandon Dallas. Please press star six to unmute your phone. Yeah, sorry about that. Didn't know I was going to be up so quick. Um, so just to get it out, right out of the way, I'm a hard no on this one. I really urge you guys to vote no on this ordinance. I really appreciate how articulately some people have spoken to it. Um, I'm probably not going to be quite so articulate. Um, <clears throat> but, I mean, really, you're trying to strike a balance here. That's the claim. But as far as I can tell, the things that you're trying to strike a balance between are people need to live and to have a place to live. And on the other hand, people need to not be near poor people. And that's not something that, that that's not balancing. You know, like you can't put people's need to live on the scale. It's just ridiculous. I, uh, I'm a little angry. I'm very disgusted. I think you guys need to like take a look in the mirror, check in with God or whatever, do some meditation because this is really pretty foul in my opinion. And uh, I'll yield my time. Thank you. Next up is phone number ending in 6278. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, this is Laura Lee Martin. Um, I'm a 30-year resident of Prospect Heights, and I've submitted a letter, so I'll keep this very short. Um, I support passage of the ordinance with a request for an amendment to designate De La Viega Park off limits, all of the park, all year. There is no fire season anymore. And I'd suggest we also look at Poganip the same way. This request for an amendment is based on three things, fire safety. I'm from Paradise, California and very aware of the risks that we have here. I'm a co-founder of Firewise and Prospect Heights. We've had numerous fire events over the years in this neighborhood, and we worked with the fire department to help clear out the underbrush. Any camping in this park creates a tremendous liability on the city for potential firestorm that will easily inundate adjacent neighborhoods. It's the uh, wildland urban interface concern. We also, another important one is armory. We, the neighbors really supported the armory use for the um, homeless. We um, worked with you when you wanted to extend the use and extend the time of that use and increase the um, population. And during that time, the city explicitly assured us numerous times that no camping or homeless would be permitted outside of the camp, um, the compound of the armory. So this is, um, unless the entire park is off limits, then that promise is being broken. And last, I would say that public safety, I no longer feel safe on any of the trails up in the De La Viega area or even on my street out front. Finally, thank you all for taking this extremely complex issue on, many layers, and thank you for sending your letter to the governor. Thank you. Next up is Tiffany Worthington. Hi, thanks so much for this discussion. Um, just real quick, I have you know three three requests um, on behalf of Santa Cruz citizens whose homes border the levee. My request is that the camping not be allowed on the I think it's called the outboard area um, behind our homes, um, such as Riverside Avenue. In my experience as a resident here along the levee, the hours between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. are not often used by campers for sleeping, but more often for drug dealing, screaming obscenities, drumming, loud music, fighting, and using our front and backyards for vomiting and defecating. I mean, this is like nightly, it's serious. And anybody who doesn't realize it clearly doesn't live next to it. Um, so that's one request, not allowed it, allowed, uh, camping in the outboard um, or, you know, in the home side of the path. Uh, the levy. And then number two, um, you know, to address the health hazard that is this uncontained human waste, which is very serious for both homeless people and for anyone else, 
I propose um, there's these really cheap, it's so it's so easy. We could, um, there's cheap, environmentally friendly, um, uh, temporary mobile compost toilets. They're easily easy to assemble. Um, you know, we did it during the wildfire uh, in areas like Last Chance. And there's hand, wash hand washing stations known as tippy taps. Really, uh, really, really easy. And we should definitely put them up and um, people should have a place to go to the bathroom. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I just want to remind people that if you do want to speak, um, you should raise your hand so that we can tell that you're part of the queue. Beth Prentice is next, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, uh, thank you for having this open forum. So. Um, Similar to the last caller, yeah, the people who are opposed to this seem to be very out of touch with how these encampments are being used. I also live on Riverside. I have an encampment literally on the other side of my back fence, and I'm not a wealthy landowner gentrifier. I'm a social worker and educator. I rent, and I'm just trying to feel safe. I don't feel safe walking around my neighborhood. I heard one of the people opposed talking about people being like queer women. I am a queer woman and I've been harassed walking with my partner uh, with homophobic comments coming from people from the encampment. Um, I feel unsafe as a woman walking past groups of men who have also made comments to me. And then there's just the garbage. There's people defecating right behind my fence when there are bathrooms nearby. And so there is shouting, there is cussing, there is loud music all day long. People are not using the hours of 8 a.m to 8 p.m. for the most part to look for jobs in the encampment behind my house. So these people who are opposed are talking about the exceptions that are actually proving the rule that what's going on is enabling drug use and crime. And so I just ask that the city council stand up for um, community members who are trying to keep this community alive and contribute and stop enabling the drug use. And I'll give up the rest of my time. Thank you. Is KB. Please press star six and you can speak. Hi, I'm Kay. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. Okay, so I just want, I, I've noticed that a lot of people have been like thinking and kind of like clearing and chat, clapping that you guys have brought this ordinance to the table. But honestly, I. This really reads like you guys like use like a single brain cell like in a ping pong video game to make this ordinance up. Like it doesn't, as people have said, it's definitely punitive action that's like just going against folks that have been dealing with a very, very difficult year. So let's like summarize a little bit of what Santa Cruz has been going through in the last year and the news at least, not even on homeless situations. So we had earlier in the summer with Santa Cruz folks on the boardwalk sitting on like folks' food and not actually letting them be able to sell stuff. And then we had, again, follow up with Bernal and trying to get encampment out. You follow up with the fact that there was a California fire that definitely put a lot of people out of housing, which Santa Cruz actually stepped up and actually did something. And then that all kind of went away when everything seemed to settle. Like, I don't understand how we have folks who have been in these positions and these roles of power, and you finally have the chance to do something, and you're giving us a maybe we can assess it, like, yet again. Like, you didn't think maybe we should work with the current homeless program and, like, see what we could do together? Like, that in no thought, head empty. I'm very, it just makes me, like, very upset that, like, people's money are going into your pocket. Like, it's, why are we paying you for this? It makes me very upset. <laughs> Please. Thanks. Next is Sabrina, Sabina Holber. Please press star six, six, excuse me. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great, thank you. I wanna state something really obvious. The solution for houseless individuals is to actually house them and not criminalize them. Everybody in your presentation kept talking about how this won't so solve homelessness or houselessness, and we all agree on that issue. Um, so I wanna know what the council is actually doing to solve th these problems. Um, for instance, you said that there's 401 beds available now. That is a laughably small number for the amount of houseless 
houseless individuals that are here. The fact that it was 155 beds pre-COVID is ridiculous. So I really want to see what the council is going to do to expand the beds. The other thing is that you put up these photos of trash and debris to shame houseless people, but I have a home and I have trash service. And if we had trash service, maybe we wouldn't have those many issues. And just shaming people for not having a place to put their trash is really wrong. The needle issue that was shown would be greatly helped by a fully funded needle exchange program. I was looking into this issue and Renee Golder is personally suing to stop that program. So I would like to ask that she recuse herself from this vote due to conflict of interest. You guys know there are real problems and just banning houseless people from public spaces is not solving it. Um, I also wanna mention that I've lived on the West Side for years and I've never heard of the West Side Neighbors Group that spoke earlier. Represent me or my neighbors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is Stacy Fall. Okay. Star six. Go ahead, please. Can't hear you. Please press star six and you should be unmuted. Are you there, Stacy? Go ahead, you're unmuted. Bonnie, is there anything I should be telling her to try to do differently? No, she's unmuted, so there's something on her end. Oh, wait. Are you there? Stacy, I'll come back to you. I don't know why you're, we can't hear you. You're unmuted, but I, we can't hear you. Let me come back to you. Um, next is Mars. What the heck? Oh, there you go. We heard you. The host just muted you. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead. Hello? Hello? Yep, we can hear you, Stacy. Hello? Yep, we can hear you. Okay. Will you, Mayor Myers, will you give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Because I, I can't hear you, so I'm not sure you can actually hear me. Yep. Great. Okay, good. Uh, before we start, there's two of us here on the same computer. Can we both have time on this computer? You have one and a half minutes. I can't hear you, but I'll just assume that was a yes. Okay. <laughs> one and a half minutes. Um, one minute. <laughs> only one person, and then I have to get back in the queue for my husband to speak as well? Yep. Okay, so I'm just going to start my time. Hopefully I haven't eaten up my whole minute and a half. Um, okay, I, my name is Stacey Falls. I actually just bought a house at the corner of Riverside and Broadway about a block away from the San Lorenzo encampment. And, and I bike through San Lorenzo Park every single day, and I know that there are some problems with the encampment, but unequivocally, I am opposed to this ordinance. I was opposed before I heard the presentation tonight, and then I heard the presentation tonight, and it's such a confusing ordinance. Like, if I want to camp someplace because I'm homeless, I have to consult with a meteorologist to know what the weather conditions are, and then I have to consult with some, like, biological expert who can tell me if the Ohlone beetles are having a mating season right now, and then I have to take a tape measure with me to make sure I'm 75 feet away from the trail. I mean, it's crazy. And all we're doing is basically trying to work around Martin v. Boise to continue the camping ban. And I have lived in the city for decades, two decades, and we've had a camping ban most of the time I've been here, and it has been an abject failure. It has been a failure to the people who sleep outside. It's been a failure to the people who are who live in the neighborhoods who are impacted by all of the negative impacts that were described in the presentation. And it overwhelms our criminal justice system with, you know, just endless cases of people who can't pay their fines. They're just trying to find a place to sleep outside. So criminalizing homelessness is a problem because it disrupts community, it disrupts the ability for social workers or folks 
I think I'm cut off. I can't hear anything anymore, but I guess I'll go back into the queue so my husband can speak. Vote no, please. It's not good for the, for the entire city. Okay, next up is Mars, please. Press star six to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, I'm here to read a letter from the ACLU. The ACLU of Northern California condemns the increased regulations targeting unhoused individuals in Santa Cruz and urges the city council to reject a proposal to establish ordinance number um, 2021 amending chapter 6.36 currently entitled camping and hereafter entitled regulations for temporary order living of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code. Numerous courts have iterated the rights of unhoused people seeking necessary shelter and in the middle of an unprecedented pandemic that has already devastated local economies and exasperated poor living conditions, bearing individuals from sheltering is not only inhumane, but will lead to catastrophic health risks. And while the ordinance language suggests that it abides by Martin versus City of Boise, this is not true. By criminalizing the act of sleeping through strict prohibitions, the ordinance likely violates the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution under Ninth Circuit precedent. The city of Santa Cruz has historically and continues to target unhoused populations despite an expansion of shelter capacity. Limiting unhoused individuals' ability to seek shelter will only further escalate the public health crisis, especially when they are forced to move from location to location. Additionally, it places an increased mental and physical burden on individuals who are already struggling to find a warm and safe place to sleep during the winter months. A number of the Hunt House population are families who have been displaced from the recent fires, having lost any stability from one cat catastrophe to the next. Prior attempts by the city of Santa Cruz to manage un unsheltered homelessness via ordinances targeting a ban on sleeping in public has been deemed unconstitutional and ineffective. Today's ordinance is similarly problematic in that it will fail to address and mitigate the environmental and social impact of encampments that city leaders are touting. Thank you. Next up is Nancy Cruz. Press star six. Press star, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Yep. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm Nancy Cruz, so I've been a, a lot of years, uh, volunteer for years in homelessness programs, um, I oppose this ordinance because it criminalizes homelessness, denies stability and security, and offers nothing beneficial. I feel it's your job to represent all of us, and this ordinance does not. It's destabilizing. Individuals are to take down and set up a camp every day. This city should not require that of anyone, much less elderly and disabled people, a large portion of our homeless community. We know it's stability that encourages health and healing and community building. This ordinance is unreasonably complicated and will lead to increased encounters with the judicial system, with the justice system, yet we know encounters with law enforcement produce profoundly negative consequences for homeless individuals. That's one of the primary reasons the public asked for and demonstrated to you the value of programs like CAHOOTS. However, this proposal goes in the opposite direction, will mean more overtime for police, create more trauma and more cost. It contains so many caveats and exceptions that people will struggle to know where to be any day, store and unstore their belongings and return for Thank you very much. Next up is phone number ending in 1229. Hi, my name is Madison, and I've been a resident of Santa Cruz for five years. I am calling to urge you all to oppose this ordinance. It's honestly, it's hard for me to believe I even have to make the case for this. Curtailing the right of the unhoused to seek shelter at the height of a pandemic is breathtakingly cruel, and you all know that. The problem is that most of you lack the courage and the political will to enact real solutions to homelessness in Santa Cruz. Mayor Myers, you wrote to the governor asking for assistance only to look like you were doing something. The fact that you would bring forth this ordinance, which further criminalizes homelessness and deepens the cycle of poverty among the unhoused, shows that you don't really care. What you care about is pushing the homeless out of sight and out of mind to placate wealthy residents and businesses. In a recent Sentinel article, Ben Shiro, a man who was homeless in Santa Cruz for 15 years, 
told his story about how he built up $15,000 in debt from homelessness-related citations. His story is not uncommon. It is the norm in a city that ruthlessly criminalizes being unhoused. So please explain to me, how will increasing citations and fines for seeking shelter lift the unhoused out of a cycle of poverty and end the crisis in Santa Cruz? If you can't answer that question, I implore you to vote no on this ordinance. Thank you. The next caller ends in numbers 1657. Press star six to unmute. There you go. I'm Anna Brooks. I changed my testimony after going through the public correspondence because of my disillusionment by many comments on both sides of the issue. I saw no mention of what I perceive as the elephant in the room. Santa Cruz needs a permanent homeless shelter, but the Santa Cruz community doesn't want to put one anywhere. The community says it wants to help the unsheltered, but as far as I'm aware, what's when specific locations are proposed, the sentiment continues to be, oh no, don't put it there. But the Martin v. Boise decision was nearly two years ago, and the Supreme Court denied the hearing the case later that year. People can say what they want. The decision stands. If shelter space isn't available, preventing camping becomes highly problematic. With a heavy heart and great hesitancy, I support the ordinance. But let me be clear why. The Santa Cruz community has failed to come together and agree upon where to put a permanent shelter. If enough camping occurs in residential areas, perhaps residents will be compelled to advocate more productively for a location for a permanent shelter. It will cause a great deal of pain for all, especially our unhoused. But I do consider residential areas sure seem safer to me than places like Poconip and De La Viega for more reasons than I have time to outline here. Thank you. Next up, I have caller ending in the last four digits, 5754. Please press star six. Hello. Dear Mayor Myers and City Council members, my name is Deborah Elston. I support this living, outdoor living ordinance, and I'm calling you to speak for the seniors who live on Dakota, across the street from the San Lorenzo Park. They are essentially living next to a nuisance property. Here they are living in their enjoyable twilight years. Some actually chose to live in this location because of the quietness, the convenience to downtown shopping, and a senior community. Now they are lucky if they get to sleep through the night or even feel safe. They are living across from a nuisance property. If there was an ordinance like this, this would have never happened. One senior described that she couldn't even get her dinner delivered one night because the person delivering the meal didn't even feel safe delivering to that address. The park and all it brings with it, partying, drug dealers, a goat, and a boat mental illness, selling drugs, noise all hours of the day and night, and the safety of walking for groceries has been a daily challenge for these seniors. They should not have to deal with all this activity. It's exhausting for them. You, as a council, can change the situation. Please pass the temporary outdoor living ordinance and let's support regulations that help our whole community. Thank you very much for your time. Next up, we have phone number ending in 2885. Um, hello, Mark Lewis, a longtime resident of Santa Cruz. A virtual process where the public is barred from in-person participation has to be addressed before this item is allowed to go forward to a vote. The homeless, whom by and large do not have the requisite connectivity, digital literacy, or digital tools to vigorously defend themselves have been disenfranchised by the virtual process, unable to be heard, made invisible, as if their voices do not matter. 
consequently a point of further litigation as well testimony to a council refuting participation by all whom live in Santa Cruz. I am requesting on behalf of the homeless whom reside in the city of Santa Cruz that the council hold on any further action on this item until such time that the council chambers or suitable alternatives are opened to in-person participation. This concludes my statement. Thank you. Ending in one one five zero. Hi, can, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, this is Kelsey Hill. I'm calling to urge that the leaders on this dais vote no on item twenty five. I, of course, understand calls for environmental protection and safety, but this ordinance as drafted only serves the interests of people who have the privilege of being sheltered at this perilous time in our history, and it does not solve the crises that it claims to. Lee Butler himself over and over again noted that this is not a solution. This ordinance does nothing to mitigate the stressors on those who sleep outside, and it only amplifies them. Could any of you on this dais break down and set up your possessions in such a routine and also work toward being rehoused and employed? We're also in a pandemic that's killed half a million people across this country and 172 people in our county from a virus that disproportionately impacts vulnerable groups, including unhoused people. Dispersal policies don't work, and they threaten an individual's ability to distance, sanitize, and practice other methods of slowing the spread of COVID-19. Moreover, this ordinance only further, further pushes people experiencing houselessness to the margin and makes it more difficult for them to recover from cycles of trauma, addiction, or mental health issues. Human first approaches are more effective and more cost efficient in the long term, and I know all of you know this on the dais. Meanwhile, criminalization is expensive. In Colorado, six cities spent over $5.1 million enforcing camping vans from 2010 to 2014. And in 2021, Denver can't even calculate what it has spent on sweeps and enforcement, but even the conservative estimates are not pretty. And that doesn't even touch on the threat of lawsuits that Council Member Cummings mentions. I cannot for the life of me fathom how Bernal and staff think this is a good idea. Thank you. Next up is uh, number 1810. Press star six, please. Yeah, I'm scared, Philip. It feels like old times. The adoptive grievance mongers are back. What a country. I mostly endorse, but would like to see further improvements to the ordinance insofar as the ordinance essentially seems to give permission for a near permanent outdoor nightmare, excuse me, nighttime camping on private property in a very high density number and on public streets, sidewalks, and residential neighborhoods at night. The era of people squatting wherever they like, however they like, for as long as they like, and any numbers they like, should come to a close in our small, somewhat politically confused city. It's a big country with a lot of opportunity, and I see no positive purpose that Santa Cruz should be the county dump and caretaker for unlimited homeless individuals doing what some do now. As to the details of the ordinance, quote, as expressly authorized in the yard of a residence uh, with the consent of the owner or occupant of the residence where the camping is in the rear yard, et cetera, is an uh, acceptable camping area for one person seems defined as 12 by 12 feet. Does that mean in my 50 by 50 backyard like mine theoretically permits 16 to 17 people to camp in a willing backyard unless they violated other sections? You should go further in defining what residential zoning districts might allow what density limits are to be for private property, residential area, backyard camping, which should be far less than that. There are the same, these are the same types of homeless camping densities rejected by thousands of city residents when the city proposed camps in neighborhoods not long ago. Okay, thank you. Bye. Next up is phone number ending in 1018. 1018. A star six. Press star six, we can't hear you yet. Phone number ending in 1018. Okay, we can't we can't hear you. Oh. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, you can. Hi, my name is TJ Demos, and as a West Side Santa Cruz homeowner, I urge you to reject this anti-homeless ordinance, which clearly undermines and attempts to circumvent Martin versus Boise and CDC guidelines contra 
Lee Butler's presentation, the confusing ordinance with its Byzantine maps of prohibition and preposterous demands for continual packing up of one's belongings, especially harsh on disabled folks, will only add to the worst of Santa Cruz's policies of intolerance, fee and fining, policing and criminality, targeting and exploiting the most vulnerable, also the most racially diverse of our community, without, of course, including any of them in the discussion. An MB ordinance which favors endless evictions over compassionate services comes from a place of cruelty and is only counterproductive. In the spirit of health and all policies, I urge you to reject the outdoor camping ban. It's clear that Santa Cruz City and County are lacking in available shelter for people suffering houselessness. The cold-hearted ordinances like this uh, do nothing but harm the most exposed, criminalizing them with citations when they have nowhere to go, ticketing them when they have no money to pay, and destroying their possessions when they have nothing else, and weaponizing discriminatory environmentalism against them, as in the highly biased images and info and fear-mongering presented by Lee Butler and Tony Elliott. The failed police approach of enforcing itinerancy to prevent so-called entrenchment is not only heartless and mean, it's illegal and un Unconstitutional. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next up is Gabriel Cohn. Please press star six. Yeah, hi. I just want to keep this short. I also oppose the campus ban. I, I think criminalization is not a solution. It's not going to change the fundamental realities that are causing people to live outdoors. Um, I was thinking about this is being very similar to my job as a teacher right now. We're dealing with kids who are dealing with a lot of crises and traumas of while well, dealing with uh, schooling online. And simply yelling at them or failing them doesn't accomplish the goal of helping further their education. Uh, instead, we try to find ways to meet them where they're at and help them create a new and perhaps different path forward uh, so that they can actually have some success uh, in schooling. Likewise, punishing someone uh, further for their lack of resources is not going to magically help them find housing. Um, and I would instead urge the city to consider ways that we can redirect funding away from criminalization towards solutions to actually help those in need. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is phone number ending in 7343. Hello, as a working class resident of Santa Cruz who's experienced bike theft, a car break-in, and an assault on the riverfront, I encourage the city council to vote yes and adopt these ordinances immediately. What I see in Santa Cruz does concern me when it comes to homelessness, but by and large, the behavior perpetrated by the, the homeless are not good for the community at large, especially families and children. We need to take them into account when we consider how we approach this very difficult issue. I'd also like to draw the council members as well as the community's attention to a recent podcast YouTube video by a homeless advocate named Theo Henderson called We the Unhoused. Uh, it's episode number 40 and it's focused on Santa Cruz. In the video, he interviews a number of residents of San Lorenzo Park and other encampments. None of these people are from Santa Cruz. All of them have obvious mental health and drug dependency issues. I think we need to stop encouraging more people to come to Santa Cruz with these type of issues so that we can focus on the people who want and need help. Our budget and resources are limited. We need to focus them appropriately. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Next up is a phone number ending in 4656. Good evening and thank you very much. My name is Father Joseph Jacobs. I'm the program manager for the Association of Faith Communities Safe Parking Program. Uh, Association of Faith Communities is a local nonprofit based here in Santa Cruz and we are a coalition of over 30 faith-based communities in Santa Cruz and Santa Cruz County. I just want to take this opportunity to thank everyone who is working so hard to solve this illness. And I do believe it is a social collective illness. And I believe we cannot legislate our homeless away. 
and they are our homeless, despite the cynical views of some. We must embrace, nurture, and heal our common illness called homelessness. I have done my homework on statistics for people in the safe parking program. Over 60% of them are from Santa Cruz. Nearly 80% are from Santa Cruz County. This notion that we are attracting people from outside of Santa Cruz because it's fun to live on the street or, or camp or something is specious. I'm encouraging and asking everyone to be more compassionate, not less. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is ending in phone number 2279. You should be able to speak. We can't hear you. We're, are you unmuted? We, you look unmuted. Hi there. Can you hear me now? There you go. Yep. Great. Um, thanks. Hello, my name is Graham Edwards. I live just a few blocks from San Lorenzo Park, and I would like to urge the council to vote no on item 25. Earlier speakers have stated that this is not uh, criminalizing houseless folks, uh, but the outlined ordinance would functionally criminalize and punish and terrorize homeless people. I implore you to allow my homeless neighbors and community members to shelter and to actually invest in truly affordable housing rather than veiled luxury development. Also, as a climate and earth scientist, I would like to speak to some of these concerns of habitat destruction. The landscape lawns of these green space parks are not natural ecosystems to the Santa Cruz area. The argument appealing to natural habitat destruction are moot as the natural habitats are already destroyed. These fabricated landscapes may as well be used for a common good, providing a living space for community members. Also, with respect to concerns for mountain bikers, uh, these are the greatest destroyers of natural landscapes, these mountain bikes, and it is a hobby for the extremely wealthy. And the majority of Santa Cruz residents, such as myself, live much more financially close to losing our apartments and becoming homeless than to pleasure riding on our multi-thousand dollar mountain bikes. Uh, I hope you will give as much attention to our hopes for our community as the wealthy class you seem so attuned to. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Gail McNulty. Please press star six. Hi, thank you so much. Um, I am a white mother of three children, um, two of whom attend Midland High School in the city of Santa Cruz during non-socially distanced time. I'm also an anti-racist climate advocate. Um, as a Bonnie Doon resident, I was displaced for a month and a half this summer, so I'm well aware of the complications of the urban wildlife interface. Um, that said, I oppose this ordinance in part because it continues a message that poverty is a crime and should be hidden, when in fact poverty is an inexcusable repercussion of the same failing economic system that's destroying our ecosystems and our children's shared future. As a parent, I believe it's time we start modeling for our children how to use creativity, compassion, and courage to solve this difficult problem. And I'm afraid that this ordinance fails to do all of these things. Um, I really do think that, well, I believe everybody in this discussion um, has a desire to do the right thing. The proposal being proposed here is completely failing to do that. So we're, this is the end game, guys. We are living, we are witnessing the end of the time as we know it and we need to reinvent the future. We need to do it with much more creativity, compassion, and courage than what's being proposed tonight. So thank you so much. Thank you. Next up is uh, phone number ending in 4257. You press star six, you should be able to unmute. If you press star six, you should be able to unmute. We can't hear you. 
There you go. Hello. Hello. Oh, we hello. can hear you. We can hear you, but you have an echo. I think we did. Is that better? Uh, yes, you need to turn down your TV if you have your TV on. Yes, here we go. It's still a little bit hard to hear you, but we can hear you better now without the echo. No. Bonnie, help me out. Are we, should we tell her to turn off her TV or what's the best way to do this? Are we better? There we go, a little bit. I'm sorry, we can't hear you. I don't, uh, I don't think it's her TV. I think maybe it's just her connection. Okay. It just, Yeah, we can't hear you. Could you call back in? Well, yeah, we can't hear you, unfortunately. We can't hear anything. I'll write her number down, Mayor. So okay. she wants to call back in. Thank you. Next up is phone number 8883. Press star six, please. Hi. Hi. Hi there. Hi, my name is Tristan Rue, and I've been living downtown Santa Cruz for the past 25 years and I'm calling to support the ordinances that will regulate outdoor living and vagrancy in Santa Cruz. Um, I am supporting this ordinance because it will help create a city that is safe and healthy for all of its citizens, including the homeless population. I want a city where the environment and our parks are protected and our resources are taken care of. Right now, there are many areas in Santa Cruz that are no longer accessible to the general public because they have been taken over by permanent campers. This includes San Lorenzo Park, the Levee, Harvey West Park, Poganup, and many areas downtown. Because we live downtown, we see on a daily basis the problems associated with these unmanaged encampments. There are many incidents that occur in front of our houses. Um, there are fights, theft, overdoses, and we're needing to call 911 three to four times a month. Just last week, I had to call 911 because I was threatened while going on a run on Laurel Street by a homeless man under the influence who threatened to kill me. My husband is a Santa Cruz City Parks worker, and he and his coworkers have had incidents of being attacked when they're trying to clean up parks. They have been stabbed by improperly discarded needles, been verbally harassed, and threatened when asking campers to move out of playgrounds and bathrooms. Please support the ordinances. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up is phone number 9869. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Bennett Hopkins. I've lived in Santa Cruz for five years now, and I oppose this measure. Um, just hearing about it, I'd like to ask, if you want people, people to move, where are they really supposed to go? Because looking at the map that was put up, they basically just blocked off every area that you could realistically camp and still have access to a bathroom a convenience or grocery store, I don't know, any kind of facilities that you may need to live. Um, these people aren't camping outside because they want to, they are because they have to, they've been forced out of their previous living situations. Uh, all of the surveys referenced in the presentation uh, also show that the majority of the homeless people in Santa Cruz are from Santa Cruz. They are and still are they are and were our neighbors. Um, I think we need to remember that. And this ordinance is not doing, is not really acknowledging that. It's just a punitive 
it's just a punitive measure. It really only seeks to make people's life outside harder than it already is. Um, I really urge you to oppose it. Um, I think that this is just incredibly wrong. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is, it looks like just one Taj. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor Myers and council members. I'm going to speak as fastly, uh, quickly as I can. Um, so I'd like to echo uh, council member Cummings' uh, comments about potentially getting sued. I think I think that it, it should be taken with a lot of weight. That that sounds about right to me. Um, I'd like to say to the general community that I feel like this ordinance coming up right now is to deal with um, like nuisance and unsafe encampments, um, which which do exist. They're, they're not uh, every homeless or houseless person, but there are places where um, it, it's getting pretty bad. Um, and so I think this, I'm assuming this is an attempt to deal with that. Um, and also, um, as we've seen in the past, uh, some of these encampments do just get bigger and bigger um, and get more out of control. Um, all right, however, that said, I'm not sure if this is the way to do it. Uh, camping ban, uh, in the daytime, you know, it's, it's just like what other calls have said. It's going to move people around a little bit too much. I, I don't know if this is the right way to go about um, getting those particular things done. However, um, I also know that it's, it, legally it's very limited in what tools there are for our local government to actually deal with some of the issues that are arising in, and in terms of balancing everyone's needs, people that are in houses, people that are not in houses. Um, and that's what we have to do as a community. Uh, let's see, also people that are just coming to these meetings now, there's actually a lot being done. Oh my God, okay. <sighs> Gosh, I'm sorry, we had short, just short time. <laughs> Apologize for that. Um, next person up is 7003. I am really tired of hearing this narrative about the folks in Santa Cruz. Uh, the homeless folks are all are from Santa Cruz and all are, they used to be our neighbors or are still our neighbors and that they, <clears throat> excuse me, um, couldn't possibly, wouldn't possibly choose this lifestyle. But don't believe, don't believe me. Let's hear it from somebody that was interviewed by Robert Norse on his radio show. Hang on. <laughs> You caught that. He's now come, he's only he's a vagabond. He ended up in Santa Cruz uh, because he's a free spirit, and he just decided to stay uh, because they weren't going to clear the camp. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, it looks like we've got um, maybe eight more people to go, and then we we'll we will be stopping um, public comment right at 9:16. We've got phone number 4931. Indian 4931. Go ahead. Hey, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hey, this is Rachel Chavez, and I'm calling today as a nurse and a lower ocean resident to voice my vehement opposition to this ordinance. In the city's health and all policies fact sheet, we are reminded of the differences between equality and equity. Equity, which the city now claims to prioritize, acknowledges that not everyone starts from the same place and asks us to make structural change to ensure that people have access to similar opportunities and resources. If passed, this ordinance will further the already 
drastic inequity in our community by criminalizing some of our most vulnerable residents, thus negatively impacting their social determinants of health, which, as the health in all policies reminds us, is a harbinger of inequity. If council members truly believe that health and equity should exist in all policies, then they must understand that we only get there by centering and uplifting the most disadvantaged members of our community, which in turn makes a better city for everyone. Either acknowledge that the content and spirit of this ordinance opposes the stated goal of health and all policies, or admit that the intent was always just to punish people who have been judged as not worthy and to pacify those who find themselves loudly inconvenienced by having to witness people living in dire straits. Additionally, I would just like to make it known that I hike regularly alone in Poconip and walk through downtown using encampments and I've personally never felt threatened by any homeless person. Um, anyone with an ounce of common sense can see that this ordinance will only make homelessness and its equality significantly worse for all Santa Cruz residents. If you don't want to see trash build up, set up regular trash pickup. Want to see less human waste, build bathrooms. Want to see less needles, safe injection sites. Sharps containers everywhere. Nonsensical. Thank you very much. Know. Uh, next up, I have Ashley Wheel. Can you hear me? Can. Hello, my name is Ashley Weil. I'm a Santa Cruz resident and I urge you to oppose this ordinance. As a natural resource manager, firefighter, and public land employee of a local public agency, I'm a conservationist and I find it asinine and dehumanizing, not to mention neoliberal and performative, to even try to claim that this ordinance is remotely concerned with environmental degradation. We all know that those who consume the most are those that destroy this planet. Additionally, when I think of degradation of sensitive habitats, my mind goes to clear cutting with the goal of increased line of sight for police and the disturbance caused by police vehicle access. Further, Lee Butler reported on alleged attacks on DPR employees, but failed to mention vigilante and police assaults on our houseless neighbors. And on that note, why were we only presented with mountain bikers that report feeling unsafe recreating as opposed to houseless neighbors who feel unsafe while trying to survive? Again, as a Santa Cruz resident, I urge you to vote no on this ordinance. It is dehumanizing and disgusting. Thank you. Next up is Wes White. Go ahead. Hello, Wes White, Salinas resident, uh, co-president of Salinas Monterey County Homeless Union. And I guess I was urging you to say no as well, just like everyone else. Um, also, I'd try to point you in the direction of the continuum of care here in Monterey and San Benito counties. They're kind of leading the way in the state for, you know, Project Green Key and actually treating people like people. Have you taken a head count of how many people you plan to displace with no alternative to go? Are they just supposed to fall off the checkerboard? You know, did they lose at the casino of life here? Uh, so the enforcement is, is crazy off the top, uh, but you should work more in collaboration. We've actually uh, locked down Salinas pretty good. Is, a, is he's, They're the county seat here in Monterey County, and they're not conducting sweeps. They're actually trying to be humanistic and, you know, so I'd point that out as well. You know, if, if you're gonna vote yes on this, you may as well be, you're voting against humanity and, and you're turning in your humanity as well. So you should vote no on this. You should totally revamp and just table it, honestly. That way you don't have to embarrass yourself with a vote to even admit how little humanity you have. This is about business. You know, we worry so much about separation of church and state. Now we get to worry about separation of business and state because this is where it's at right now. It's big money, there's little, some little people, and there has to be a lot of losers for there to be a few winners. And we just need to stop this game altogether. Thank you. Better. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You're a little bit light. If you could speak a little louder. How about now? That's great. I just wanted to say Santa Cruz is a really beautiful place, um, and it's disheartening to see so many people supporting those who would spend their time justifying tactics that they've already been sued for while ignoring all the effective things that charities or housing plans could provide. 
there's no housing for low income people either unhoused or housed um and i think this is just like a appetizer for the poor people who get sick or injured in santa cruz um they see exactly what's going to happen to them parole collectors want to keep shooting themselves in the foot while being as cruel as possible the ordinance will fail it's a paper thin goal it's barely a change from the thing they've been doing for 10 years and it's just going to inevitably inevitably bloat the already over 30 million dollar police budget if you're okay paying jail time and court costs and evict their salaries who keep people in a cycle of inescapable poverty to justify what they do then by all means vote yes i yield my time thank you thank you up, we have uh, phone number ending in 8925. Phone number ending in 8925, please. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, my name is Maria Solis Kennedy, and I um, live in Santa Cruz, right near San Lorenzo Park. I'm originally from Boise, Idaho, a city that has wasted millions of dollars already on an anti-homeless lawsuit, and it looks like the city of Santa Cruz wants to follow in its footsteps and fight um, the spirit of uh, the uh, Boise versus Martin. And um, I'm really surprised because when I moved from such a conservative place to a democratically controlled city, I thought that I would encounter a different attitude towards the poor and the houseless. And I'm really disappointed in the spirit of this ordinance. And I urge city council to vote no. I also want to attest that as a young woman who lives very close to San Lorenzo Park and walks through frequently, I've never felt threatened and I've never felt unsafe. I continue to use the park regularly. Um, if people are scared of the poor people that live in the park, I don't think criminalization is the answer. I think that will exacerbate the problem. And I think we should act with compassion. I would just like to add that if the city and the park system is short of money, then I suggest that you look at defunding the police and cutting the police budget and not increasing it. Thank you. Thank you very much. This will be our last caller tonight. Your number ends in five, five, excuse me, five, four, four, six. Good evening, city council members. My name is Amy Liebichuk and I'm a nine year city resident and social worker. I'm asking that you vote against this ordinance. From Mr. Butler and Mr. Elliott's presentation, it appears we can all agree that this ordinance will not alleviate homelessness in our community. This ordinance, as outlined, is inhumane and seeks to undermine Martin versus Boise by limiting a person's right to sleep to the hours of 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. This ordinance wastes Santa Cruz police officers' time during a budget crisis, giving warnings and $20 citations to houseless residents, thereby criminalizing homelessness. This ordinance cites environmental degradation as the underlying issue. So I'd propose that the city council instead focus their efforts on providing trash receptacles and bathroom facilities to homeless encampments to resolve this issue. I also hope that the city and county can continue to partner to expand existing programs that do value the rights and lives of people experiencing homelessness, including safe parking programs, shelters, and supportive permanent housing programs, and hope to see transitional encampments added to the list. Thank you. Thank you, that's our last public speaker. Um, I have Council Member Watkins, Golder, and Council Member Cummings in the queue. I'd like to take a five to seven minute break and then come back and we'll deliberate. Mayor, can I ask a question? Yeah. I, know, I know that there's some people, uh, they've been reaching out to me because they've been online for hours now waiting to speak. And I was just wondering if there might be an opportunity, whether we could cut public comment to 30 seconds but to allow some of these people an opportunity since they've been waiting so patiently to address this. Sorry, I'm gonna cut it off. I've gone over the intended period, so I'm sorry, but I, I think we've gotten a really good, we've gotten a number of people. So I'm gonna cut it off so we have time to deliberate. Thank you. We'll take a five minute break.
vice mayor um, and council member Collentary Johnson I I'm sorry but I I must have gotten up I did not see who was who was between the two of you <laughs> who went up first I'm fine with um, vice mayor going before me I don't know <laughs> thank you uh if council members are back if they could turn on their uh turn on their camera so i know they're available um and we will go ahead and get started i believe it's been five minutes and a few okay um i just real quick a uh, few little comments and then we'll get right into it. I just want, again, wanted to thank folks from the public showing up tonight. I'm very sorry that we couldn't accommodate everybody. We're gonna try to get into this and, and get uh, get into the decision-making aspects of this. Um, I do wanna just um, acknowledge that we did receive hundreds of emails on the item and we appreciate the engagement by our community on all sides of the issue. And I want to recognize your letters were respectful, informative, and all correspondence has shown all of us here on the council that you care deeply about this community. So we thank you. Um, and I also just um, want to kind of put this ordinance in the context of really acknowledging the scale of homelessness in the city of Santa Cruz and its impacts to everyone in the community, including those that are houseless and are struggling to be here. Um, without the adequate amount of affordable housing and other services, including mental health, behavioral health, and substance abuse disorder um, facility. Um, we, we are lagging and very short on the things that we need to take care of, of our community. And we're not the only city in California or the nation that is suffering from these exact same issues. Um, and this ordinance is really most importantly placed in the context of the bigger picture of where we as a city are heading with our partners at the county for both short and long-term actions to address homelessness and importantly in the larger context of a statewide crisis. Homelessness is, acute, is an acute and debilitating social and economic issue in Santa Cruz and it is an environmental issue as well and it is continuing to get worse. This is a difficult issue that shouldn't be happening anywhere in the United States or in California, but it is, and we are doing our best to manage something the city has no real way to manage for. It is not the duty of city governments in California to provide services necessary to manage this crisis, yet we do do our best with our resources and locations as much as possible. And I think it's very important for, and I hope that people really understand that our city does expand resources and and funds as much as possible to try to do really what um, many experts have said, which is to try to prevent people from becoming homeless, number one, to try to look at diversion and rehousing as quickly as possible, to look at case management and social services, and then most importantly, to try to pr provide that permanent supportive and transitional housing needed to try to help these individuals. Um, I will have Lee put the uh, red line version up tonight, um, but I will let you know that I've, we've worked for many months on this and I would hope that one of my colleagues would entertain a motion um, to start the evening off with and um, we can begin deliberation at, at very soon. Um, I wanna recognize uh, in order, Council Member Watkins, Council Member Golder, Council Member Cummings, and uh, Vice Mayor Bruner at this time, and then Council Member Colantari Johnson. Council Member uh, Watkins, you have comments? Yes, thank, thank you, Mayor. And um, I, I'm gonna try to keep my, my comments short because I think as we all recognize, these are really complex um, issues before us. I wanna thank the community for your emails and input and those who are able to attend this evening as well as the staff and the mayor for your work on this as well. I feel like having served on the council for uh, now the past four years, no matter um, when an uh, item comes up in regards to those who are houseless in our community, it's always really challenging. And although at times it feels that there's sort of this, you're either this or you're that or opposed to this or you're for that, there is an ultimate shared vision and goal around wanting
wanting to connect people to better living standards and to see their success. So I just want to honor that shared space. Um, I think, as you mentioned, Mayor, we've seen uh, for decades now uh, this trajectory continue in terms of increased poverty, shrinking middle class, uh, housing costs, lack of national investment in mental health, substance abuse, I mean, you name it, right? So I don't think, um, it's not by mistake that we've ended up here. It's unfortunate and it's um, unacceptable as a nation that we are in this place. Um, and this is not the kind of policies that we uh, enjoy making, but it's also our responsibility as policymakers to uh, take ownership over some of these issues in our community. Serving as mayor, uh, I had, um, you know, really witnessed firsthand the challenges associated with large encampments, particularly around the Ross camp. And um, the, he the health and human safety uh, associated with living in that environment for uh, the individuals there, the surrounding um, community, our uh, natural resources are simply unacceptable. And I think we know that large encampments are not good for individuals residing there, nor for the community as a whole. And I feel like that as policymakers, we are um, in these positions to make really difficult decisions at times. And I feel like tonight and this topic in general is always really challenging. And it's about us uh, balancing being in action or deferring to inaction and status quo, um, trying to make policy to move forward without um, continuing to kind of operate from this place of um, really crisis response, constant crisis response, as opposed to trying to formulate policy that's gonna drive um, more clarity in the direction. I think that you really touched on, Mayor, a lot of what um, I wanted to also recognize that this is all in the context of a broader a continuum of care, a broader approach to those who are experiencing houselessness in our community, uh, rooted in an interest in wanting to prevent houselessness in the first place, identifying the unique populations and needs of individuals, and doing our uh, best to advocate and leverage and draw down as many resources as we can to support those who are unhoused in our community. Um, you know, we've seen that with the interest in the county wanting to prioritize families and children, uh, veterans, um, and we have other uh, subpopulations that also need addressing. I, um, I, I know that you, Mayor, interest, were interested in um, wanting to have additional uh, questions answered at, at prior uh, sort of prior to opening it up to public comment, I do um, feel like I could entertain a motion to get deliberations going, but want to honor that. So I'll hold my motion at this time and maybe start off with a question. And then when the questions have concluded, I'm prepared for a motion to begin our deliberations um, for the purposes of discussion. Um, my first question is uh, in regards to the um, the SOPs that we had, and this is more geared towards staff. Um, you know, when we closed the Ross Camp, there was a lot of work that we did to formulate, um, now I'm spacing on exactly what the SOP standard for it. Uh, yeah. Standard operating procedures, excuse me, thank you. Standard operating procedures, and, and really trying to think about how we manage large encampments forming um, and, and preventing them from forming and becoming entrenched. And, um, and we had these policies outlined, and I know that COVID has complicated uh, the situation, um, but I'm, I'm curious as to why, or if the staff could speak to why they haven't been operationalized um, yet. I think for that, thank you, uh, Councilmember Watkins. I think for that, I'd invite um, Susie O'Hara up. Um, she has um, some more history on that issue. Hi, good evening, Council Member Watkins and uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor and Council Members. Happy to be here and provide a little bit of update on the standard operating procedures. As you know, during your term as Mayor, um, Council Member Watkins, we, we relied heavily on the standard operating procedures as we move forward with closing the Ross Camp. Um, since that time, those operating procedures have been utilized on several different occasions, um, most specifically around ensuring that 
um, those are that are in encampments are given um, adequate notice that 72 hours and that we are storing personal property that qualifies um, under that those SOPs for um, the experience around COVID so say for the last um, 13 months 12 months we have to the greatest extent possible use those standard operating procedures as well but given that the fact that there have been changing um, orders around sheltering in place, changing um, guidance around the CDC and allowing for folks to shelter in place as long as possible, we've had to be really nimble and flexible with how we apply those. But in, in large part, the spirit of those SOPs are always used. Um, we go out um, and perform outreach. We ensure that folks understand what their options are. Just um, knowing that the options for additional shelter have diminished so significantly during the pandemic has created additional layers of complexity for us. Okay, thank you. No, I appreciate the clarification around that. Um, I will, I will post, I will sort of hold off on um, any additional questions at this time, but um, just sort of share that I think that we can craft something that is informed by our community input and a way to um, move forward in addressing some of the concerns uh, so that we can have, um, you know, at least action and direction in some regard here. And I um, am interested in looking at the red line version again. I think opening up our uh, parking uh, spaces available in the city while uh, simultaneously not including residential makes a lot of sense. And I think that helps also um, identify location specifics that our community is looking for and that we're hoping to have answered. I also um, have concerns about the misdemeanor component of the um, language and potentially thinking about um, uh, potentially thinking about removing that, knowing that there's so many other um, tools that could be employed uh, in, 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 as opposed to having that specific. Um, and then also looking at where are we at as a region in terms of a navigation center and other types of efforts in social workers, et cetera. So um, that's sort of just a summary of my thoughts on this at this time. And I look forward to the conversation that will ensue with my colleagues. So we'll go back to council member um, Watkins for a motion, but I do have, and, and again, just for additional comments, questions, uh, I know many of you were waiting to get, get those answered before we deliberated. Once we get those done, um, Lee, we can maybe put up the red line and we can start to work through uh, the motion as, as made by, uh, started with, uh, as made by uh, council member Watkins. Um, Council Member Golder, do you have comments or questions that you want to make at this time? I do, thank you. And um, I want to thank all of the members of the community that took time to write a letter or call in tonight. You know, it's obvious that everyone's really passionate about this issue. And I think the bottom line is nobody wants to see people suffering. They want, you know, um, people to be living in conditions that are humane and safe. And um, I think there's reasons why we have in the city and the state um, policies around like zoning regulations and things like, you know, smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms and occupancy limits and buildings and stop signs and building codes. And they're there to keep people safe. And so to the extent that um, tonight's ordinance not only keeps the 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 uh, house residents feeling safe in their neighborhoods or their parks it's also in a way to keep um the people that are living outdoors safe and i think it's it's a way to kind of um you know move forward and help help um regulate some of the situations that have cost a lot of money and um, I want to say I just I applaud the Association of Faith-Based Communities and the Safe Parking Programs and I and I encourage people with businesses or homes to allow people into your homes and yards. I 
do have concerns about a couple of um, aspects of the ordinance, and I'll wait to discuss those. But um, I also agree that I, I'm not sure about camping in the neighborhoods, and I think that we should look at parking lots as alternatives. Um, and as far as the misdemeanor goes, it's complicated. Um, sometimes I think with without um, any consequences, people are reluctant to make changes, and you can't always just keep giving like carrot, carrot, carrot. Um, and I know that's not the case here, but I would also, you know, like to see maybe not tonight because I don't know how much we'll get to, but I would, I mean, I'd like to see ways that we can help people get their credit back on track and their criminal records erased and things like that if, um, if they were to start looking for housing and jobs and things like this. So um, anyway, I feel like I'm rambling, but um, I'm also curious what everybody else has to say and thank you to everybody that called in. Thank you. Next up, I have council member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, members of the public who all chimed in tonight. Um, and um, for the staff, I have a, a number of comments. Um, I'll probably hold my comments. I'll ask a few more questions. Um, and then at some point when we get into deliberations, I'll probably express my feelings towards this ordinance this evening. Um, I did have a couple questions regarding um, the timeline, so the 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. And a question I had around that is, if we establish the that you can only have a tent up from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., is that something that's static? So, for example, if someone, you know, works, um, well, I'm thinking about it within the context of, you know, where we are right now in the winter. When the sun goes down in January by around 4.30 p.m., it's cold, and I'm just curious as to how we're going to adjust those times to kind of reflect when people need shelter because, um, yeah, it gets dark three hours before 8 p.m. during the winter. So I'd just like to hear from staff how that's supposed to be accommodated if tents can't be up uh, until 8 p.m. And also, along with that, setting a tent up in the dark for anyone who's ever done that is pretty difficult. So. Uh, planning director, if you can speak to that or anybody else can, that'd be helpful. Thank you, Councilmember Cummings. Um, I would say that in the ordinances that we've looked at, um, there are different timelines. Um, some, for example, to address the issue that you raised, um, say um, 30 minutes after um, sunrise as the uh, pack up time and then 30 minutes before sunset as um, the uh, time when you can start setting things up. So that would address your concern in relation to um, uh, the, the light um, and uh, the varying times throughout the year. Um, I would say that um, you know that was that was something that was considered. It's certainly something that you can consider completely within your purview. Um, the ease of implementation of knowing eight o'clock to eight o'clock um, was a factor in um, the deliberations, but I appreciate you raising that question and certainly the council can um, modify that as you all see fit. Okay, thank you. Um, the, next, the next question I have is one that came up um, that I had and then also came within the community, which is the determination and definition of disability. Um, I think somebody had pointed out that, you know, um, anxiety, PTSD, schizophrenia, all these things are disabilities. Drug addiction could also be considered a disability if it also has impacts on your ability to, your ability for you, you to mentally function. So, and then, you know, I think it's pretty safe to say that in our country, unfortunately, access to medical care is really limited. So, you know, how do we expect someone who you know may not even be aware of their surroundings because of their mental health issue to be able to go to a doctor, carry a note on them at all times, which they're able to present to police officers that would then um, you know justify them being able to keep their tent up all the time. So I'm just wondering if, if someone could speak to you know 
the process behind, you know, how we're going to expect people who may have mental difficulties or disabilities to be able to meet some of the requirements that are outlined um, in this ordinance, especially since they may be on their own and by themselves. So uh, I would say a couple of things. Um, so one, um, with respect to medical access, um, there are um, uh, folks at the county, HPHP, that helps to provide uh, you know, free and low cost services. Um, and um, with respect to, um, and so those individuals you know, could feasibly um, provide if there is a, a medical uh, doctor's note that's necessary. Um, that, was, that was part of the thought process. Um, and then um, you also had another question um, about the, um, the identification. Could you repeat that? I think that was the second part. Uh, was there a first part to that as well? No, I think most of it was along the lines of, you know, our expectations around people who have mental health disabilities right. and one, how they're going to be able to get, you know, a doctor's note and then, you know, our expectation around them, keeping that on them all the time to present to police officers um, right. in order to keep their housing. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. And I, I would say a couple things um, just in addition there. So, um, you know, one of the things that it, uh, that the, ordinance identifies is that um, if that disability is not readily apparent, um, you know, there may be um, individuals who are known um, to the, um, uh, to the uh, policing community, for example. Um, and um, so uh, those police officers, you know, may, even if they've lost the note, uh, say, hey, you know, we know that this is the case. Um, there are also um, other resources, I think, um, and whether it's through the continuum of care or um, uh, through, um, you know, visits at, at Housing Matters and HPHP staff there versus, you know, field staff there. So there are some opportunities. Um, and uh, I, I would say if, if anyone on the team has additional uh, things that they'd like to add, Chief Mills or others. Yeah, thanks, Director Butler. Uh, we actually deal with this a lot with a lot of medical reasons um, that people, you know, use different substances. For instance, when cannabis was, um, you needed a medical excuse for under two, Prop 215 to use cannabis. People, you know, you, you work with them, you try to figure it out. The second piece of that is it can always be dismissed later at the city attorney's level uh, when that takes place. Um, you know, should they have their have to reobtain their medical uh, clearance to have that? So it's kind of a double uh, level system, and that we're fairly used to dealing with. Yeah. In addition to that, um, Director Butler, if you don't mind, if I jump into as well for Councilmember Cummings, the our downtown outreach workers, as well as um, as Chief Mills knows, our mental health um, liaisons have access to those within the system of care, especially those with mental health diagnoses. Um, I know that our mental health um, workers are, um, you know, having hundreds of contacts um, a year, if not thousands, with folks that are um, in the city of Santa Cruz that um, do have. Um, access to the system of care treatment. And so I do think that there is, while there is HIPAA considerations, there is um, a recognizable group of folks that um, we have contact with through both of those programs. Okay, thanks. Um, just a couple more questions. Um, uh, I guess one in particular, I'm just curious about, you know, if we're gonna put this in place, like what is the strategy around increasing turnover in our current facilities? Because if we have, I mean, we can't assume that we're gonna have all 400 plus beds once COVID is over. And if we're back down to 155 beds, which I hope we're not, um, you know, just thinking about the proportion of people who are 
homeless in our community, how are we going to, are there any thoughts around how we're going to be able to transition people out of shelters and either into homes or back with families so that we can get people in? Because um, if the strategy is going to be to break up these encampments and people are literally going to be, you know, randomly sleeping throughout the city of Santa Cruz, how are we going to ensure that we're trying to get more people into um, shelter and services and not kind of in this perpetual cycle of poverty? So I would uh, comment on that and I'd invite others up uh, after that as well. One of the things that I would say is, you know, I mentioned the, um, the county's um, focus strategies plan and um, one of the um, uh, uh, recommendations uh, and, and really part of the, the conversation that we've been having with the county is directly related to these questions that you're asking. And they're looking at a number of things. Um, the, the data is a, a big um, uh, thing that they're looking at is, is uh, looking at um, reducing those timelines. So they have set um, uh, goals They've, they've looked at how long people have stayed in certain facilities in transitional housing and in shelters, and um, they've, they've set uh, goals that they are looking to attain within certain timelines, and, and they're substantially shorter than what has occurred um, in the past. Um, and so the county is well aware of that um, concern um, and um, is, is seeking to address that as part of their um, upcoming six month and uh, three year strategy, because you're absolutely right. If, if there is not that turnover, um, then um, you know, it's not opening up beds for that next person that, that needs to access that resource. It looks like Susie might want to add something as well. Yeah, thanks Director Butler, um, uh, Council Member, um, Cummings, I wanted to call you Justin, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> um, while you were on the two by two committee, we spent uh, months talking about this subject. So I know that it's deeply ingrained in, in your policy um, considerations. So one thing that we did talk about at the two by two level was um, the assurance that um, as we contemplate new sheltering models that that churn um, and the incentives to, you know, provided to folks to ensure that not only are they offered um, diversion programs before they hit the shelter system, but each step of the shelter system um, provides opportunities for folks to find um, pathways out of homelessness is critically important. So I do think that stepped model um, will continue to be a critical piece of the county and focus strategies work. And I think the work on the HAP and the work that Lee and others are doing to help advocate um, for focus strategies to um, really focus on kind of that stepped um, shelter program um, and leading into um, long-term housing solutions will be really important. So I appreciate you bringing that up. Thanks, and I'll, I only have a few more questions and I'll try to wrap it up. I'll share my comments and then I'll, I'll be quiet. Um, Next two questions. One, um, and I just want to get this as a summary piece, but it sounds like, um, and Lee, maybe you can touch on this. Um, currently, based on the report that we were given, it doesn't appear to myself, and I don't think it's clear to members of the public, where people can sleep. And so I'm just wondering if you can touch on that again, um, because we have outlined where people can't, but we haven't said where people can. And I think the other concern is, you know, if there is this, you know, component, which is having storage be accessible, if the only places for people to camp are in the middle of open spaces, 75 feet away from uh, trails, for me, that leads, that what that tells me is that there's, the, there's a higher potential that people will be camping in these areas and having negative impacts on our environment because they won't have access to bathrooms. Um, they'll have to, you know, and as a result, they'll have to make use of where they are. They won't have easy access to refuse, so they're going to be throwing their trash in a lot of these areas. And, you know, if they're in open space, it's not like you can drag a garbage can in and out, right? It's going to be teams of city workers going out and cleaning up after people 
because these people have no way to um, access um, garbage or, you know, when we think about black water and gray water, they'll have nowhere to kind of dump their, um, those um, biohazardous wastes. So I think it would be really helpful for us to kind of have a better understanding of where people can go, especially now that we're saying, well, now that it's coming up as well, that people don't want these people in neighborhoods. So I'm wondering if you could speak to that. Sure, thank you, Councilmember Cummings. So I'm happy to speak to that. Um, so first off, I, I, I saw, I heard three questions there or three things that I'll respond to there. First off, where, um, and I'll, I'll respond um, as the ordinance is currently drafted. Um, so, you know, the council can modify this as they see fit, but as are currently drafted, um, it's the open spaces, um, aside from the three that were precluded. So uh, the four open spaces, um, meaning uh, Moore Creek, uh, Poganip, um, Arana Gulch, and uh, De La Viega. So those four open spaces outside of um, 75 feet from either side of a trail. And then there would be some sensitive habitat areas that are identified and we would publish those before we are um, enforcing the ordinance. Um, so that is as, uh, oh, excuse me, and then sidewalks throughout the city, sidewalks throughout the city. So that's how the ordinance is currently drafted. Um, I would just comment on that and say that, you know, um, so long as adequate places are being provided, I think, you know, we um, would um, just tell the council, like, if you want to modify the places, look to ensure that there is adequate space. Um, when we were, when we were, um, you know, uh, working through all of this and looking at options and um, considering the ordinance, um, you know, there are, there are reasons for and against everywhere. And, you know, you've cited some valid reasons why there are concerns about open spaces. And so what I would say is if the council wants to take open spaces off the table, um, then think about what, what other places are gonna be put on the table so that we do have adequate spaces. I mean, that's, that's critical from a legal perspective um, of having a uh, sufficient number of spaces for people to go and to sleep. So that's one. Two, you mentioned um, storage and how would that work? And, you know, with, if it's up in the, if people are camping in the open spaces, you know, I think that's something that we will clearly need to evaluate, but certainly we would be looking at, all right, where can we place facilities that are convenient to where people are going to be? Um, and, um, you know, if, if the council chooses to move those places around um, as far as where people can be, then we would reevaluate where we want to put the storage, um, uh, that store, those storage programs. Um, and then finally, you mentioned the cleanup um, and, you know, the hauling of, of trash by city uh, staff. Uh, I'm not going to say that this ordinance is going to uh, fix that issue. Um, but um, what I will say is I do appreciate the comments that we got from members of the public um, that spoke to uh, the um, changes um, that were included in uh, for the council's consideration, which included things like, you know, pack your trash out. Um, you know, so it'll be the camper's responsibility to keep their, their trash in a bin and uh, a receptacle. And, you know, is that gonna happen all the time? No, but um, from an expectation standpoint, um, hopefully that um, can uh, address some of the challenges. Okay, um, thanks. I, I will say I'm a bit, well, I'll hold my comment. Um, because I, I have two more questions. I know that there's other people who want to speak. Um, but thank you for providing that, um, the answer. Sure. Um, last two questions. One, um, there's been a lot of discussion popping up around not allowing camping in neighborhoods. However, at the same time, there is a provision that's written into the ordinance that says that private property owners can have 
um, campers, people camping in their yards. And so I just want to understand would there need to be some reconciliation if you say you cannot have it in residential neighborhoods and, and the fact that private citizens are allowed to actually allow people to camp on their properties? No, I think um, when we went through um, the proposed um, or potential edits for the council's consideration, um, it precluded the um, residential districts and that is in a section pertaining to public property. And then there is also the, the separate section related to private property. And so I think the ordinance would be okay. Um, and, and just to remind the viewers, I heard a number of uh, uh, commenters uh, speak to allowances for, uh, the, you know, proposed allowances for camping in on private properties. And those, those allowances are on the books. That is, that's currently law. And so currently people can do that. So just clarification for members of the public. And I guess the final question is funding. And so I'm just curious how, you know, we're talking about um, we can't do anything until we have adequate storage, um, which also means we're going to have to identify locations for the storage, locations for the camping. It sounds like we're probably going to need more staff because if we designate these camping areas, someone's going to have to go through and check to ensure that people are throwing up their trash, that there's not going to be, um, you know, defecation in areas where they, there shouldn't be. Obviously, we're probably also going to have to provide porta potties, hand washing stations in these areas that we designate as um, outdoor sleeping areas. So, my question is, what, where is the funding supposed to come from to support that? Given, especially given that we're in a very deep deficit at the moment. That's a great question. You know, we spend um, a lot on um, our homeless response now. Um, you know, sometimes dizzying amounts when we're just, um, you know, conducting cleanups um, following, um, you know, a camp that, that moves from a, a location. And so, um, you know, I think we'd be looking at whatever sources we can um, for uh, those resources. You are correct, there would need to be some type of, um, uh, of program to operate the, the storage. You know, in our initial brainstorming, we've talked about, um, you know, whether that could be a nonprofit or whether that could support existing um, groups or um, if uh, the downtown streets team or, you know, there's a combination of ideas that we've thrown out there, but whether it's a uh, general fund or looking to CDBG, you know, we would uh, have to have to find um, those resources and, um, you know, it's, it's a cost one way or another, you know, we're, we're spending money on these efforts now and it looks like city manager Bernal has something he might want to add as well. Uh, no, I think you covered it, Lee. I think, uh, as Lee mentioned, uh, we are already expending uh, funds for uh, portable bathroom hygiene facilities, cleanups, uh, and the like, and uh, have received a CDBG funding that uh, we've set aside and expect to use for this purpose. It's, it's supposed to be for this purpose, and I think we also expect to receive uh, additional funds uh, through the state and, and uh, some of the federal funds for some of these purposes as well. So. Uh, Thank you um, for those for that feedback. I'm going to end my questions. I'll um, just raise my hand so I can come back later and make my comments. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, next up, I have Vice Mayor Bruner. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much to everybody that. Uh, you know, all our constituents and the public and community members that I've never had so many emails. <laughs> so it was very um, great to see all of the engagement and the, the response. And uh, I just want to say I really appreciated those that took the time to read through the draft. We all, I got it Thursday, we all uh, received the draft ordinance Thursday um, and, you know, very little time to really comb through it. So for those that combed through with very specific suggestions um, and points 
that was appreciated. Um, I do want to say there were a lot of um, uh, there was a lot of input, and we heard some on the calls today. Um, you know, my understanding is this ordinance has the potential to help manage a very difficult situation, and I want to be clear, I don't have any delusions that this uh, ordinance attempts to address the humanitarian crisis uh, that exists here on the streets in Santa Cruz. That's um, my understanding that this ordinance does not replace the dire need for significantly increased health and human services. And as I continue to work downtown in the uh, you know, downtown district, and um, also I am now newly appointed on the uh, two by two committee with Mayor Myers and um, county supervisors and county staff and health and human services. Um, I'm reminded regularly of the need for more mobile outreach workers and mobile social worker teams and vastly expanded mental health and substance use order treatment facilities and services um, in Santa Cruz and understanding that the intention of this ordinance is not a replacement for that. I had to really get to that point um, and knowing that that work is happening simultaneously. And um, I think that's important to, to note. Um, in, in my notes, you know, I, I, there's so much work that has been done. I'm really actually amazed at the uh, homelessness um, recommendation report that was adopted in 2017. And I understand that went through a process and um, as well as the cash committee's uh, final recommendations. Um, so there has been a lot of engagement and community support um, and input and process and um, identifying uh, short term, there's a list of uh, you know, 10 or so short-term solutions and long-term solutions. And we've actually checked off, it looks like, some of these items so far. And, um, you know, if we keep these first and foremost as templates to continue the work on really addressing the root cause that um, is exists, not just in Santa Cruz, um, but, uh, you know, as uh, in the county, all the cities in the state, you know, the long-term goals for more housing, all types, including subs subsidized and uh, permanent supportive housing, um, these are necessary components of, you know, our public policy and in addressing the city's role in supporting this crisis, the crisis of unhoused folks, the crisis of mental health, the crisis of substance use disorder. Um, and it must, I really feel it must be supplemented with short-term measures that will help people in distress and reduce the social uh, disorder. Um, and so we need, I, I, it's our responsibility to balance the city's responsibility to maintain public health and safety with those that are unhoused. And, um, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing Council Member Watkins' motion. And I hope that we can discuss complementary policy um, to ensure that action on the ordinance is balanced with providing additional resources to our unhoused folks and um, really, uh, you know, the broad concept I think we all, you know, is there and I think there's some discussion and need to really fine tooth, flesh out the details in some of the language um, and some of these items in here. And, and it's nice to know that we have that flexibility. So I look forward to that discussion. Thank you, Vice I had, 
I had one quick question too. Oh, I'm looking. I'm looking at my notes here. Um, currently, where are um, where are and this is in reference to six point three six point zero six zero, which is the additional criteria section. Um, where are Sharps containers in, uh, where are they located and how would one know where they are? Right now, um, we have three, thank you, Vice Mayor Bruner, that's a good question. And uh, I'll say that there are three um, Sharps containers that, um, the, uh, that are in the city that the county services that I'm aware of um, there's one on Coral Street. Um, there is um, one on Water Street. Um, and there is another um, that was newly installed at the, um, the San Lorenzo Park um, to help address um, issues there. And um, there is one more that is in the works that is being coordinated right now with the county that would be at another location along the river. Thank you. Welcome. Next up, um, I have uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson and then Council Member Brown, and then I'll queue myself after. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'd like to echo some of the comments that my colleagues have made and thank um, the staff who worked really hard on this um, and all of the community members who joined tonight, who spoke tonight, who wrote letters. Um, it, it, this is a really complex and complicated issue. Um, and, and actually, I want to go back to um, Councilmember Watkins' uh, starting statement around our shared vision and goal of community well-being and reaching success for everyone. Um, I think I think it is that is an important space to start from, um, and I think it, what I heard over and over again from sort of both sides of the aisle, if you will, um, compassion and dignity. Um, those are important spaces to start from because I I know that that our community cares and and um, we want to reach those spaces, and we're not there yet, and, and this ordinance won't necessarily get us there, um, but we have to move in some kind of a direction. Um, you know, I just want to note that people spoke um, very passionately from both sides and, and, and directions, and, uh, and I hear all of it. Um, this, is, this is an experience, this is a, an issue that, that all of those experiences that were named are real. They're real for those who are unhoused, they're real for um, neighbors, they're real for the environment. It's all real. Um, it's, it's not one side or the other, as Councilmember Watkins has said. Uh, I, so I have, my background is in social work for members of the public who don't know. I have a master's in social work. I've worked in the field of homelessness for over two decades in the Tenderloin in San Francisco doing direct services, um, doing policy work, doing grant writing, doing strategic planning. So I've, I've addressed this issue from many angles and I, and I don't have a perfect answer. Uh, and I think that we're not after a perfect answer tonight. Um, we're after uh, some actions to help us move forward. Uh, you know, there, this ordinance is a beginning. I find that there are some gaps in it uh, that I'd like us to discuss and deliberate. And um, I can name some of them quickly here, but I'll, I'll hold it for when we're in deliberation. But um, the storage program, and accessibility as council member Cummings brought up. Um, designated areas, I think many of the council members have brought that up and, and perhaps that's on the table. Having designated areas and then connecting that to staffing and supervision, um, hygiene stations. Um, and, and then uh, oh, the other piece is, um, you know, the, the, the enforcement piece um, really starting out from an outreach and engagement approach first. I think that was a specific recommendation from the CATCH uh, Safe Sleeping Subcommittee. Uh, using that in conjunction with our, the steps of warnings and citation, having outreach workers. So really integrating that piece of it 
Um, and, and I hear uh, what Councilmember Boulder said that it's it's complicated and tricky uh, because those who will abide by the rules, um, if we provide support, outreach, engagement, they'll abide by the rules. And then there are those who, frankly, will um, endanger some of our unhoused population who aren't following the laws and restrictions that are in place. So it's, it's, it is a complicated space. So I think there's, there's space in this ordinance that can be strengthened. Um, I also think that we need to think holistically and in the full continuum of care. Um, a, a phased approach where we work towards what Mr. Brent Adams brought up, it's a yes and, right? Where we work towards safe sleeping model and we have it connected to resources and staffing. We work with our faith community and nonprofits um, and ultimately working through our two by two and with our county to get um, to some kind of a transitional shelter space that is robust and that's connected to navigation centers. So um, Vice Mayor Brenner and I have been working together on some policy direction that would complement um, the ordinance and some suggestions for strengthening the ordinance, but we'll wait till there's a motion and we can present those. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Um, I have Councilmember Brown next. Uh, thanks. Uh, so I, I'm the first question I have. I have three. Uh, and the first question I have is: Can we get a sense of uh, um, those of you who are able to see uh, how many people were waiting to speak who were not able to? Is this a ballpark? Um, I'm getting a lot of messages from people uh, who are concerned and if I had been able to get the floor earlier, I would have made a motion to extend our public comment period um, in response, uh, Mayor Myers, to your uh, statement that uh, we we were gonna, the meeting was closed. Um, but I would like to know, um, you know, if we could get a sense of how many people were not able to speak. Um. I did not count them all. I'm sorry. I was able to count the hands that were up. There were about 26. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so uh, my other questions. Um, I am, you know, I'm not going to ask uh, a lot of questions about the ordinance language. I'm looking forward to hearing the motion and the deliberations and um, the possible uh, yeah, amendments, revisions, additions, et cetera. Um, that uh, uh, Council Member Kalantari Johnson mentioned. Um, and I, I just wanna say that I, I really um, echo um, a lot of the, you know, the interest that you expressed, um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, in, you know, the, the both and that um, Mr. Adams uh, suggest, suggested, and I think many others have. Um, and I also share a lot of the concerns and questions that um, Council Member Cummings has so I won't repeat them. Uh, my questions are um, one. So I'm I'm not going to again ask questions about the the ordinance language. I think it's just um, it's it's just it's hard for me to see that uh, any potential for clarity in in some of this because it is so um, you know complicated and um, convoluted and necessarily so given the constraints. Um, <clears throat> but I'm wondering if we could is it, would it be possible to just pull up that. Uh, those maps for um, for a moment because um, I think that it, you know it, it, there is a big question that's just kind of lingering there um, that um, Council Member Cummings kind of asked you know um, it, it, where people can't who who want who who legitimately genuinely want to follow the rules um, that we are um, the city is council is considering um, how they could. You know, reasonably or effectively, successfully do that, and so, and I don't suppose it's—I um, don't imagine it's possible to do an overlay of the the red zone and the yellow. Oh, good, great. Um, and then, so then, if so, if we look at that, um, you know, again, I, I, we can't um, dive all the way into this map for, and spend hours on it, but I, you know, it looks to me like what's left is neighborhoods. Um, which I don't, I don't believe was the, you know, or, or primarily neighborhoods. I see maybe a little bit of area over on the West Side Industrial and, you know, Harvey West area. But aside from that, um, it's neighborhoods, and and I don't think that was 
the intention with uh, developing this. And so if we add the neighborhoods in, then I, I just, I, I'd really love to see what that looks like. And if, if somebody could just walk me, walk us through, um, like to give us some idea about where, um, you know, people who do want to um, try to navigate through whatever, um, you know, uh, parameters are, are placed upon the, them, um, like where they could be. So that's one question. And then my second question, which is related, is how will people come to know um, and, and understand what spaces are on or off limits? I think that that's been, that question's been raised. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, especially given the conditionality of some of the spaces, um, and then some of it being up to interpretation. Um, you know, I've heard, you know, in response to a lot of questions, well, if they have a doctor's note or, you know, oh, if it's, so it, it's like, there's just so much that's not clear and that I, I don't think can be clarified. But what I would like to know is like where people um, can be and how they will come to know, like get that, um, that understanding. Uh, I don't think signage is gonna do it. I like the idea of some outreach uh, and being getting built into this, but I also, um, you know, I'm not sure that that would really get us there. So I think there's just going to be confusion, kind of ongoing. So again, so two questions: where, like, tell us where uh, people can be and how they'll know. Aside from the website, because I, I don't think that's a, a realistic way for people to access um, that information or not for everybody at least. So thanks, those are, those are valid questions. Um, and I think the first thing that I would um, say in response is, you know, this, uh, this map here is kind of the baseline. Um, so right now, this map would show you um, where um, you could camp. There, there may be, some areas that are flood prone, um, you know, that we uh, would close right now. And there are some areas that are signed and we would then need to also sign some, um, uh, some sensitive habitat areas. So you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, um, I think the, the response that I had before was somewhat um, because we do need to still identify the, uh, the, um, uh, sensitive habitat areas um, that would be off limits. Um, when we start looking at these additional maps, this one, for example, showing the, um, the wildland urban interface um, as the largest area, um, you know, certainly if that whole area was closed, then we would we would have a big chunk of the areas that otherwise would be allowed in open spaces, for example, that would be off limits. And so, you know, that is um, concerning um, and something that we would need to work with our fire chief on on a regular basis to say, all right, you know, what are the, the key areas? Um, you know, I, I may actually um, ask the fire chief to, to pop on for a second because I believe, and I'm not positive about this, but I believe when um, the uh, uh, restrictions were called for recently that it was um, related to the um, uh, Hoganet area and not all of the WUI, but I, I would ask him to maybe weigh in on that and that could, you know, help inform the discussion as well. I think, Mr. Jason. Hi, Mayor and City Council. So the wildland urban interface is an overlay that um, is not just for those who are unhoused. It actually impacts uh, housing and building standards uh, that are adjacent to those large open spaces. And this past summer, um, prior to the CZU fire, we've done a number of outreach uh, for our highest concentration of our large encampments within the Sycamore Grove, Oganip area. And we experienced a number of fires there. And so we targeted that just because of the frequency of fires. And we cleared that area because of the fuel conditions. And so um, even though that you, you, you see the entire wildland urban interface, it's really dependent on the fuel conditions, um, how uh, receptive something is to catching on fire, and then the ignition source. And so we, we had people that were camped in 
other spaces in our wildland urban interface, but we weren't having calls, we weren't having um, the frequency of events there. And so this is really dependent on uh, the impacts and the behaviors in that area and the risk to the individuals there, as well as the uh, greater community. So that wildland urban interface um, is very much dependent on the weather uh, outside of our control and then the events that are ha uh, happening in that area. And we had a really big concentration uh, within that area because we had an entrenched encampment um, that was growing larger and we had actual incidents that we were trying to curtail so that we didn't have you know, that catastrophic uh, you know, wildland fire that, like we saw earlier this summer. Thanks. Um, and so, uh, Council Member Brown, I I, um, I asked that because I wanted to confirm that you know it wouldn't necessarily be an across the board um, WUI um, elimination. Um, and your your point is a valid one. How will folks know? And I know you know you you expressed concerns about you know the website. Um, I think that it could very well be. Um, and in fact, as we have this set up, it could change um, over the course of the year. You know, flood prone areas might go, areas where, um, you know, we have a migratory species um, might be off limits during one time during the year and might be okay during another. And um, uh, wooey, portions of it may be okay all year round and portions of it may be off limits for a part of the time. So I, I do think that, um, you know, it will be incumbent upon, if, if council chooses to take this approach with these limitations, then it'll be incumbent upon staff to uh, make sure that we're updating that regularly. And, and I know um, there's a concern about digital access. Um, we did include in the ordinance a uh, provision that says that it, a paper copy would be available. Um, and I think, you know, we, we want to make sure that it is clear. Um, you know, we, we want to make sure that, that where it's, you know, where it's okay, that people know it's okay so that, um, you know, they can, they can go to those areas. And, and we want to hear from council where those okay areas are and we're happy to um, adjust the ordinance accordingly. Thanks. Thank all. Um, I believe um, we're starting to get to details, and I think I'll go to uh, Councilmember Watkins. I see your hand up, um, and I don't want to miss. Um, but I'm just wondering if maybe the most productive thing would be to go ahead and um, and get that red line up. And so I'm hearing a couple of different um, council members who have expressed um, potential changes to the ordinance. I think maybe that's the best place to go next um, so that we can uh, deliberate and uh, start those changes. So Lee, can you, um, so uh, Council Member Watkins, you mentioned you were ready to put a motion on the table. I, I am, I think, you know, we um, can hopefully integrate various uh, perspectives and input to craft something that's gonna work for our community. I am interested in uh, moving forward. I'm trying to, I'm gonna try to differentiate my comments from the motion because I know Bonnie knows that I have a pattern of sort of blending in my thoughts as opposed to a really clear motion. So I'm gonna start with my thoughts and then I'll try to get um, a sort of somewhat simplified motion to uh, sort of start as a foundation that can be augmented by um, my colleagues. Um, I do like the idea of the red line version. I um, I wonder if, if Lee, you can move it to the um, identification of city parking lots and then um, how that would then offset the residential allowing. So here's the residential portion. Um, if you wanted to eliminate the residential, that would entail this. And then if you wanted to add information related to parking lots or private property or um, closed portions of public right away and so forth, however you'd like to articulate that um, could be done in this section here, which just as a reminder, is part of this uh, outdoor living permitted section. Oh, okay. 
So I would like to. So I would like to move forward with that um, direction. I think it um, it helps provide clarity of where, as opposed to where you can't. And I think also the residential um, language uh, it could be problematic for uh, several reasons. So I am supportive of that modification in this red line version. So I'll make that as part of my motion as the foundation, Bonnie. And um, I would also, I will not include at the time the um, the misdemeanor provision being removed because I want to have that conversation with my colleagues, but I do have concerns about that as um, kind of criminalizing status versus criminal activity. And, you know, um, hearing from Tony Condotti, there are a number of things like illegal campfires or obstructing a city's ability to mitigate an illegal camp that could be used as tools if there's individuals who are unwilling to move. But I want to really understand what the cost benefit of that is. So I'm not going to include that in the motion at this time, but I'm interested in that conversation. Um, I would like to direct staff to return um, with some sort of update on a navigation center, on a day center. Where are we at with the county with this? Maybe that's a conversation that has um, ensued with a two by two. I know there's been discussions of this for uh, several years now and um, just really want to reinforce personally my interest in seeing something like that move forward that's critical I think in terms of also connecting um, the individuals who are experiencing houselessness in our community to um, resources to get out of that that uh, status at this time. Um, I would also like to direct staff to explore how we can partner with the county and um, expand a social worker or case managers to support uh, contacting and connecting individuals to resources and supportive paths out of homelessness and houselessness, as well as to the ongoing tracking of shelter options available. I know we mentioned wanting to have clarity around where they could go. We should also have clarity around what sheltering is available uh, point in time right now, this evening. And I know that's something we discussed as well in the past. Um, the rest are just really comments, I think. I'll leave that. I hope that was sort of somewhat um, clear enough for you, Bonnie, to get us started uh, as a motion. I think we can look at, um, you know, look at community service as options as uh, sort of this diversion type model for potential individuals who are not in compliance, really look at waiving um, the impacts of uh, poor credit score, scores or other things that may impede their ability to find success success outside of um, this experience if they were to be cited. I, ultimately, I think, as has been brought up by my colleagues, really this is about us, this is one component of a broader picture around um, how we're addressing houselessness in our community. And I really believe that it's inhumane to allow these large encampments to remain. And we've seen that time and time again. And the amount of resources, um, it's not efficient nor it's not socially uh, right to have us in this crisis response mode. So however we can balance um, really good policy with the broader conversation of this continuum of care for services, I think we really have to factor all of those things in. Um, so I'm gonna leave my comments at that knowing that uh, it's getting late and we have other individuals who want to also have um, friendly amendments. So I hope that was clear enough for the motion. I'm happy to have um, Bonnie either reread it, what she was able to gather, or I'm happy to also just restate just the motion components of it. But I wanted to find, provide context. Shall I restate it? Okay. Let me put it up. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you, Bonnie. Mm -hmm. The only thing that I think is missing is to also remove the residential. 
allowing. I don't, uh, Lee, you have, I can't remember exactly what. Um, I can pull the uh, section, and then I think you also mentioned something about um, the sheltering. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's on sheltering that I didn't see. And I, I just wanted clarification, too. You mentioned working from the red line version that was reviewed by staff, correct? Yes. Sure. Which includes the, um, the modifications that you brought up in the beginning of my comment. So the, um, bear with me for one second, the uh, residential portion is in 6.36.040 B. B5. Okay. Thank you, B5. So that would be taken out? Uh, it would not be taken out. Um, that would have um, the, uh, this would, um, add a prohibition so it would say so uh sleeping on sidewalks is still okay except um in areas that are specified in uh the section above as prohibited so those are things like the downtown um you know you couldn't sleep on a sidewalk in the downtown and then also the residential zoning districts of R1, RL, RM, RH, and RS would remain. So, so just so you're clear, you know that does not include our commercial, which you know where mixed use would be allowed, um, but it includes the primarily the exclusively residential zoning districts. Okay, and I'm gonna I'll go ahead and second that motion. Um, okay, off we go. <laughs> Um, I had in order. Uh, Mayor Meyer, sorry. Um, Lee, you might be the better person to kind of wordsmith this in a way to make it like motiony. Um, <laughs> because I know, I, from what I hear, you're saying we're not removing 63604B5. It, How about kind of modify, modify 6.06? But Lee, isn't this in the red line? It is in the red line, yes. The motion is to work from the red line. I had a, um, an alternative suggestion that um, I, mean, I, I think I drafted the initial edit to um, subsection B5, but I think it might make more sense to, instead of modifying that, to add a subparagraph to 040A make it um, 040A number 12 to, uh, to specify that camping is prohibited um, in the, on, on public property in the, in the residential zoning districts of R1, RL, RM, RH, and RS. And then leave B5 intact as is, which I think accomplishes the same thing and it's a little bit less convoluted. Probably a bit more clear because it's expressly called out okay. as it's prohibited. Can you go ahead and repeat that? <clears throat> yes. Um, add B, a new B, uh, a new A12 to 040 that states on public property in the residential zoning districts of R1, RL, RM, RH, and RS, and renumber existing uh, paragraph, subparagraph 12 has 13. 12, what? Renumber existing paragraph 12 has 13. I have that in the draft now as well, in the red line. 
Okay, I have grab my list here. I believe I hope that I'm coming. Your hand is just sort of up for. Are you? Okay, I'll have Council Member Cummings, and then I saw Council Member Kalantari Johnson, Council Member Golder. Before, um, if we could, Mayor, uh, one of the aspects was to have, as part of the direction to work with the county, to also identify what shelter capacity is available. Um, so really trying to think about it holistically that way, too. I think, Lee, you brought, you brought that up as missing kind of language, but just didn't want to lose the sentiment behind it. Absolutely. Okay, great. Am I up? Yeah, go ahead, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure where to start on this, but I will say that um, I do support, I wanna thank everyone for, for reaching out to us, for the staff's help, for the council members who brought this forward. I totally support the intent and purpose of why this ordinance is coming forward, especially as it relates to environmental protection. Um, but I do have some really strong concerns with how this has come forward and um, kind of where we're at right now. Um, a couple of examples I'll give, one in particular, I mean, we had 140 people, I think, on the call, and we've received hundreds of emails. And I think that for some of the people in the community, what they've expressed to me is that they were a little bit blindsided by this coming forward. Last year, um, our police chief had mentioned that he had you know, a number of quality of life ordinances that were gonna be coming forward. This was one of them. And part of the reason why that was put on hold was because there was a need to do more community outreach and really get input from the community before bringing those uh, quality of life ordinances forward. And um, and a lot of people, what I've been, you know, what, I, what I've been hearing from people is that, um, you know, there wasn't the sense that there was enough outreach done with this ordinance in particular to get feedback from the community. And I feel like that's what we were able to accomplish tonight. I think that we have been able to get a lot of feedback from folks throughout the community of where they should see camping, where they don't want to see camping, uh, whether they're okay with this or not. Um, there's been a lot of questions from you know, council members alike uh, with regards to funding, uh, the storage program, how this is gonna be implemented. And in addition to all this, the staff has brought forward a red line version that none of us have seen and none of us have had a chance to read and that the public hasn't had a chance to weigh in on or read as well. And, you know, the things that really concern me the most about trying to move forward with this this evening is that you know, we have an outdoor sleeping ordinance with no clearly identified outdoor sleeping spaces. Um, we also have, are proposing that to enforce this, we need to have a storage program, which doesn't exist. We don't have identified funding. One thing that hasn't come up in this conversation is day services. So if we're to tell these people you cannot have your tent up during the day, where do we expect them to go? And I would imagine that many would likely flock to downtown, our beaches, these other areas because they don't have uh, you know, a place to reside. We don't have any day services. So if they don't have jobs, where do we expect them to go? Um, so those are some of the concerns. Um, additionally, you know, it's come up in the conversation. We are currently being sued for intent for attempting to break up the, the encampment that's at San Lorenzo that was not sanctioned. And one of the things that concerns me the most is that um, if we implement this and we don't see any change within you know, the time that it takes for this to be uh, authorized and implemented is that we're gonna be displacing smaller encampments and those people are gonna go straight to San Lorenzo or to Highway 1 and 9 because those are the two places right now where if you have a tent that's established, you will not be told to take your tent down and you will not be asked to leave. So by implementing this, um, I do, I am concerned with the impacts that's gonna have on those two large encampments. Um, and you know, I think as policymakers, it really is our obligation to hear from the community and to act on behalf of the community and to incorporate the community comments into our policy decisions. Um, 
as I mentioned before, the public nor the council has had an opportunity to read this redline version. I think what will be good is if the um, sponsoring council members and staff take the information that they've received tonight um, and work on this redline version, because I would imagine we're probably going to be, if we're going to go through this line by line, we're going to be up for the next two hours or so trying to um, wordsmith a redline version of this ordinance. And if that's going to happen, I'd also like to ask the staff send us all a copy so we can look over it and read it. Um, but I just think that, you know, we are in a really difficult position, and I, and I feel for all of our neighborhoods that are being impacted by homelessness. Um, and I think that we do need to figure out solutions that will hold everyone accountable, um, regardless if you're housed or unhoused, for your behaviors. Um, but I would just caution with uh, how quickly we're trying to move forward with this this evening. And if there's an opportunity for the council members to work with staff on taking into account um, the concerns that were raised and bringing back another version of this that's been um, a, another red line version of this for us to look over, I think that it'll be a much better use of our time. And I think it'll also demonstrate to the public that we're taking their, consider their comments into account because I think we do need to explain to them if we're not going to, um, you know, if, if we're going to say, fine, we'll kick everybody out of neighborhoods, or if we say we're going to allow people in neighborhoods, having some justification behind that. So um, those are my comments. If we're going to go through, I'm happy to provide more insight into the red line version, but I think that, um, you know, we're going on 13 and a half hours now for today. And so, you know, if there's a way for us to have a group that could work on this outside of us trying to wordsmith this right now, I think that'd probably um, be better for all of us as decision makers and seeing as how it's getting late. Thank you. I'll go to Council Member Golder, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, and then Council Member Brown. And I think I'll just I'll just jump in here. I've been trying to be respectful to have you guys have a, a, as much deliberation as possible. Um, I understand the concerns, and I, I think um, this is our first reading. Um, we're going to be going towards a second reading. So I think to the extent that um, we uh, get something in uh, on the books that we can then continue to work from, but I think continuing to put off sort of a decision to at least step forward with ideas. I, I think based on the hundreds of emails that we've already gotten, when this hits the books, if we do pass it tonight, um, I don't think that we're gonna have um, a lack of, of community input um, moving towards the second reading. And so um, I, I do think that there is some urgency. I do think there is urgency with this. Um, I share comments that I've heard from various colleagues um, that, you know, you know, dignity and um, the ability to really be in a place that may look like it is an option, but where we could craft better dignity, better availability, better security um, is, uh, is something worth trying to achieve. Um, and I think um, some of the comments around sort of this, this, this concept of a social contract that we do share our public spaces and we do need to honor each other's needs for whatever those spaces may be. Um, and that that is a really important principle about putting something, uh, getting something on the ground tonight and looking at that from the perspective, um, as a, a, from the perspective of a second reading. Um, so, you know, I, I would urge us to keep moving tonight um, and uh, accept to the extent that we can. Um, some of the, what I looked at are pretty minor edits, but we can pull them up. But I really think we should, you know, try to get something over the finish line tonight rather than continue to um, try not to, you know, try to continue to uh, come up with the, uh, with additional uh, uh, items right now. I'm losing it. Um, been up since five. Um, so I will let, uh, let me go to, um, 
Council Member Golder and then Colin Tarrant Johnson and then Council Member Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with uh, a lot of what my colleagues have said, and I would um, I would just wonder if there's a way that we could, um, if we did move forward tonight with the first reading, um, revisit this in maybe nine months and see how things are going and come back with some data um, and and reevaluate things if we, um, you know, did pass anything tonight. And um, I was curious, and I don't expect this answer now, but maybe at the second reading, if we could, if there is, a, if it does go through, uh, how many beds, um, emergency shelter beds, there are in the county, and uh, how many has there been, you know, increasing over the last few years or the last um, several months during the pandemic? Um, I also have questions for Chief Mills regarding if this did pass, mm -hmm. what would um, one of the callers I think said regulatory and operational um, clarity, like what would this look like on the day-to-day -day for the officers or who would be out there um, enforcing this? Do we have the resources? So the operational clarity is that we will enforce uh, whatever you give us and we will do it consistently and we will do it uh, uh, and if needed with overtime. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the uh, the reality of council is carried out in the best way we can uh, and can do so. Uh, again, the ordinance is set up so that you warn first, cite second, and arrest third, and that is exactly how we will proceed with that. Thank you. I mean, I think all of us really want to look at the root causes and prevention of homelessness first. I mean, you know, as something that's really important to all of us, but also I really care about the 5,000 kids that are gonna be going back to school here in the next few weeks. And I agree with Justin that it's probably hard to set up and take down tents in the dark, but um, I, I don't like the idea of kids biking past or walking past or over people trying to get to school. I don't think that's a a good mix. I don't think it's safe, and especially some of the things I've seen, um, I wouldn't want kids to see that. And so, my suggestion would be to modify the hours to maybe sunrise to sunset. Or um, I know San Francisco has, I think, 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. something like that. But um, those are some suggestions. I don't know if they could be friendly amendments or if that's too soon. And I've got um, Council Member Colantari Johnson and then Council Member Brown. And I think just for clarification, I believe that we took residential right now, um, Council Member Golder, the residential areas have been taken out as locations for sleeping. So I'm not sure if the question was regarding kids living in those residential areas, but okay. Council Member Colantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, yeah, you know, I um, just to, to uh, council member coming comments, um, uh, it, it seems like it doesn't seem like we have been having this conversation as a community for a long time. Um, just looking back and looking at all the uh, resources that we have, the, the catch recommendations, that was a year long pro um, process. These are components, it's not the whole set of recommendations, these are components of those recommendations, including an update to our current ordinance. Um, and then dating back to, I'm looking at my notes, um, 2017, the Homelessness Coordinating Committee, um, there were recommendations, and, and I'm gonna, in, in a moment I'm gonna um, propose some friendly amendments that, that reference that committee. Um, there were recommendations that were unanimously approved just a few years ago. So I think um, I hear your comments that, that this seems to have been sprung on us, but, it, but we've been having this dialogue for a long time. And, and it's an imperfect um, solution, but we won't, I don't think we will have a perfect solution. And in fact, um, I don't 
think anyone's going to walk away extremely happy tonight. Um, none of us here and none of our community members. Uh, so just with those comments, I think if it's okay, I am, um, I'm going to send Bonnie some proposed language. Is that, is that the appropriate step? Yes. Please. Okay. All right. So I just need a second to download <laughs> my document. I'm sorry. And Bonnie will add these to the existing motion and if, if they're accepted. But yeah. Okay. All right, Bonnie, I gave you an outdated draft. So let me um, send you, I've been, we've, I've been made, oh, these are in conjunction with um, Vice Mayor Brenner and I have been working on them. Um, so we've been making changes as, when, as we've been hearing the conversation, so. I'm pulling uh, it up now as well. Yeah, and I'm gonna send help the, send. oh, thanks. I think I got it. It's on my desktop now. Sorry, this is taking a moment. I know we're wanting to move. Okay. All right. So I just sent it to you. And and as Bonnie's pulling it up, um, you know, again, just to reiterate that this is moving forward with components of the catch recommendations, not the full recommendations. Um, it's helping to set clear um, standards and code for us to be able to address quality of life issues, environmental and health and safety impacts, um, and then really move towards developing the yes and of Brent, Mr. Brent Adams of, of implementing a robust homelessness program. So um, the first, if you can scroll up, Bonnie, thank you. So the first friendly amendment is um, to the, the original amendment that Council Member Watkins made around um, the removing the neighborhoods and adding parking lots as, as potential safe sleeping sites. So I would like to add to that, make the amendment to that. Um, and again, this is in line with uh, Catch's recommendations that we um, look, oh, I'm sorry, that's the second part. If we can move down to B. Um, Okay, it's under 2A, I'm skipping around, but I want to address what Council Member Watkins had brought up, um, that, it, that in addition to that, that we within 60 days look at launching a safe sleeping program that, is, um, that has staff and supervision. And this can be in conjunction with um, uh, AFC and or nonprofits. So that's, that's under 2A, that's sort of an amendment to what Council Member Watkins had put up around the parking lot sites. And then we can, so is it okay if I just go through each one of these? Sure. Okay. Okay, so then if we can scroll back up. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about um, this piece around enforcement. Um, so one friendly amendment, again, per Catch's recommendation is to include um, an outreach and engagement portion and to have that proceed or occur simultaneously to enforcement um, of the prohibited outdoor living um, regulations that are in the ordinance. Um, and, and the outreach and engagement, again, can be done either through city, county, staff, or nonprofits or faith community. So we can scroll to the 1B. Uh, this is around the storage programs. You know, it's been brought up that this seems like a difficult piece of uh, breaking down the tents and um, putting them back up. Um, I know that we're offering a storage program, but I think that in order to make the storage program work, one piece of it is to provide transportation for those individuals who need it. Um, and then uh, Council Member Brown, I believe, brought this piece up, is that uh, how will we get this information out? So I, I hear that we have it on the website and we'll have printed documents, but for um, law enforcement and outreach workers to uh, have these these uh, pamphlets or, or and the maps at hand and to provide them in, um, in Sp I have Spanish translation to have them in English and Spanish. So that's the third piece of specific amendments to the ordinance. And then in terms of policy direction, uh, Council Member Watkins had brought some of this up. Um, we already talked about 2A. 2B is really that holistic approach of um, looking at the mental health and intervention piece. 
we have a lot of this in place. Um, we have the HOPES team, we have the downtown streets team, the downtown outreach worker, um, Vice Mayor Brunner brought up a lot of these programs, but it's really looking at how we can tie um, these programs and make the outcomes really city-centric and specific to um, our holistic approach to supporting those who are unhoused. And, and again, the, the little indents are kind of how they align with either catch recommendations and or the homelessness coordinating committee. So these aren't coming out of nowhere. They're not my brilliant ideas. They've been talked about embedded by many people for a period of time. So then moving down to 2C, um, this was already brought up by Council Member Watkins, so I don't know if I need to repeat it, but really looking at the navigation center and where we're at with that. Um, and then I, I did have some parameters around asking, um, uh, that's further down, but, but really asking the, um, the staff to come back um, in a certain time period to let us know where, we at, where we're at and, and uh, what are the next steps for us to move towards that navigation center. Uh, so then the next piece is um, really continuing our work with the, with the city county two by two. Um, and then there's several pieces to this as well, if you can scroll up a little bit. Um, one is to really robustly look at our diversion um, programs that we have in place and, and look at how to expand these, um, including the Homeward Bound program, behavioral health interventions, uh, and access to outreach and case management and job programming. Again, Councilmember Watkins brought this up. I, I would add to this what um, Councilmember Watkins brought up around shelter bed capacity. Uh, and then uh, this piece of the longer term transitional shelter to ensure housing um, pathways are created and create wraparound services. Uh, you know, this is, I think, what um, Councilmember Brown had brought up. Uh, that, that we know that there's interest in the county. Um, I, I think several people had brought up Supervisor Koenig is putting something forward. It's uh, going to be viewed in, uh, by the Board of Supervisors in a couple of weeks. So this is sort of linking to the work that's potentially being done at the county, but really explicitly naming it here. Um, and the time parameter for this is, um, sorry, this is incomplete because we were revising as we were going. Um, but for the, the policy directions above by April 2021, and then the policy directions around the two by two by May 2021, I, I can be flexible around um, those timelines if, if Vice Mayor Brunner and Council Mayor Watkins are. Um, and the note at the end is again, that this would be part of, uh, none of this is sufficient and we have to start somewhere. This is a part of a, a, a larger approach, a countywide approach for us to be able to support those who are unhoused as well as our um, housed community members. So I know that was a lot. <laughs> and this is my first attempt at trying to weave in multiple parts of the motion. So um, I'll just pause there. Oh, I think I'll, I'm just gonna jump in because I, I just wanna make sure I'm, I, I wanna repeat for the public. So I believe you had three language changes in the ordinance specifically, and maybe um, Bonnie, maybe I don't know how to do it most efficiently for you, but maybe those get a yellow highlight or I don't know if they get turned a certain color maybe. Um, so I just wanna make sure we've got those captured. So you've got A, B, and C. Um, uh, she has one A, B, and C, and then two A, B, and C. Now, let me let me just clarify with you, Councilmember Contrary Johnson. The um, the if you go down to two, Bonnie, are those policy? It looks like those are more policy related um, direction. Correct. Right. Um, so I would say one A, B, C are um, recommended language change to the ordinance. However, two um, uh, two A may also now be part of the ordinance given the direction, the amendment from Councilmember Watkins. So two A is um, would be. It looks like. Um, it would be related to the Lee section A, um, I can't remember the, but Lee, the section where you would be putting in the availability to establish um, dedicated sites, correct? Yes, it is related to that section. Um, 
2A would go there. And, and, and I'll just add that I think um, I, I'm, I'm really pleased to see that we're moving in the direction of specifying sites. And I think we will run into challenges um, if we don't have some type of staffing and supervision connected to that. Okay. So, Bonnie, let's try to cap. I'm just trying to capture it. Um, okay. Um, okay. So you uh, so supervised sites is when you say um, safe sleeping sites. Um, You grab that. <laughs> I think we've got maybe cut and paste A up into the actual ordinance change. Yeah. And I don't I think, think we need aligned with the cat or okay, aligned with cash recommendations. Um Yeah, we can take that out. That was I was just trying to show that it's not coming out of nowhere. And Lee, can you can you reference the section that this would go in? So that could go into the same section where we're talking about um, affirmative. Um, let me get that. I'm scrolling to the section right now. Camp 6.36.050 camping slash outdoor living permitted. Um, it could go at the bottom of that section. Okay. Can you say that again? 6.36.050. Five O, and um, that would be uh, you could put it in. That would be a substitute for. I'm gonna. Well, I don't want to share my screen because you've got that up. We had um, the potential that Councilmember Watkins was considering that said uh, to set up the. Um, uh, in all or part of a city owned parking lot, closed portion of the public right of way, um, and so forth. A program for overnight use of no more than 150 safe sleeping spaces. So it could go in that same section, it could replace that, or it could um, be in combination with that. I can share my screen if, if that's helpful for the council. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and do that? And then, and, and sorry, if I if, if I may just complete, um, the, I really I, I strongly believe that these components um, are are necessary and needed to have a more a, a, a strengthened ordinance for us to move forward. So, um, I would like to support this ordinance, and I think these are the pieces that are missing. Um, some of the other pieces, Councilmember Watkins has already has already brought, brought it. So. I'll look the maker of the motion. Um, I also, I believe, missed maybe a motion um, uh, or at least a change meant by Councilmember Colder. Councilmember Colder, you mentioned uh, report back to council in nine months after yeah. nine months to do implementation. Yeah, that would be my desire just because I would like to see if, you know, this is so complicated and it's getting really late and I'm not a night owl. And like, Councilor Cummings said, like, we haven't had an opportunity to read all of the edits. And so, I guarantee we're not getting everything right. And so, I would like us to revisit it in like nine months. And so, we can have some data to look, look back on. And you're referring to if the count, if the ordinance becomes, if it is approved at the second reading, or if we have to go through. Exactly. Exactly. On, or we've got a nine month. Uh, exactly. Got it. To reevaluate. You get that in the motion. Bonnie. So, okay, great. Thank you. And Thank I'll you. make her the motion for whether she'll. Do we uh, have a second on the on council member Watkins motion? Do we have a second? That was me. Okay. I, um, oh, are you ready for me? Yeah, go okay. ahead. 
I'll just start my comments by saying um, I think there is definitely uh, alignment in the direction we want to go, and I want to thank um, Vice Mayor Bruner and Councilmember uh, Kalantari Johnson for your thoughtful work in providing these additional amendments, and I um, definitely feel they're in the spirit of a lot of my thoughts as well. So um, with that, I'm pleased to uh, accept those friendly amendments if the seconder is also willing to do so, as well as including the uh, report back that was referenced by Councilmember Boulder in the nine month time, pay time period. Yeah, and I accept those as well. Thank you for that work. Okay. Um, anything else, Councilmember Collentari Johnson? I know that um, there's also the other part of your motion, which is really policy direction for, for staff follow up. Um, so, uh, uh, look yeah, nothing else from me. Um, I, I know others have their hands up, but I, I would just want Vice Mayor Brenner to chime in as we work on this together, if that's appropriate. Absolutely. Uh, yes, so thank you so much for walking through that. <laughs> I wasn't sure how that would play out, but hopefully that, um, you know, these components really uh, provide a policy direction to carry forward, you know, those components of the cash recommendation as what recommendations as well as the homeless coordinating committee recommendations. Um, we read through a lot of those documents and work and and really uh, can help move us forward to addressing um, and implementing the the overwhelming community input and and um, you know develop get to a point of of developing the programming and the outdoor uh, uh, standards for everybody. So thank you for for taking us through those amendments. Okay. Thank you. I have Council Member Brown and Council Member Cummings next. And then uh, I do want to capture, I think, one other amendment, which was looking at the time, but we can hold off on that. And then I do have one, one amendment myself. So, um, okay, uh, Council Member Cummings and Council Member Brown. Councilmember Brown was first. So. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Councilmember Brown. Um, so I, I just have a few comments. I did have some other questions, but I didn't get to ask them, and I think at this point it's probably um, not worth returning to that. Um, <clears throat> but. Um, so I just, I first want to say, you know, I, I really agree with uh, Councilmember Cummings' comments. I think they're spot on, um, you know, and I won't repeat them, but they really just spot on, you know, I, I wordsmithing um, this kind of, of ordinance from the dais going into pretty close to the 15th hour of our meeting is, you know, I don't believe it's um, the most effective or productive way to make policy. Um, and um, and I also want to really appreciate Councilmember Kalantari Johnson and um, Vice Mayor Bruner's uh, proposals. I absolutely support um, the the staff direction and, and the the other pieces of that um, that that you proposed. And I'm hoping we can uh, take those um, we can separate those from uh, the ordinance motion, the first the reading of the ordinance, uh, so that I can support those. On the record, um, I um, I guess in the you know in, because I've been thinking about this as I you know I I saw the um, what uh, Council Member Collentary Johnson uh, provided in writing and um, you know and I think that I want and I get I get why um, you you want to talk about doing the both and and I agree um, and uh, but my concern is you know perhaps because I've just been through this so many times uh, and watched it happen uh, the city councils I mean I cannot count the number of times that city councils have said oh of course we want to do these things and um, you know and I believe that I don't think it's disingenuous when people say council members say we want to do that um, and then there's always obstacles, and but we have to do this 
this enforcement piece now and then you know and then we'll get to the other stuff and of course it's it's critical and you know and so i i don't want to suggest that when i i say this that i it's a lack of trust or you know i or you know lack of you know I, that i don't think that um people really have good intentions here um and so i want to support those intentions and i want to work with you uh all to uh to to realize those um it's just that uh, you know, we, I, I just can't, you know, and I, and I also believe that there are um, legitimately, there are places in our city that are not appropriate for, um, you know, camp for congregant camping. And, and I, um, you know, and so I don't want to suggest that by not uh, being able to support this ordinance tonight, um, that I'm suggesting, I, you know, that I think that what's happening right now is okay. It certainly is not. Um, I just think that there are other things that we need to tackle um, in order to actually um, achieve the goals that I think we all share. Um, so many people have written in and um, talked about the kind of social, uh, you know, uh, you know, kind of, you know, the the behavioral issues, the um, disorderly conduct issues that. Um, are, you know, lead to really legitimate, and then obviously the litter and all of that, that lead to really legitimate frustrations and fears about, um, you know, what's happening in our community and, you know, around them. And so, I, you know, I, I, I get that. And, um, but I'm also really hard pressed to figure how, um, you know, making it, you know, very difficult for people to have a, a place to stably be and and sleep and have their belongings is going to um, rectify or, or really in meaningfully address those so, those social issues those um, disorderly conduct issues you know we're just you know we're it's a city we're a city we are we have you know land use and you know kind of and increasing levels of um, you know citation infraction to misdemeanor approaches are, are the tools that the city can think of to to address these major social problems and you know it's just it's frustrating all around I know others are frustrated too um, so I just think a more uh, you know appropriate and effective approach would be to commit ourselves to do that hard work that we say we want to do um, and to identify those alternatives before we start make, creating new restrictions. Um, and you know we've had multiple commissions and committees and recommendations come to us and you know and again uh, Councilmember Calentari Johnson has um, integrated some of those into you know and, and identified where though we've seen those and you know and yet we and and the catch you know directed you know recommended that we do this but they said clearly I mean multiple times you need to do both and you need to do them simultaneously and that's not what we're talking about here right now um you know we we know that when people have um the the ability to to, to stabilize their lives when they have some sense of um you know of security of stability um that they can actually perform the basic life functions that most of us take for granted um that it, it greatly improves people's chances of getting out of um you know sometimes terrible situations that they're in and improving their their lives and um you know and yeah and when people are you know i mean just i just think about being constantly worried about you know like losing all my stuff or being ticketed or moved along and trying to actually um like you know figure out how to how to get through the day or you know much less make plans for the future it's just it's just really overwhelming to think about um and so i'm just going to end by saying you know we've received proposals there are people in our community who have been thinking about this who want to work with us we've received proposals from community organizations from faith-based organizations the asc um you know has has um 
consistently and, and more recently, I mean, just in the last couple of days, we've received messaging saying, you know, we want to work with you and here are some of the things that, you know, we can bring to the table. And, you know, the, it, it's like, well, so first of all, those organizations work largely with, you know, volunteer, the help of volunteers. They um, have the ability to raise private funding, you know, donors want to step up and, um, and support these efforts and, you know, and to create some kind of, you know, programmatic and, you know, perhaps permitting or, you know, locational parameters um, to have that conversation and actually um, step up and, you know, AFC is talking about a pilot, you know, I think we ought to be looking at that very seriously. I think we ought to be trying to do that right now. Um, it, before we consider all the ways that we're going to make it impossible for people to have, you know, some place to be. So, you know, as it stands, I, I just, you know, I, I can't support an ordinance like that tonight. I want to support all of the other recommendations that have been made. Um, I just, you know, I just doesn't feel ethical and it, it doesn't feel efficacious, um, it, even if it, you know, seems to satisfy some, you know, with the optics. So um, I'll leave it there. And um, I look forward to um, hearing you all do some wordsmithing. <laughs> I just, I'm like, I can't, I can't, I can't do it. But um, I appreciate your effort. I think what we'll do, um, I know Council Member Cummings, you have your hand up and I'll get you rolling here in a minute, but just so people are tracking. Um, uh, Council Member Colantari Johnson, um, I think it might be better to capture your policy or your, your motions for staff follow-up and some of the items that you listed maybe in a separate motion so that council members potentially can look at that. Um, is that amenable to you, Council Member Watkins? Because those were more based, I think, in, count, in directing staff for additional items, but I, I'm happy to look at what you think in terms of bifurcating those or not. And, and Tony, please weigh in here if that's not what should be appropriate at this time. I think, well, I'll let Tony weigh in if that's needed, but I think one of the other options could be that essentially what we would have is if council members are supportive of um, certain aspects of the motion, then they could indicate that they want for the record that their support of those aspects be, you know, it, included um, or we could go through the kind of the complicated uh, bifurcation, but I don't know what's easiest or how you want to handle it or how Tony. Well, I, I think if that's acceptable to council member Brown, that would be fine if it's noted in the record that she supports those. Um, otherwise, those could be voted on as a separate action item um, after the council votes on the main motion. Okay, and then I just wanted clarification, uh, Lee. Um, as I'm reading the ordinance, if if an organization such as AFC or any other organization wanted to come to the either the city on a public on, on a public property um, with a proposal, or um, if it was a, on private property, I, I, does the ordinance allow, I believe the ordinance allows us to stand up these kinds of facilities that I think some folks are mentioning, but can you clarify that for the council? Sure, thank you, Mayor Myers. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is again in the um, camping and outdoor living permitted section. And we had this provision in here that said at events or in a manner that is authorized by the city council or city manager as temporary safe sleeping sites and or temporary encampments, which may be managed by the city, the county, or an approved nonprofit. We subsequently recommended, um, or I should say, we subsequently added for the council's consideration, oh. <laughs> All right. We subsequently added for the council's consideration the option um, to uh, allow those um, facilities to be um, uh, put up on public 
private or um, public or private properties in any zoning district. Okay. So, so if we broadly said that it's okay, so that was the additional, uh, uh, that was the additional um, bit there. Okay. Um, Council Member Cummings and then Council Member Colin Terry, Colin Terry Johnson, and then I think we're going to try to. And get I will call up a non online version of that. <laughs> Hasn't been hacked into if the council has any other uh, questions related okay. to that. Council member coming. Yeah, I mean, I do because again, I mentioned this when I commented earlier, but um, you know, we kind of went quickly through the yellow line version with the new staff recommendations during the presentation. And personally, I haven't seen a copy of that red line version. And so for me, it's really difficult to be able to provide the appropriate comments, unless we're gonna go through this um, kind of section by section, because um, it'd be really good to see, and I think for members of the public, to see what that new language is. Um, I do have some issues with the warnings, for example. Um, and so, you know, wherever that section is, uh, I think that it's important that everyone receive a warning um, you know, if, if somebody receives a warning and then the police are like, we will come back, you know, you have to be gone in 24 hours or what have you, um, you know, that's an opportunity for people to pick up the things and move along. And, you know, regardless if somebody tears up a ticket and throws it on the ground, I think if you give them a warning and give them time to think about what they need to do to move on, and then if you come back and they're still there, there's a way to enforce. Um, and then again, around the misdemeanors, um, but then, you know, just the yellow line language in general, which tonight's the first time that we've actually seen that and that the public's seen that. And, you know, I get that there is a strong desire to address these issues. Um, I'd say that's the same for many of the issues that are, you know, occurring in our community. But I think that it's, you know, as elected officials, it's our role to be transparent with the public and to take the time necessary to ensure that the public understands what we're voting on and what we're getting the public into. And I don't think that we've done a good job with this ordinance here tonight. I mean, just to provide some of the newer council members and to talk to the public about you know, some examples, you know, when we brought forward the removal of the mission bell, which you know, is something that's largely symbolic but means a lot to uh, the indigenous people of our community and from this land and to other people in our community, I mean, we took that item we worked on it with stakeholders, brought it to the council. We sent it to Historic Preservation Commission for more input. We brought that back to council. and We were able to make a decision on that because we were able to gain the confidence of the people in the community and to be transparent with what we were doing so that throughout that process, there were multiple times for members of the public to comment on this. I get that this is gone, that the catch has provided us with recommendations and other groups have too. But the specific of what we're implementing, this is the first time this has come to the public's attention. And we don't even have the full language in front of us this evening. Um, because of the fact that there's been edits that have been done by staff, we've been introduced to those edits today. Um, but I personally don't feel like I've had enough time to even look over them to understand what we're getting ourselves into. And so, um, you know, regardless of the direction that this goes in tonight, I'm just going to say that I think that this process has not been transparent, and um, and I think that we're going to miss out on a really good opportunity to build consensus within our community. And I think we are dangerously running the line of tearing, you know, open a wound that has been healing over the course of a year, and that um, you know by moving too hastily, we're going to really start pitting people in our community against each other again, as we've seen in previous years. So um, again, I don't feel like I've had enough time to, because we just got it today, I have not seen the staff's uh, changes to the red line version. I feel like the process that we've been going through has not been clear in terms of what's being changed. 
Um, I, I would very much appreciate this motion could be separated because there's a lot of stuff that's been brought forward by uh, council members, Calentary Johnson and Bruner, that um, it'd be good to see that a little bit longer and be able to read that on the screen. I would like to make an, uh, an, a motion at some point um, because I think there's some other things that we're not, that we're neglecting as well related to homelessness that I think we should bring forward related to the quality of life ordinances. Um, but I do think that let's, you know, it'd be good to have these um, separated out and to have more transparency around what we're doing this evening. And I feel like that's lacking. Council member Kalantari Johnson, and then I've got council member, let's see, Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, I think council member Brown was ahead Brown of Brown was ahead of me. Brown was ahead of you. Okay. Can we can we get the the, the red line version? Because I, I was going to ask, is that is that the best place where people want to go? It's 11:30 now. Um, the red line version has been emailed to each of the council members, so you have uh, the version that um, uh, was. It, it, it does not include <clears throat> council member Calentari Johnson's edits. Um, I wasn't able to capture all of those and um, bring them over into the document, but it includes the other edits. It includes uh, council member uh, Watkins edits and the, uh, and the edits that uh, Tony Condotti added in changing the residential, where that residential allowance was located. And that was just sent out right now, right? Or was it? Uh, yeah, it was sent out maybe a half hour ago or something like that. Uh, Thank you. And Mr. Condotti, I might just have you jump in here for a moment. I, I My understanding um, is live red line edits are kind of typical in a, in a first reading of an ordinance, sort of the process mm -hmm. of working yeah. our way through language, correct? Yeah, the first reading is your opportunity to make tweaks to the ordinance, um, and and you can do that uh, so long as um, they're made before the ordinance is introduced. Otherwise, they would have to be brought back for another first reading uh, at a future time. So, so these edits can all be approved by the council um, this evening if there is uh, a majority of council members in favor of them. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, do council members have the ability to pull this up? Um, we can run through this. I, my count, I think there's about 10, 10, length, 10, 10 changes in the language. But it's our pleasure. Okay. I, I'm trying to honor the process. Um, I don't really want to take a vote on it, but I'm just trying to honor a way to, to move this um, forward. Um, Lee, could you simultaneously maybe just run this, run us through this, because I'm not sure if everybody's got their tablets or what have you that yep. they need. Happy to do so, and um, thanks. I think Bonnie's, yeah, Bonnie's got this up here. So um, first edit at the top there is um, uh, removing, could you go, Bonnie, to the section above, so just so we know these sections and we can track, there we go, perfect. So the section under definitions would be great, just so people understand it. So um, removing the uh, vehicle references in the outdoor living facilities um, item, and that's because those are dealt with elsewhere. Um, noting in the outdoor living encampment definition that if things have been there for 12 hours, then they're considered an outdoor living encampment. I'll give you guys a second to read that if you want to. Can do, I make do you a comment? comment? Yes, please go ahead. Um, the, I, the email that I received from Lee has the document without the color changes. It, it has the changes, but they're not in color. So, yeah, I think you have to open it in Word on your tablet. That's what I had to do. Okay. You have to have track changes on, I believe. Yeah. Thank you. 
that yeah and still going down I think you might have yeah Don, Don I wanted to make note of the section so it's private property And um, so this has um, just additional private property, uh, things that could be restricted. Then um, this is the clarification in number seven there, that it's not just neighborhoods and community parks, it's all parks. And then it's um, in number 11 here, this is the um, prohibition on um, camping in the residential zoning districts. So R1, RL, RM, RH, and RS. The hours were discussed. Um, those were flagged in case anyone wanted to make changes to those, but they're, they're as 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. now. Um, then, then, yep. I was gonna ask the mayor a question. If we wanna make changes as we're going along through this, do we just speak up or how would you like us to kind of chime in for those changes? Uh, we could, uh, I was hoping we could go through these. Um, Tony, what, uh, what did, uh, do we, I guess we should do uh, by motion with each change. Um, that is certainly that is certainly one way that you could do it. Mm -hmm. Can these uh, be adopted sort of as a package in concept, or I'm just mm -hmm. trying to understand the most efficient way? But if uh, individual council members have specific changes on these language, I think we will have to have to work through them that's right so if 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 council members would like to discuss or make modifications to any of these provisions it might just be um, a good idea to to flag them and come back to them so that we can sort of gauge whether there's a council consensus on um, you know in general on the the individual modifications. And then I just want to call on council member calling Tari Johnson and council member uh, Bruner next. Uh, did you guys have clarifying questions or additions to, I just didn't want to make sure you had that. Um, no, I think I had my hand up because there was a request to break up the motion and then council member Watkins asked if we could keep it together but have council members address which pieces they support and, and I would like to go in that direction that's why I had my hand up and just wanted to acknowledge um, both council member Brown and Cummings comments and um, appreciate and hear where they're coming from so great thank you okay um, Lee we're or I'll keep going here um, so this um, has the additional allowances for families with children and for um, caregivers um, associated with individuals with a qualifying disability. Any council members want to flag this change? Okay, we'll move forward. This next one is specifying that 
the physician's verification of qualifying disability shall be evidence, but not necessarily binding evidence. Any comments from council members on this change? I have a question on that. Um, so I, I, I somewhat under, I understand what this is trying to get to is that physician's verification um, that an individual doesn't have to have physician's verification in order for them to have a disability. Is that the intention of this? I or is it, because the opposite that I read it is that um, someone can have a physician's verification, though that's not necessarily binding to protect them in all instances either. That is how I read the, um, the change, is that um, there, still, there could be some discretion there. So, so if that's I, not something the council's interested in, then they could scratch that. So I guess in this, with that, it's, it, the idea is that even if it's determined that a physician has diagnosed me with a physical disability, that can still be overlooked in terms of whether or not I need to take down my tent or move or what have you. That is how I interpret this is that there would be opportunities to um, uh, consider cases alternatively. Tony, do you have anything to add on that? Okay. I'll, I guess I'll just say with that that this and there, I think there's another one uh, in here around the warnings that are like seriously subjective and leaves a lot of discretion for people to determine who should be, you know, who should be giving a warning, who shouldn't. And it also gives discretion of whether someone wants to take a physician's note seriously or not. And that can be very problematic. I think that there's that starts getting along the lines of discrimination in some cases. So I'll leave my comments there. Council Member Watkins. I guess my, my clarification behind, or my question for clarification behind this is, um, is that, in the, as you read it, Lee, is that um, in the circumstance in which an individual may have a qualifying disability um, but be living in an encampment at, say, a very dangerous location, and even though their disability, like, I, I mean, I'm just trying to discern where the circumstances might come in where that would be a real problem. Um, if, if, if it's about abating or mitigating a, you know, a, a, an encampment that's not um, safe for our community, is that how you read that, or am I? That's not the way I read this. Is that a physician's? So a physician could say, you know, someone um, has, you know, someone uh, has mobility challenges, and a, a police officer could uh, be there and and see an alternative uh, to that. They could then under this. They could um, say that that is not the case. So if this is that the disability, that that disability is not present, that's how I'm reading this. And so if that's not something that the council is interested in uh, including, is that subjectivity as Councilmember Cummings uh, puts it, then. Um, you should remove this this uh, suggestion suggestion or consideration. Council Member Contari Johnson. Yeah, if that that is in fact how this piece reads, um, uh, I guess I I want to know why it was added, and and I um, share Council Member Cummings' concerns that um, it could lead to discrimination. The subjectivity of it. Councilmember Golder. 
I agree with the, my colleagues. I was confused by the vagueness of the definition originally, but I'm not sure I, this clears it up for me, um, the, the definition around disability, because there's a lot of disabilities that you can't see. And um, so I'm just, I don't know where to go with it, but I just, um, I, I, don't, I just don't like the vague language of it either. Councilmember Watkins, would you entertain a motion to edit this out or try to resolve yeah. that? Yeah, no, I think I appreciate the clarification because I wasn't reading it the same. So yeah, given that, I think it's important that we just remove that at this point. We're going. I would say, uh, Bonnie, you could just um, remove it, and because we've got the the red line that's that's being yeah. So I think that works. I wasn't sure if you were going to reference that in the motion itself. I was. Yeah, I think just by deleting it here, I think we're good. Okay. Next item. Uh, so the next item is, uh, these are reasons why um, things can be closed. Um, so cleaning, maintenance, limiting the incidence or frequency of sale, of the sale of unlawful drugs, limiting or controlling the incidence of crime, the incidence or, infrequen or frequency of domestic violence or other violence, limiting the accumulation of debris, garbage, and syringe waste, limiting the amount, duration, and effect of urination and defecation on public and private property, limiting the duration of adverse effects on the surrounding area, neighborhoods, and businesses, and or addressing health and safety concerns. So it adds in additional um, clarifications on why uh, the city manager could close an area. I have a quick question. Is there anywhere in here where it's stipulated where the city will provide, um, whether it's porta potties or hand washing stations, but sanitation facilities where these outdoor living environments are going to be identified? Because I see where we're. I, I see a lot of the prohibition, but I don't see much of, you know, in the instances where we're going to designate uh, safe camping or we're going to allow people to pitch tents. Is there any, like, I haven't seen, I, it, it didn't stand out to me that there's anything in the language that says that the city will provide, um, you know, facilities for people to use for the purposes of using the bathroom and hygiene. All right, so there isn't anything specifically in the ordinance that calls out those facilities that uh, that I can recall, other than, I mean, the, the allowance for them. So, you know, in the uh, <clears throat> provisions related to um, the outdoor encampments and uh, safe sleeping sites, that um, is, uh, in a manner that is approved by the city manager uh, or by the city council. And so, you know, that could inherently and would likely, you know, we would expect to, to, include, to include those. But there isn't anything to your, I think, what you were getting at, um, which is like, you know, if, if things are allowed in the open spaces, if camping's allowed in the open space, would restrooms be provided in the open space? There's nothing specific to that in the code as it currently reads. Right. And I, I guess for my colleagues, um, I just, you know, if it's it's sounding like based on where we're prohibiting people to sleep and camp, it sounds like this is going into the open space. I think part of this was to protect our, you know, to protect the environment. A lot of what we're trying to push forward is for the purposes of environmental protection. And if people are going and they're, if we're designating that it's okay for people to sleep out in our open spaces, and we're not providing, you know, trash or bathrooms. We're going to see a lot of environmental degradation happening. So I'll just leave that there um, for people to consider. Councilmember Collintari Johnson, do you have a question? 
Uh, just a comment. I think I think we addressed it, but that that would be part of the that amendment that was proposed that we look at a safe sleeping program. That's part of that model, is my understanding. Yes, yeah, the the restrooms would be if we had a safe sleeping program, we would include restrooms. Um, and uh, hygiene station, hand washing stations, as well as looking to all the other um, provisions that would be expected elsewhere, you know, areas being kept free of litter and so forth. Any other comments? And I, I agree with council member Cummings assessment of that. Um, I think what we were trying to, I think the intent of this was to balance um, the availability of places for people to go. Um, and um, I personally would feel better that our open space areas were actually not available. Um, and I'm not sure we can go there based on all the analysis that's been done. Um, again, trying to strike the balance of providing um, uh, clear places for people to be um, and not continuing to narrow that down. Um, but to the extent that um, we could potentially put, um, based on assessment, maybe uh, look at, you know, the installation of some facilities at if open space areas do seem to be being used, which they've already been being used for years. Um, you know, there's there's been people uh, you know, using our open spaces in this manner, unfortunately, for many, many years. Um, I don't know if there's a way we can we can look at that. Um, obviously, in, after the assessment period, but I agree. If you know people are going to be ending up in those areas, um, it would be um, behoove us to try to put some kind of sanitation pieces in there. Um, I'm not sure exactly what that looks like um, versus uh, closing, you know, trying to narrow the availability of some of those areas down. So I'm not ready to make a change on this particular language. Is there a change on the language that anyone wants to do by motion? Council Member Contar Johnson. I was just stretching. <laughs> oh, you were, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, you want to scroll down, Lee, to the next section? So we're in the uh, the permitted section, camping and outdoor living permitted. And um, under C, <clears throat> this would add um, that the city manager or city council can authorize temporary safe sleeping sites or temporary encampments. And we clarified here that that can happen on any public or private properties in any zoning district, including in areas that would otherwise prohibit such uses. So there were some questions that came in from the public um, that said, hey, you know, you can't do this in downtown. Don't you think, you know, you wanna think about parking lots downtown? And we, so we said, oh, well, that's unclear. We, let's clarify that. Let's make sure that we've got that information um, clear for, us and the public. And then the next one is um, in all or part of a city owned parking lot, closed portion of a public right of way on private property or in an alternate space or area designated by the city manager for safe sleeping. And this specifies that city manager or their designee shall establish a program for overnight use of no fewer than 150 safe sleeping spaces in such areas subject to all the criteria. Now, this is where Councilmember Kalantari Johnson had, uh, we were going to um, insert that provision that she had about um, safe sleeping. Um, the way that I understood it was that that was in addition to this, but um, I, I'll leave that up to the council in terms of how they want to do that. So, so. Um, Bonnie, you could actually drop the language from the motion and right here as E, if, if it is in fact in addition. And I saw Councilmember Kalantari Johnson shaking her head. Yes, it's in addition.
I have too many things open right now. Hold on. <laughs> Can we go back to that for? Oh, sorry. I just have a quick question, if I may, Mayor. Justin. Um, with that last blue line um, comment, so, you know, I'm just thinking back to some of the safe, you know, like some of the sites where we've had people sleeping in the past few years. And for example, if I remember correctly, and please, if anybody out there, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but if I remember correctly, um, at 1220 River Street, I think it was about 80 tenths that we had allocated at that site. And so, you know, give or take, you know, maybe 100 people plus. And what I read in this, in the blue, what we see here in blue is that, you know, we can't set up uh, an overnight sleeping program for fewer than 150 people. So I'm just wondering if that is kind of the intention. So what that means is that if we wanted to set up a smaller site, you know, especially during COVID where people have to socially distance, if we wanted to set up a site for people that's less than 150 individuals, then this actually prevents the city manager from doing that. The intent here was to actually require the city manager to set up at least 150 spaces throughout a number of areas. So, you know, it could be one large one of 150, um, or it could be, um, uh, you know, 15 small ones of 10. Um, but the intent here was to require that. So uh, if there's some uh, misunderstanding, we should probably look at um, some quick wordsmithing. Um, so the program uh, for overnight use um, which cumulatively has, instead of of, which cumulatively has no fewer than 150 safe sleeping spaces in such areas. I, I, I think that the language as written um, does not restrict the city to one program with 150 spaces, but it can be, it, it just designates 150 um, uh, spaces shall be made available. I don't. I don't think a change is necessary to to be consistent with what is intended here. Yeah, that that helped my understanding of that. I was. I just needed the clarification. So thank you, Councilmember Contari Johnson. Um, yeah, just two things. I think for Bonnie, I think just to add um, within 60 days of ordinance passage might complete my addition to it. Um, and if we want to have, um, you know, an alignment with the cash recommendations or something like that, I think that should that should complete that. Um, but to the, um, so hopefully that is clear for Bonnie, or you can just drop in what I sent you. Yeah, I, am I just copying and pasting what you sent or are you gonna wordsmith it right now? Um, you could copy and paste what I sent, but I think it's all here and it just needs to have within 60 days of ordinance passage added to it. Because the safe sleeping program is, is listed here, right? So this is your language from what you sent okay. me? Yeah. I'm just wondering if, if it's saying the same thing, but it's specifying within 60 days. But we can leave it in there just to make sure it's all there. Um, and then I'm so just wondering, oh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Lee, um, this is more directive because it has specific dates. Yeah. And so, then I'm going to post this one right here. So it, you know, I think the issue, yeah, go ahead, Lee. I was going to say, so um, is the intent, uh, Councilmember Palantari Johnson, to combine these? I, yeah, I think so. I think there's, yeah, 
the intent okay. is to combine them. Okay. Um, there may be just a couple pieces missing from item D, from what I proposed. So, and so um, I think that uh, we can add the date in and um, in the 60 days and um, You want the specific um, cash recommendations in the uh, the ordinance language as well. What I would um, recommend is that what I would recommend is that that direction be given as a separate um, motion or as part of the motion that includes approval of the language of the ordinance because they have a number of things in there that, um, for instance, the catch is not defined in the ordinance. Uh, and the catch's recommendations aren't um, referenced in the findings or anything of that nature. And so um, I think that would be that would be better included as a motion to accompany the ordinance. Uh, otherwise, we could spend a fair amount of time finessing that language to incorporate it into the language of the ordinance itself. Yeah, I think I think that's fine if we want to um, just add uh, a, the safe sleeping program with catch recommendations in in the lump with the policy recommendations, and just have this um, launch a safe sleeping program within 60 days of ordinance passage and no later than June 30th, 2021. Maybe we just have that piece of it, and the reference to catch can be part of the policy recommendation, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I think that works because the, the dates are, uh, the dates work. If it's accessible, it looks like Susie might have something to add. Yeah, go ahead, Susie. Come yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Lee. And I, I just wanted to mention in contemplating the safe sleep of these for the last several months, if not years, that I think at this point, if there is um, an intention to move forward with a program um, with pretty significant haste, I don't think the 150 number is realistic, nor do I think that we will actually be able to meet that expectation. So my, my recommendation is to actually phase that in eventually, but for the first part of this program to really not focus on any more than about 60 spaces. Um, and I think we, you know, per um, Council Member Golder's recommendation, this certainly can be reevaluated in nine months, but I just don't think, um, I think we might be setting ourselves up with, for failure with so many. Yeah. That was going to be the separate, second part of my question is how feasible is 150? Council Member, um, Golder, and then, yeah. Go ahead, Council Member Golder. I was just gonna, I had a quick question for Susie. Susie, how long do you think it would take to get up to 150, like realistically? Well, I think what you wanna do is is build a reasonably managed program, um, you know, until winter shelter season, um, collect some data on how the programs are managing within the sites that have been selected and then also be able to evaluate demand. I mean, we're really not entirely certain what demand is gonna look like for these programs. And so I think, um, you know, maybe the objective is to evaluate um, sometime in early September for um, the, you know, around the question of whether an expansion is required. Um, but at this point, I would not expect the need to look at that, and I think it should be data-driven um, between now and, and fall, for instance. So are we comfortable with um, maybe not putting timelines on all of this in the ordinance and looking at um, future staff direction potentially even at the second reading, so we can clarify all of that with um, with staff direction in terms of some of these timelines. I think the, the key with the ordinance maybe is to try to keep the language as long lived as possible to the extent that we can. Um, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I, I think what I was hearing um, as a suggestion from Susie was the the keeping the 
to 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 um, move forward with the programming within 60 days, but but limit that the safe sleeping spaces to 60 for now, and then when we revisit in nine months or in September, that um, we could look at expanding that. But having having a parameter of standing this up within two months of the ordinance passing, I think it's still important to have. Martin, um, are you, I, I just have a question about the language where it said shall establish a program for overnight use of no fewer than 150. So if we sat, if we sat up 60, we would still be in concert because otherwise we're gonna have to go back in and change that back to 150 in nine months. So I'm just wondering, is that right, Lee? The way I'm reading it is you could go up to 150 right. minimum, right? So that would be um, okay. I guess the concern here is that we need to be able to demonstrate that there are places where people who um, don't have a place to go can spend the night in the city. And we need to be able to demonstrate that to, um, you know, Judge Van Kulen at some point or another judge in the event of a legal challenge. One way to do that might be to tie the implementation of the daytime ban with uh, the, the provision of safe sleeping spaces to accommodate the number of people sleeping out of doors um, in, in the community. That's, that's the possibility. 150 was a thumbnail uh, estimate of space that would be able to accommodate people that might avail themselves of this option as opposed to the option of trying to find a place in uh, one of the open areas. Uh, Council Member Watkins, um, your thoughts on this as a motion maker? Yeah, I think we could, I mean, I think we can keep it up, you know, up to 150, that makes sense to me for the reasons that have been uh, specified. Um, I guess my only additional input or question or comment, depending on how, how we want to do it, is um, if there's additional locations that are available in terms of our sheltering options, you know, how does that play into the spectrum of um, sleeping locations that fall into this sort of um, legally uh, safer uh, language, and maybe that's for you, Tony. Then, Could or does it not factor in? Does it not factor that in? Could you restate that for me, please? I guess my my question is, is I mean, I'm I'm fine with leaving it at the 150, but my question is, is if there are additional, this is safe sleeping spaces, right? But there are the sleeping um, considerations also factor in the fact that we have other sheltering options available. And so when you mention the legal constraints, how does that fall into that spectrum based on your opinion? Or I I could, completely separate? I wish I could um, break it down to a precise number or a, or a precise uh, target that would, that would get this right. Um, but that's, that's not what we have here, it's really a, you know, a series of measures that that we intend to provide a, a location where anyone who is uh, finds themselves out of doors uh, on a given night in the city can find a location where they can, you know, pitch a tent or curl up in a sleeping bag. So this is just one component of it, and I don't think there's any, or at least we certainly have not um, been able to just given all of the all of the different factors and uncertainties that we've been talking about we haven't been able to pin down a precise number uh or you know where where we get it just right okay okay sounds like we're okay on that language uh we just got a couple more pages to go uh, sorry 
Was there a question on that language? I was I was just going to make one comment. It, it does seem, I mean, it, it came up, but it seems like this is saying, since it says, shall establish a program for overnight use of no fewer than 150, I felt like, does that need to be changed to, um, like up to or greater than 150 if we want to have fewer than 150 because the way that it's stated right now is that it's 150 is the minimum. And it sounded like there was a desire to have an opportunity to have less and build up to that 150 and above. But the way that that's stated, the way that I'm reading it is that if it says no fewer than 150, then that means the city manager is obligated to establish at a minimum 150. So, I mean, that's right, and I, I think that's 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 a good comment. Um, the way I envision that being implemented, and I, I, I certainly think that it's possible that we'll be coming back to the council with fixes to this ordinance, but the way I anticipate that being implemented is as we do public outreach and we do establish storage facilities, and as we do um, a lot of outreach to the homeless community, this can be implemented as part of that, but it doesn't require that on the 30th day following the second reading, we go out and mark 150 spaces in parking lots in the city. Council Member Watkins? I mean, I, I appreciate the clarification and I think that where I was coming from is that if there are better sheltering options available, we also want to direct individuals to better sheltering, right? So that factors into it. And I guess what it speaks to really is what I think Susie brought up, which is essentially how do we become eventually data driven in regards to what our um, provision of these options are, right? right. But starting with this, I, I understand. So I'm, I'm comfortable leaving it at, at right now. Okay. Next, uh, next page, please, or next, uh, next comment change. Okay, these are the additional criteria under which uh, the camping has to happen, and it uh, just clarifies electrical connections um, or taps. We just had taps before. The next section E um, specifies that. Um, Campfire, it, it calls out some additional types of fires and it specifies that um, lawful campfires within designated fire pits are acceptable. I'll give you a second, maybe uh, give everybody a sec to read that by even the top part. Maybe we give a thumbs up when, when folks are ready to go. Everybody have a chance to read these two? Mm -hmm. uh, okay. The second one as well, the F, um, that's keeping, keeping trash in a box and actually picking it up. Um, so removing it at the end of the stay. Everybody okay with that? Box or bag or similar. Okay. This one, oh, question. Go ahead, Renee. I have a question. Okay, so I was just thinking like logistically, if it was me and I was packing up my camp, then where am I supposed to take the trash? And so I'm wondering if we can have um, dumpsters or place to put trash at the same place where people could store their belongings. I don't know if that can be and where, where, where we could put this like a future direction or somewhere in here, but it just like, if we want people to clean it up, where are they gonna take it? That's one of my thoughts. Thanks, yes, that I think is something that would um, provide that opportunity to comply and encourage compliance. Um, so G, wow, it's pretty late for G. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so G is this, uh, why don't I give you guys a minute to all read G and then um, I can explain the intent of it.
based on the number of uh, individuals with a qualifying disability, as well as their caretaker. But if you have one person, and, or you have 20 people and one person that's disabled, it's not each person gets a, mm -hmm. sorry, you have 20 people and one person is disabled, you don't have a, a 12 by 12 for all 20 people, just for that one. And if they have a caretaker, it would be an extra 12 by 12. Councilmember Watkins? I just, I'm wondering how does this factor into our conversation about what we determined was a qualifying disability and um, and does that need to be defined then given the previous conversation we had about that? Yeah, I think that um, the, uh, the qualifying, this, this would just refer back to the prior um, language regarding qualifying disability. The council chose to remove the section that provided discretion. So then it would revert back to the definition that says, um, and, and Bonnie, if you wanted to scroll up, um, we can get to that. If you scroll slowly, I'll tell you when. Keep going, keep going. Uh, other way, sorry. Yep, that way. Um, keep going. Keep going. It'll be um, an indented portion. Um, keep going. Keep going, this is almost it, just above here. So in A, so here, uh, qualifying disability is a uh, person with a physical or mental disability that prevents that person from being able to, on a daily basis, construct, deconstruct, and put away an outdoor living encampment. And um, then it's got the provisions, um, if it's not apparent to city staff, they may be asked to present a physician's verification. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Boulder, did you have a question on this one? On yeah, I guess mine was um, along the lines of Councilmember Watkins, and then I was just wondering, I, I'm not sure what they use at the DMV to define um, handicap or physical handicap, but I'm wondering if we could use something like that. Just, I just, it still feels like, like super vague to me. Like you could go to the chiropractor or I don't know, my sister got a doctor's note so she could take her dog on a plane. Like, it seems like a, a bit of a loophole. And not that I don't trust everybody that they do, but I think also like it might create distrust between law enforcement and people that have other disabilities that they might not be able to see, like a disc blown out in their back or something, I don't know. Yeah. So, so the council is aware. Um, that was a discussion topic of you know should it should we just use a, a DMV um, uh, uh, determination? And we looked at the DMV determinations. Um, we actually thought that it could be easier to um, get a physician's note than to actually have to go down to DMV. But um, you know, I think it's a fair comment, and perhaps um, if this is amenable to the council, it could be either or, and that would allow some uh, flexibility so that if they um, meet the DMV criteria and they have, say, a driver's license that um, specifies that, then uh, that would work, or if they have the physician's note. And then that, um, it gets to Councilmember Cummings' um, concerns earlier about, you know, would someone be able to get access uh, to the doctor? That would just be, you know, one additional way to make it a little bit easier. So just a suggestion if, if that's something you'd be interested in. Councilmember Cummings, Councilmember Colin Tari Johnson, I believe was next, and then Vice Mayor Bruner, is that correct in order? I think it was. Okay, good. That's what I thought, but I just want to make sure. Uh, Councilmember Cummings, are you? I, I put my hand down, but okay. um, but I did have a comment. I was wondering um, how folks felt about, because it came up earlier in the conversation around the 8 a.m. to 8 p.m., and I'm wondering if the, um, the encampment hours um, actually for, I guess, establishing an encampment will be one hour before sunset to 8 a.m. And that's just to really, you know, especially in the winter, allow for if people need to set up their encampment during the, 
while it's still light out. You know, an hour before dark in the winter is about four o'clock, but then in the summer it's about eight p.m. So just trying to put in that buffer for when people are going to need to escape kind of the nighttime elements. Because um, again, if people can't set up a tent before eight p.m. in January, that means that they're you know out and about for three plus hours in the dark and in the cold, and then they have to set up their tent in the dark. And if we're saying that people have to be in open space, that means they have to go get their tent from the storage, hike all the way out into wherever the open space is, you know, ensure they're 75 feet off of a path, establish a camp. And so I'm just curious how people feel about that. Uh, proposed, so proposal for the timing, um, and then we can maybe go back to the, thought Cassie came on, but maybe she, she yeah, she was, she was just on, so. So let's, let's finish, if we don't mind, let's finish where we were on the thread with the qualifying disability, and before we move to the time, uh, if you, if that's okay, um, I have council member Kalantari Johnson and council member Bruner. Uh, mine was to just go back to that um, shelter program, but I can wait until we're finished going through the entire piece and then go back. Council member, I mean, excuse me, Vice Mayor Bruner. Nope, hand down. Oh, you're, you're muted, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor. I had uh, noticed uh, the language uh, earlier, and maybe that's what Council Member Kalantari Johnson wanted to bring up uh, regarding the 60 days uh, language. So I don't know if you want to come back to that or uh, keep going on this current thread. Why don't we Why don't we finish this thread? Um, is there Lee? You put out a bunch of options for us. Was there any interest in in any of those qualify for future qualifying or people comfortable with the disability language. I'm just looking for uh, either. Cassie would like to comment on the dis qualifying disability language. Go ahead, Cassie. Thanks, just really quick. Um, so this is an extremely challenging issue, uh, um, how to deal with people with disabilities within the scope of this ordinance in a way that's um, reasonable and fair and um, also doesn't eviscerate the entire ordinance and the intent of the ordinance to have able-bodied individuals um, up and moving around every day. Um, so that's been extremely challenging. I do, I do say in the draft language, there is a provision that talks about city staff potentially drafting clarifications um, to the extent um, that um, council deems that appropriate, that's an option to sort of um, kick that down the line a little bit. And we did look at the DMV language. I think it's a little bit different. Um, the factors in, you know, somebody who can, let's say, um, not walk all the way. It's, it's similar, but it's a little bit different because what we're looking for is people who really cannot um, do what's required every day by the law, which is um, disassemble and reassemble their encampment every single day. So I think some of the factors are similar to the DMV language, but some of it's um, a little bit different. And I think um, within the scope of the current language, we could sort of leave it up to staff to figure out some regulations later, um, or you guys could are uh, free to uh, do that clarification tonight. Thank you, Kathy. I think with not being an attorney and having the kinds of things that the eye to the the kinds of things, I think um, if it's the councils um, and the motion makers that 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 staff could could fine tune some of these true legal definitions to to move, keep moving tonight. Looks like everybody's got consensus on that. Okay. So we will keep moving down the list then. And then I, I, I have not lost track of um, the next proposal since we do have um, a question around the, the timing uh, proposal to change it from 8 a.m. to um, an hour before sunset to 8 a.m. was the proposal, correct, Council Member Cummings? And the motion, uh, the motion maker, is that amenable to you? 
Was it an hour before sunset and an hour after sunrise? Or no, I'm sorry, it was an hour before some sunset to 8 a.m.? Yeah, I'm open to that at this time. Does that work for you, uh, Mayor? Yeah, I'm just wondering about whether if, if 7 a.m. might be better just in terms of um, people kind of heading off and moving around in cars and things like that. 8 a.m. is a little more of a of a active period of time. So an hour before sunrise, sunset to um, 7 a.m. Sure. Okay. 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 I would just say that is referenced a number of times throughout the ordinance. So um, if council could include as part of their motion for us to um, rectify those uh, other uh, areas where the time is cited. Yeah, so included. Okay, Ooh, what's next? We're almost there. Tell that. I believe council member coming you had a question you had a I believe you had um, you had mentioned earlier that you wanted to talk about the warning language do you want to visit that that's not red line for tonight but if you have proposals we could I assume it, we yeah let's go ahead and talk about that sure so I think it's in it's in section 6.36.070 penalties for violations. Uh, on the third line, uh, it says cities. Oh, wait till you get to it. So in the third line um, on the right, it says city staff shall consider giving the person a verbal warning, a verbal or written warning before an infraction citation is issued. Um, and I don't know, I just personally feel like that again is a gray area with where the discretion that's provided can lead to you know people favoring certain to give certain people warnings over others and i feel like it might just be in order to be consistent just giving people warnings verbal or written um before issuing a, an infraction citation i think is would be appropriate. And the way I think of this too is that if someone gets a warning on, you know, Monday and then they're encountered again on a Friday, I don't know if that would necessarily constitute needing to give an additional warning again. Or if there's, you know, if we want to put timelines around when if somebody's issued a warning, so say they're issued a warning and then a month from now they encounter that officer again, you know, do they get another warning or if they end up in another part of the town where they didn't know that they could camp do they get a warning? Because um, I just think that, um, you know, one, it's removing that discretion of, you know, somebody coming across someone and saying, I'm not going to give you a warning, I'm just going to give you an infraction. Um, and they legally have the right to do that uh, versus someone getting a warning. And given that it's not really clear where people are supposed to go to figure out where they can and can't sleep, if somebody gets up and moves and they are still in a no sleeping zone, do they then get an infraction or do they get a warning again? And I guess with the efforts that will be made to ensure that once people are warned that they're clearly given, um, the, the areas for sleeping have been clearly identified and communicated to the individual so that they can avoid, you know, getting an infraction or any further consequences, so. Tony, do you want to take that one on? I mean, yeah, I, I, oh, oh, go ahead, Cassie. Is that Cassie? I think, no. Uh, I, sorry. Uh, I, I think the intent of this language was to deal with the situation where uh, an officer or, or staff member encounters someone who 
has clearly been warned or cited multiple times, and so they know that that person is aware of the of the restrictions of the ordinance and are clearly um, doing what they're doing with knowledge that they're in a location or they're they're set up uh, in a manner that is uh, prohibited by the ordinance. That being said, I think Council Member uh, Cummings, uh, I, I have a little bit of discomfort with the language shall consider giving a warning myself. We have not come up with a better way to address specifically um, the concerns that are uh, behind that. Um, but the intent here is really just to, uh, it, it's really to deal with the situation where the person is well aware of the requirements of the ordinance and where a warning um, would, would just be, you know, something that is, is unnecessary because the person is already aware that they're in violation of the ordinance. So um, we could try to change that and, or the council could direct that a warning be given in each instance and that could be implemented as well. Yeah, I, I guess my thoughts would be the city staff shall give the person a verbal written warning before an infraction citation is issued. And then the warning scratch if given shall provide the person with information about legal indoor shelter and or permissible nighttime sleeping operation options and then scratch the next sentence and then just have city staff also may but not but shall not be required to transport the person to available shelter or permissible sleeping van uh, locations can you repeat that so city sure. staff shall um so scratch that consider giving and just put give. And then in the next sentence, scratch if given. Uh, and then scratch the next sentence, the warning shall. That entire sentence would disappear. That's it. If I can interject here, sure. Mayor. Oh, sorry. Um, I just want to make sure that we understand the intent of council on this in terms of uh, how long of a time period this warning uh, would last for. Um, logistically, it could become very complex to try to get all the warnings given to a particular person and how we we don't necessarily have a record system in place for that. So, um, you know, just so I understand, is it I'm giving you a warning, you're refusing to go, and therefore I'm going to issue you a citation now, or is it I warn you once every week, uh, for, you know, uh, before I issue a citation on a regular basis? Uh, and then we can make sure that it happens however the council wishes to do it. Awesome. Comment? For the chief? You know, I even personally, if I, if I may, um, you know, I think even if you give someone a warning, and I, and I guess it'll be, we're, we're going to have to wordsmith this somehow, but, you know, even if you give somebody a warning and, you know, they tell you they're not going to comply in probably more colorful words, um, then, you know, I think that that would be grounds for giving someone, issuing someone a citation. And so, you know, I don't think it has to be like, we're gonna give you this warning, we're gonna come back in 24 hours, you know, it's, here's your warning. And, you know, I don't know if we need to set a, a time frame around when people have to move, um, if we haven't set that already. But, um, yeah, I think just by, you know, giving someone the opportunity to, to pack up their stuff and go, um, seems appropriate. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, that, would be, that would be fine, um, just as long as, because what we wouldn't want to do is, is keep coming back, you know, four or five times to the same person. This is going to be a big enough push as it is for us, let alone uh, coming back multiple times, uh, which we do, we give warnings almost every time anyway. Uh, but uh, we understand your intent now. Uh, may I comment? 
Yeah, and then I have Vice Mayor Bruner and then uh, Councilmember Golder. I'm not sure if you guys are on this part, um, but go ahead, Councilmember. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the um, amendment that was that was proposed by myself and Vice Mayor Brunner around the um, outreach and engagement preceding um, preceding um, uh, enforcement it goes in this section. So I, I don't know what the language looks like, but the, so the warning would be with outreach and engagement. So I wanted to just add that and clarify that. Um, and I also just want to say that you know this may be goes counter to my social worker hat, but I do think that strong enforcement is necessary. Otherwise, um, the ordinance won't be effective. So I hear Chief Mills' um, comments, and, and I think that we have to have both. We have to have the prevention, outreach, engagement, and we have to have the ability to enforce when um, there's a problematic situation. Otherwise, people will take advantage. So uh, on that note, I think that that's and at the end of this paragraph is is uh, the place where the language suggested by Councilmember Kalantari Johnson could be inserted um, with the modifications that were proposed if they're acceptable to, to the council. And that's regarding the um, the outreach. Yes. yes. And you suggest that at the at the end of the paragraph there, Bonnie, could you? Could you cut and paste that there? And then I have Council Member Golder. Did you have further comments on? I'm sorry, actually, I said, and then Council Member Golder. <laughs> I was actually going, if it helps Bonnie, I can read it. That's why I had my hand up um, to just notate this section is um, um, in in the friendly amendment section that uh, we put forth. So um, per the catch's recommendations, ensure that outreach proceeds or occurs simultaneously to enforcement of prohibited outdoor living mm -hmm. to the greatest extent possible, for instance, when public safety, or except for when public safety, life safety is not under immediate urgent or threat. Outreach could take the form of city, county, nonprofit, or, or faith-based contact with identified individuals on a complaint basis or within a structured proactive program. And it ties in too with um, the um, third part of this being the that all outreach materials be created and disseminated to, um, in, you know, hard copies, paper versions, to remove all barriers to access of the information. Um, you know. So can I suggest a couple of minor modifications to that? Yes, please. So I would recommend deleting per the catch's recommendations again. Um, and just stating that city staff shall ensure that outreach. And I think the word there is precedes rather than proceeds. Correct. Would you remove the last, the reference on the last bullet as well? The bullet, yeah, I think that was a rationale for the language, not not the text that Council Member Callantar Johnson was suggesting. Uh, Council Member Golder, do you have questions on this? Um, it's about the warning. So I'm just curious, is the intent then that let's say you give me a warning, I move along? And then let's say two days later, you give me a warning at a new spot, you gave me the information, I move along, I just keep getting warning, 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 or if, if I comply, then I, won't, then I won't ever reach the level of infraction? 
even if I'm not following the rules or a citation, whatever the next, is that? Tony, or, Tony or Andy, do you have a comment on that? That, that is how I read the language as, as currently written. Which, I mean, that, that might be what the council intends. Um, I, I, I think, you know, in, enforcement is intended to be, um, you know, the last, the, la the last option when other uh, good options have been exhausted. So even if I'm not really complying with where I'm supposed to be, if I just keep moving from place to place where I'm not supposed to be, will I still just keep getting warnings? That's what I mean. Like, if I do, we need to have language. If if we wanted to, I think Council Member Golder, and this was kind of part of what I was going to mention with the warning. Does it need to specify verbal warning, written warning? Um, you know, within the hour or 24 hours or some time frame, um, the manner and the time. Does, does that need to be included? Or? I guess I just, my concern is that like maybe one or two individuals make, make enforcement really hard for a couple, you know, for people by just, you know, manipulating the warnings. I don't know. I have a, qu a quick question, if, if I may, Mayor. Yeah, that's fine. I guess I'm, I'm just wondering if at a certain point this is sort of discretionary for those specific individuals that might have um, frequent contact with law enforcement. Um, if as written, it kind of provides that that window of kind of opportunity to one, of course, shall provide that warning, but if, if in terms of frequency is when they would instigate it to go into a higher level of intervention, that would be sort of discretionary. I'm gonna look to Chief Mills um, to weigh in here. Um, I think we're trying to create something that works um, in the field, kind of, I think I'd rely on your expertise to try to see what this this language, just trying to look at it from the uh, implementation perspective. Yeah, from an implementation perspective, uh, we certainly can give a warning uh, when we contact people. Um, the more specificity you give us, I think the better, so that we understand your intent of what you're trying to accomplish. Um, but from an operational perspective, uh, we've got to give our officers enough authority to do their job. And so if we warn somebody on Monday and then we warn them on Tuesday and then we warn them on Wednesday, then we might as well not issue any citations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, that's, I think that We've got we've got to give them the tools they need to to go out and and in good faith um, cite people after the person has been warned adequately. And the definition of adequate to me is if if we give them a flyer that is approved by the city manager uh, and myself to define where they can go and they choose not to. Um, then I think that the only thing left to do is start citing them um, in, until they comply. So multiple contacts at different sites is not envisioned, um, I don't believe by, I would not be envisioned as, but I'm happy to hear uh, additional council members. And, and Lee, I, I see you've had your hand up for a while and then I'll, uh, council member coming. Separate issue for me. Um, thank you, Mayor Myers. Uh, related to the hours that I'd like to revisit when the time is right. Thank Council you. Member Cummings. Yeah, I was just going to say to the to the chief's point. You know, I, and I'm I've been thinking about how to articulate this, but um, you know, I think it the intent is that 
um, individuals who are contacted are going to be given a warning and that there is, you know, there's no gray area around whether or not someone who's initially contacted is going to receive a warning. And then I think after that initial warning, um, you know, whether it's subsequent warnings within a 30-day period, um, I think it also depends on how often we're going to be switching around where these sleeping sites are. Because if we designate, if we say one week you can go here and then, you know, whoops, it's, you know, fire season or endangered species mating season, we have to close down this area, we have to reopen another area, then does that person then, you know, I think that any time we reset, that would, you know, also kick in a new kind of warning period. Um, but I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is that I understand the um, police chief's concerns, and I think that to the extent that we can put in some language around adequate warning and noticing that would then allow for enforcement to occur makes a lot of sense. So. I, I, I might have some suggested language here in a second. Okay. I think that if we have that there is clear record of prior warning within a reasonable amount of time, uh, we can do that through our computer aided dispatch system uh, or written warnings, we can we can figure that piece out of the field interview. Then I think that the officers could go ahead and and uh, and be confident that the person has been warned and given the proper information. So, do we need to change the language to say city staff shall give the person that of a verbal adequate change a to adequate in that sentence there? Councilmember Holder, does that get at your question? Okay. So Can you that? It's, um, it's that first sentence after chapter where it says city staff, keep going past that all the way to the give, go up, 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 uh, first, first sentence, and then keep going over. And where it says the person A, just make that adequate. Councilmember Collentary Johnson. 
Yeah, I had the same um, question and concern around um, the parking lots and, and businesses. So I think um, hopefully this, this works for Council Member Watkins, who made the original, I think, amendment to this part. But since we're here, um, can I go back to the, to the point that I had raised my hand on before? Yes, please do. It's, it's just that um, this, within 60 days, time frame is missing from the language. Okay, where should that go? Um, I'll establish a program within the 60, within 60 days. Within 60 days of passage of the ordinance. Yeah, exactly. So, I think it was within 60 days and I think no later than uh, June 30th, 2021. You've got to go back up. I oh, think it's, yeah, it's, it's still up. Six, it's uh, 6 0. 0. 0. 0.050D. Oh, yeah, it's where, it's where, we, where we were just at. Right there. Yeah. Yeah, right. Back up. Right. Okay. right there. Where you just typed in hours of operation. So that would be the last sentence. Is that where that fits? Oh. suggest that that just be part of the motion uh, approving the ordinance but council could insert it in the text as well I suppose it's the motion maker. Oh, I, th I thought the, the motion was to remove that I thought the suggestion was to remove the catch recommendation piece and put that as the policy direction that was a that was a different uh, component but um, yes does it complicate the ordinance Tony, if we put the within 60 days in here, I just want to make sure that that piece gets captured. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it's really up to the up to the pleasure of the city council on that point. I, I'm, 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 I think. Oh, I'm sorry. I have my hand up. Um, do you have a comment on this, Councilmember Golder and Councilmember Cummings? Okay, uh, Councilmember Golder. I, correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought Susie said that it would be like setting ourselves up for failure to put 150 spaces within 60 days. Did I hear that wrong? I, it would certainly be challenging. Yes. <laughs> so so could, we, could we modify, would you be open to modifying that timeline, um, Council Member Talentary Johnson? So that we um, ourselves up for success. Right. I, I see the predicament that we're in, and, and maybe it works better to, to to separate it out because what what I would like to see is is a safe sleeping program um, started within 60 days, not necessarily that we have it for 150 sites. Does that make sense? So so. Back when you guys were talking about it, this is. I move this from the change to the ordinance just to council direction. This right here, and it says mm -hmm. the Oh, I see. That would be the adopting direction. They're just direction right, right. ordinance and options. And I, and I, think the, I think the reference to the cash recommendation context. Um, I'm hearing an echo, sorry. sorry. Uh, makes sense as part of the motion. The adopt option, but not in the other. Okay. Okay. That works. Uh, yeah. And if I can add, and that's more reasonable, I think, to, to be able to get it going in 60 days, but having the 150 in 60 days. Yeah, my intent was not 150 in 60 days, but just that we, we make sure that we have something going within 60 days. Yeah, that's okay. 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 Thank you. Um, Justin, do you have a comment on this? Um, I had a question and a comment. Uh, I'll start with the comment. Um, one thing I was going to mention, if we're going to put that exception in there for the hours, could begin as late as 8 p.m., and I would say 
maybe end as early as 7 a.m., but no later than 8 a.m. And the reason why is because um, I was just looking at a sunset sunrise chart, and in the winter, sunrise uh, certain times in January doesn't occur until almost 7.30 a.m. But then also understanding that I know for some of the three-hour lots downtown, and I and someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of the parking enforcement downtown starts at 8 a.m. So if we were going to do something in parking lots, trying to, you know, uh, find that balance between getting people out for people need to park there to go to work, um, but then also understanding that it's really difficult for people to wake up when it's dark and cold outside. So, so that's just the intention there. And then I did have a question um, for council member. Kalantari Johnson around the safe sleeping sites, and I was just curious, um, kind of what what the what would be the goal of that kind of site and program? And the, and the reason why I ask is because um, you know over the course prior to the pandemic and throughout the course of the pandemic, I mean, we've stood up. We started off with 1220 River Street, that moved up to the Armory. We had the Armory, and then we had. A, slave, a, a managed encampment program at the Benchlands that's now also up in the armory. And I think we have like 160 or so tents up at the armory, all of which were independent kind of safe managed encampment programs that all got moved up there for, you know, River Street had to be moved because of construction. Benchlands got moved because of, you know, the winter and the rains. And so I'm just wanting to understand what the 60 with the the next iteration of sleeping programs, kind of what the thought is. I'm all for having as many programs as we can, but I just wanted to know if you could speak to that a little bit. Sure, yeah, um, and I'll invite Vice, Vice Mayor Brenner as well since we worked on this together. But the, six, the, the safe sleeping program um, is a little bit what, what uh, Association of Faith Communities currently does in their churches, um, but it's in public spaces. So that's the idea is that there would be some kind of monitoring and staffing and supervision um, in connection to outreach and engagement staff. And that would be one step towards um, the, the encampments that you're speaking of, the, the, the full managed encampments. I don't think that our city, um, I know that our city doesn't have the resources and capacity to stand something like that up ourselves. And I know that it's a challenge for the county as well, but that would be a step towards that. Does that help clarify? Great. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Next section. Um, I think that I think we might have we might be here. Um, that was yeah, that was it. Okay. Okay, we made it through. Um, Martine, I think we've gotten Bonnie. Did you get everything? Uh, I got all the these changes, but in terms of, a, we're gonna have to watch the video and piece everything together. And I don't know. No. Okay. Uh, do we? Okay. Okay. So, Bonnie, can you put the original motion up?
Welcome to Zoo. Enter your participant ID. You have entered the meeting as a panelist. Attendees can now hear you speak. Thanks for the clarification, Bonnie. <laughs> Are you ready, Bonnie? Yes, no, we're good. We're good? Okay. Um, Council Member Cummings, I'm wondering, um, I'd be happy to agendize, um, you know, to work with the Chief to get those agendas as they can be packaged, but I think if we would be willing to kind of finalize this work tonight, um, but I'm happy to work with you and the Chief to look at to look at those uh, quality of life ordinances and see how quickly they can be brought forward. Okay, and, that, and just for clarification, I wasn't gonna put a date on it, but just with the intention of, you know, some of these really fitting within, figuring out how we can move things forward um, to start addressing, especially the bike chop shop thing, because that I know is, people are very upset when they get their bike stolen in this town and we want a bike friendly community. And I think that that's a, not only a crime against an individual, but a crime against our climate. And so, but yeah, if it, if uh, if we can follow up on that, I'd be happy to have that conversation with you. Yeah, the chief and I had talked about that one in particular. Um, I was in the impression that he might have thought that we had captured that in here, but I think re-looking uh, re at it and make sure we capture the intent of that ordinance as best as we can is a better way to go, much, much better. Um, I have, so Bonnie, do you want to take, why don't we take a five minute break, Bonnie, and you can massage the uh, motion so we know for sure what we're voting on. Um, I have council member, I mean, excuse me, council member Watkins and Vice Mayor Bruner. Did you guys have questions or comments? Is that a I, I had a comment uh, on the bike chop shop. If you want to wait, I can wait. I think well, it's, I, if, it, if it matters at all, there's no way I'm gonna, this is gonna happen in five minutes. Okay, okay. There was, we have to go back and listen into the video again. Yeah, we'll just power through then. I think if we could, um, I think if we, if you don't mind, Vice Mayor Bruner, we'll, we will bring that other, those or, other ordinances um, back um, as a, you know, as a package, we'll do the analysis beforehand if that's appropriate so we don't um, necessarily go into that discussion tonight because it's not agendized per se. So is that amenable to you or did you just have a clarifying question? I just wanted to understand uh, the, the intent of the um, 6.36.060D uh, as in dog, their public property shall not be used as storage for extra car tires in an ordinate number of bike parts gasoline generators, et cetera, et cetera. So is that a section that we could simply uh, scroll in red line, um, stronger language to incorporate the bike chop shot or does it need to, that was, that was my comment, rather than a separate. Yeah, that, I, I, I thought I understood that this would cover the intent of that bike shop piece, but um, I don't know enough about how you how you want to enforce against that, Chief Mills. So, your thoughts on that? Yeah, Mayor, um, that is exactly what you and I had discussed earlier, is that this may get us most of the way there. Uh, I think the ordinance that we have looked at was a little bit stronger in terms of um, just a few bikes in a location that are disassembled. Uh, there's a little bit more clear language that I don't have it in front of me right now. Um, <clears throat> but we could uh, certainly uh, start here and then enhance it if we need to. And it might be that, that getting at, and I think council member Cummings' concern is, is really those large scale true chop shops that, for example, the photos we saw from. So maybe there is that need to to provide additional an additional ordinance that clarifies is that in, in that intent with the volume. Vice Mayor Bruner. Uh, that that was all I had. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, Bonnie, can you flip back to the motion and I'll repeat the motion and we will go ahead and vote tonight. Okay, so the motion um, moved by council member Watkins, second by Mayor Myers to introduce for publication ordinance number 20 Dash 2021-03 amending chapter 6.36 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to regulations for temporary outdoor living with the following changes. Add part D in a part or all of, or all of a city owned parking lot. And I believe we might've changed this um, language. Um, is the most clear thing to do, um, Tony, to make the motion as amended? Um, what, what's the best, uh, most efficient way to, to, now that we've actually gone step by step through the ordinance, is it better to say inter, to, that the motion would be to introduce the publication ordinance of the ordinance as stated in the first bullet there? Yes, as amended um, uh, pursuant to the discussion that, that the council has, has just concluded. So the motion, um, Council Member Watkins, if you're amenable to that, would be to introduce, um, the motion would be introduced for publication ordinance number 2021-03, amending chapter 6.36 of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code related to regulations for temporary outdoor living as amended, um, as amended, and you had the other language there, Tony, as amended, period. Uh, as amended, yes. For the minutes? So Sorry? you're saying this, are you wanting to change the oh. part? I'm trying to understand. We just, Tony, I'm just looking for, we, we just went line by line through the actual ordinance. Right. But a lot of what's here is actually in the ordinance now that we've gone line by line. Um, so here's just, just for the purpose of the, the minutes is we typically any changes made in the ordinance we also plug it into the minutes because somebody reading the minutes doesn't have the ordinance in front of them. Got so it. so, you're so gonna Bonnie, get Bonnie will be filling this in with all of the details yeah. of. Okay. 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 Uh, great. So the motion is that um, and. Do I need to read through all of this, Tony, for the public record, or that that motion will capture it since we've put it in as amended? I think the motion will catch it, but um, uh, also uh, for we did talk about modifying the language of 070A to to delete per cash recommendations, et cetera. So I just want to make sure that we have that language in the notes that Bonnie took on the on the red line text, and that we can clean up the motion uh, to make it consistent with that. Okay. Make her a motion. Okay with that? Yeah. Amendments. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> then Sorry, I'm I'm getting a little. We're all exhausted. Yeah. How do you <laughs> I don't even have to go to bed. I can just wake up in three hours and start all over again. <laughs> okay, um, I think we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, go to a roll call vote then, Bonnie. Okay. And we will um, send it to you, um, Director Butler and probably Tony and Martine and Shepra. Um, for final approval of the minutes. Thank you, and we'll we'll make sure that things like you know the direction to staff regarding the navigation center is not a part of the ordinance, but a part of separate directions and so forth. Right. Mm -hmm. um, Councilmember Watkins. Aye. Councilor Johnson. Aye. Brown. No. Coming. 
Uh, no, but I want to state for the record that I do support the purpose and intent of this ordinance, especially as it relates to environmental protection, but I do have some concerns with uh, legal implications and just um, community input and rollout. passes um, with five uh, in support and two uh, against, not using the right terms. Um, with that, I believe we are adjourned. Can I just ask really quick, the next reading will be in two weeks. Can we just have that clarified for the public as well, the yep. next step? I'll look to staff to see if they can, if this um, will be ready in two weeks or if it's... Um, I will say that we typically have what's called the action summary posted on our website um, before the minutes are um, brought to the, to the public and to council. So it'll be on our website, the motion language, probably mm, it's, a, it's a doozy. So I'd say no later than Monday. And yes, the um, next, uh, the second reading of this would be in two weeks. It will be on um, March 9th. And that will be a, another opportunity for um, the council to review the ordinance and hear from the public. Um, just as we close tonight, I just wanna thank our staff again. This has been a haul and uh, I wanna thank all my colleagues, um, very, very difficult policy to try to work through and decide um, on. And uh, I just appreciate everyone's willingness to stick with it tonight. And um, I would love to say good night, but I'm gonna say good morning and um, wish you all <laughs> a hopefully functional day today. <laughs> good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Goodbye.